some generous sponsors to, to continue. So I wanted to talk about how this conference happens, and the three main components are just time, money, and love. Um, and let me kind of break down the money and the love part a little bit. So this is a slide I showed in last year's presentation where it just kind of lists out the main sponsors and how much, um, how much the sponsorship raised for the, the conference, um, 6,900 euros. Um, if you remember, like we were really intending to meet in Hilversum uh, at the Netherlands Institute for Sound and Vision last year. Um, but the Omicron virus uh, decided to meet there instead. Um, so we all moved into Gathertown. So for this year, that's why we have a remaining balance of uh, 4,400 euro uh, that, that was left over from that conference because we didn't have to host a social dinner or print things. We, we moved things online. Um, in, a, in addition to that remaining balance from last year, we also have uh, 2,700 euros from uh, these additional sponsors for this uh, total amount. And then um, this is kind of what the expenses were for the conference. We had uh, a bunch of travel grants. I think there were five or six recipients of travel grants this year. Congratulations. Uh, the Netherlands Institute for Sound and Vision offered the program printing for like the name badges and for, for these. Um, we funded the travel and lodging of the organizing committee and then we hosted the, the dinner last night. Uh, so after all that, we have a remaining balance, so uh, that just kind of gets moved into uh, No Time to Wait 7 next year, uh, and we'll have more on that later. Um, we're also always interested in sponsors to just help make the, the conference a bit more stable and to continue. We've been pretty dedicated to managing a free, conf a free registration conference, um, and that takes and, and we do that because, like, we, we can do that because of the really high rate of um, volunteering at the conference and, you know, participation and support. And then in addition to the money part, I wanted to acknowledge the time. Uh, media area op offers a tremendous amount of coordination, administrative support, and time. Our host institution, um, the Netherlands Institute for Sound and Vision, offered this conference space, technical support, coordination, vision, and their own time. And then also like organizers, presenters, volunteers, everyone you see or to see helping around or on stage or, uh, or the, you know, operating remotely uh, offers their time and expertise. Uh, you know, so we want to acknowledge that it's, for a conference like this, it's not just the funding for like the social dinner and the printing, but also there's like a lot of cost um, that you all bear to get here in paying for like hotels and travel. Um, so I think like No Time to Wait is really able to create this wonderful space of uh, sharing experiences and information with one another, but it obviously takes a lot of all of us to contribute into an, uh, an event like this. All right, and that's my very short conference presentation. <laughs> I know I have 10 minutes on the program, so I'm happy to take any questions if any of you want to know how this conference works, or if any of my like fellow organizing committee members have any uh, questions about how this conference works. Hi, Alexander. <laughs> any questions for me? Who wants to ask the first question of the day? <laughs> All right, well, I trim oh wait, I forgot, like, Joanna was going to give me an introduction. You can't cost me. Do you want to <laughs> still, in do you want to introduce me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> uh, I'm Joanna White, I'm helping today. I'm going to actually do it, though. No, okay, thank you. I'm Joanna White, I'm helping chair today, and I'm very, very honored to be here. So, um, but I hope that we will, we have some excellent pres presentations today. You've seen Dave, obviously. Thank you very much, Dave. But if you want, we can move straight into first presentation. Yeah, a of bit course, of course. extra time on the schedule if it doesn't bother anyone. Anybody mind? Okay, so our first presenter today is Remco de Boer. And um, he's going to be talking on Open Isn't Enough, Metadata for Music. Thank you. Hi. My name is Remco de Boer. Um, and I work as an information architect for the Podium Kunst of Net Network Organization. Um, let's move this to the slideshow. Yeah, thank you very much. That's probably better. And the clicker. Um, Podiumkunst.net, which literally translates to uh, performingarts.net, 
is a relatively new network organization in the Netherlands um, for the performing arts. And the vision that we have is uh, to enable the performing arts sector to share their digital collections and to stimulate reuse. So we formulated four goals for 2025. Uh, the network or originates in uh, 2021. Um, and the goals are that the podiumkunst.net network is the network for the performing arts sector, uh, where we engage with large, medium and small cultural performing arts institutions. And another goal is that our target audience, the target groups, know where to find the collections of these different institutions and that they are inspired by them. And finally, we want the performing arts, together with the heritage and design sectors, to contribute to the Dutch national strategy on digital heritage. And for that, the program, the PodiumKunst.net program, builds on four pillars. First, we want to support the network and we want to help it grow. We want to bring parties together and initiate collaboration. Second, we want to develop shared services as part of an infrastructure that connects all these different uh, institutes uh, and, and their collection information. Third, we want to increase expertise, um, and we do that together with partners here in the Netherlands. Uh, and finally, we want to uh, stimulate creative reuse so that makers can make use of the information that is connected through this network and uh, disseminated. In this presentation, I focus mainly on the second pillar, the development of shared services um, and the connection of uh, the different uh, uh, collection information from the different institutes. And the pillar for that connection, the basis for it, is metadata. Metadata that, if you look back in history, used to be pretty much closed, uh, only available for your own organization, your own employees, focused particularly on physical access. Um, so where can I find this book, this museum object, this CD? Um, and also if you look back at funding, it, that used also to be based on physical access. So if, if you were a museum, for example, your funding was based on the amount of physical visitors that you attracted. Uh, well, that has changed over the years. So basically with the arrival of the internet, what you see is that the used, the, the, what used to be closed data now is opened up, became available for sharing. So it's not only available for your own organization or your own employees. Um, um, because of more digitization, uh, you, you start to attract another audience. A presence on the internet means that people don't need to be at your site anymore to be able to engage with your organization. Nowadays, if you want to visit an archive, for example, you can just go on the internet and you can basically visit any archive anywhere in the world. You don't need to travel there anymore. Um, so that means that also funding changes. Funding is now not only based on physical access, but also on digital presence. And if you want to increase your digital presence, if you want to increase the use of your data, then it's key that you can be found. And in order to be found, the very first step is to open up your data. Make sure that it is published in whatever format. And if you do that, and if you are able to, to open your metadata and make sure that people can find it and can use it, you will be findable as an institute as well. But you would still be in isolation. It's your data, it's your collection, and there's no connection to any other collections that may have similar data that may be uh, linked to the information that you have. So in addition to opening up your data, something else is needed. You need to connect as well. How can your collection be found in connection to other collections? How can you extend your reach? One way of doing that is using the same terms. Make sure that the metadata that you use is synchronized. And a technique that you can use for that is linked open data. There are already many thesauri available, for example, the art and architecture thesaurus that are built upon linked open data uh, uh, foundations that are actually used nowadays to connect 
different uh, uh, data sources. What do I mean with connection? Here's an example. Uh, if you go to music and movement, this is actually a picture that you can find there. It's interactive. It's not interactive in my slide, but it's interactive on the side. What you see here is in the center, uh, this picture is focused on Louis Andriessen, uh, a Dutch composer and pianist, who you see here connected to all sorts of other things. I'm, I understand that's not readable, but if you were to zoom in, you would find other people connected to Louis Andriessen. Uh, Hendrik Andriessen, for example, his father. You would find different places in this picture connected to Louis Andriessen. Utrecht, The Hague, places where he was born, where he taught to his students. Uh, you would find thematic things here, topics such as jazz. Um, and this is all connected to this individual Louis Andriessen. But you can imagine that if you were to jump to one of these connected pieces of information, you would find other pieces of information connected as well. So you start building a network of pieces of information, things that are connected. And that particular type of connection is used in Van Gogh Worldwide as an example of one of the first platforms where this type of uh, uh, connection between different sources of information, musea all over the world uh, related to Van Gogh, are brought together in a single platform. That is the idea that we have with PodiumKunst.net as well. So we want to build these shared services to make this type of connection possible. What do we run into then? How do we connect these collections? Well, you have to understand that there are many differences in content. If you look at the performing arts, we have theater, we have audio, we have sheet music, we have registered music. And these all have their own domain, their own way of expressing the data that they have available. So there are huge differences in metadata. Um, we want to open this metadata to the internet so that Google can find it, and we also want to link it. For that, we are building what we call a knowledge graph. A knowledge graph that connects all these different sources through a common ground. So what you see here on the bottom of this picture is all these diverse sources that we encounter in the performing arts. And then at the top, we have these services that we want to provide to the end users. In between is this knowledge graph that connects the sources, the heterogeneous sources that we have, and makes them available as one virtual connected uh, uh, database or collection of metadata. And this is the model that we use for that. I won't go into detail, but the, we, we, we decided to use uh, uh, standards that are already available, and we settled for uh, LRM RDA which uh, you see the uh, conceptual model here on screen, um, which is not necessarily the model that each of these individual institutes uses, uh, but it's primarily the, the, the model that we use for the knowledge graph. And then we have uh, the recommendation. Okay, let's continue. What is enough? Um, so, because you don't know 
all the uh, ways that people want to use the metadata that you publish, um, it's very important that you are as elaborate as possible when describing your content. You cannot envision all the different questions that will be asked about the collections that you that as the focal point to, uh, to, to describe uh, the, the metadata. And publish that as linked open data. Because the linking of the different pieces of data is essential to be able to find everything that is related to a particular topic. For example, Louis Andriessen, who may occur in many archives, in many collections, and has published uh, many materials that will be distributed over different institutions. Um, you need to use standardized terms. Um, because if you want to be able to connect collections, you need to synchronize the way that you uh, apply metadata. And uh, there's a perfect example of that here in the Netherlands, which is called the NDE Term Network. The NDE stands for Dutch National Digital Heritage Network. Um, where different terminology sources are connected um, and... Um, okay. I'm, I'm a bit distracted by my own voice running a bit of a, a minute behind. I'm sorry about that. Um, so what, 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 let's go back to the NDE Term Network. What you see here is that there are different terminology sources connected to a single portal where you can search for the metadata terms that you need, and you can be sure that they are reusable, it can be used by others as well. Um, you also want to publish your data sets in an open way. Um, again, here if you look at what, how that's organized in the Netherlands, there is an archive, a National Archive Data Register, stemming from NDE as well, where your data set can be registered so that it can be found. But you should also make sure that Google can find it. How to get there? Well, it's imperative that you involve the experts. Let the experts help you. They are the guards of the standards. They know. Library are all institutes that can help you with this movement. In the end, it's the quality of the metadata that defines the findability of your collection and your reach. And that quality is part of the content, but also of the connections that you can make with other metadata sources. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. I wonder if we have any questions to start today. You have one? Lovely. Yeah, sure. You can say it in Hi, my name is Mike Marikrink. I work at the Netherlands Institute for Sound and Vision. Um, thanks for this nice presentation. I was wondering about um, where you see the responsibility of initiatives like Podiumkunst.net compared to the, uh, the actual uh, uh, community that they want to uh, provide this knowledge graph for. Uh, um, having worked on that, that model, uh, how do you feel that this responsibility can be shared, and where does the um, uh, boundary lie, if you see what I mean? Thank you, yeah. Um, so, if you look at the, the, the Dutch National Strategy on Digital Heritage, uh, which Podiumkunst.net is, is an example of uh, for how, how we want to fulfill, then the idea is that uh, it's as distributed as possible. So you want to leave as much of the data and as much of the uh, 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 publication of the metadata with the individual organization. Now, in practice, what you see is that there are a lot of uh, differences between these organizations. We have small organizations, we have huge organizations, such as Sound and Vision, um, and, and you can imagine that the capabilities of each of these organizations is different. Um, so, it's also a matter of helping the smaller organizations to be able to connect to this network, and that means that in terms of the services that we design, there are some services really particularly targeted towards these smaller institutes uh, to help them, for example, to open up their data and to, 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 to transform it into linked open data because you, that's not sort of a capability that you can expect for each and every institute. Um, 
So, in essence, the, um, uh, the responsibilities lie with the uh, owners of the sources, the institutes themselves. Uh, the goal of the network is to help them uh, to, to, to uh, fulfill these responsibilities um, and to support them wherever necessary. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. That's okay. Hi, uh, Steve Lum, uh, Matroska VLC. Uh, you mentioned uh, discover discoverability, uh, like you made the example of Google. Uh, how do you get, uh, how do you make sure that Google finds your information, especially since the algorithm is uh, unknown and it's a huge business to get your research on top? And would it, it make sense to have like a you mentioned other big organizations all working together on that field. Would it make, would it make sense to have a, like a joint effort to have your own global uh, search engine for art and things like that, rather than relying just on Google for this? So how do you make Google find and, and, and understand the data that you publish? There are um, standards for that as well. So a particular standard is schema.org, and if you are able to, to codify your metadata using that standard, uh, then Google will find it and can interpret it. So it can, uh, if you go to Google, sometimes you search for something and you see these little information boxes pop up, uh, about persons, for example. Um, that's extracted by Google from semantically annotated data, and uh, using that type of technology, in coordination with the model that you use to find the data, if you really want to search for it in terms of uh, the performing arts domain. Um, so if you, if you transform it to schema, of course, you lose some information, um, but um, it's sort of an alternative publication that helps you to make the data understandable by Google as well. So there are these kinds of, uh, 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 of approaches that you can use for that. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. We're on time. Thank you very much. So, thank you ever so much. So next, um, we have Matthias Vordman, who's going to be giving a presentation on FQ and JQ binary formats. screen for you very shortly. Might be short questions for you today. <laughs> Any? Okay. Sorry for the delay, everyone. Two seconds. There's something. Excellent, thank you. <coughs> yes, so hello, I'm uh, Matthias Wadman, uh, and I'm going to talk about this tool that I've been working on for two years, something. It's a bit fuzzy. I did a lot of prototyping before, but maybe two years seriously working on the project. Uh, so, some background. <coughs> I uh, work at the company, a streaming company, so I work with ingestion and transcoding, so we, I deal with a lot of media files that comes from all, all kinds of sources with very, very varying quality. Uh, so we have to, when the transcoding fails or it looks strange with colors or time, 
timestamps or whatever is going wrong, then we have to somehow figure out what's, what's the, what, what is wrong with these media files. Uh, <clears throat> so, so previously, uh, we used to use a lot of tools like FFprobe, Graphic Magix, and for dump media info, even Wireshark can decode media files. It's a bit strange, but it can. <laughs> Uh, and then usually what would happen was that you take these tools and they output something. They, op they usually output in a format that is very different between different programs, so then you have to write scripts to convert it into like a common format, like JSON or something, and then you put that into some tool to be able to do queries. So you use JQ, grep, SQLite, awk, whatever was available. So, uh, and then also when, when you figure out what maybe had some hints what's going wrong, then you use other tools to actually find where, how to find the actual part of the file that is wrong. So you used like HexFiend, this is like a hex editor, structured hex editor, uh, or HexDump and DD or CAT or yeah, all the, the usual. Uh, and I'm also very interested personally in these things. So <laughs> and I'm also a, a, like a programming language nerd, I would guess. <laughs> so, uh, so I had this uh, wish list once that I wanted to, I want to see like everything about this picture except the picture. That's like, that's because when, when you work with uh, in transcoding, I nearly never look at the video. So I just look at the, yeah, I, look, I want to see everything else. I don't want, I don't care about the content, like what it is. I just want to see what it, everything else. So I had this like a uh, wish for an, uh, have you used the, the command line to file, that you can run file on the file? <laughs> and it just tells you this is a JPEG with this resolution. So I want to like, uh, I wish I just had a tool where I can just run this command on the file and just show me nearly everything about the file. Uh, and I wanted like a, like a debugger, if you have used, uh, if you're a software engineer and you want like nearly you want to nearly step into the program so you can be inside the program. That's the feeling that I wanted when I was designing this. I want to step into the media file or the binary file and feel like I'm walking around nearly and poke around. Uh, and I wanted some kind of query language to be able to do like uh, select out things or aggregate or some like SQL-ish things. Uh, and I also wanted to like, have some kind of way of address, like have addressing, so I can like symbolically talk, like ask questions about. Uh, I want the tenth frame or the last frame or things like that. And I also wanted, because I've written a lot of uh, decoders in my life, so I, have, so I wanted uh, something that could support the nest. Because I know that these uh, media formats, they they usually are nesting other format inside, like a container has an AC frame that has a, yeah, so do you, you want to like write that decoder once and then you want to reuse that decoder in, yeah, that's how FFmpeg is designed also. It's like, so it's like, yeah, that's a, a no-brainer. It should be like that. Uh, and I also wanted a, a, like a DSL kind of, a domain-specific language for, so it kind of looks like you're nearly writing a specification when you, so you can nearly take the, uh, you can look up the AVC specification, nearly, nearly copy and paste, and just change it into code, more or less, and it should just work. And those uh, specifications, they are usually, those formats are very dense, like they are bit-packed, <laughs> very, so you, you can't use, you can't rely on byte binders, I think. So you have, so I wanted a code that can just take care of all the nitty-gritty byte things. So I started looking into, because I knew a lot about JQ, which is a query language for JSON, so I knew that if I could make that work together with a with a with a, with a like a structured hex viewer or editor, it would be great. And I did a lot of tries, and I think I figured out how to do it, and it seems to work. Uh, so I can talk a bit about J JQ. I guess most people have used seen it at least in. A, it's usually for ident indenting JSON. <laughs> you just run JQ and then the JSON file in and you get like, it, it's uh, it nicely indented the JSON. But J JQ is actually a tool and it's also a programming language. So what uh, J this JQ tool does is that it takes J JSON as input and it runs a J JQ program or a filter, they call it. 
and then it just gives you JSON back. So it's like transformed it in some way. Or usually you don't do anything. You just you just run this dot. That's why we have a dot sometimes when you run jcube. It's just an identity function. Uh, so uh, so yeah. So jcube is a, 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 it's a superset of JSON. So all JSON is is valid jcube filters. Uh, and it's also uh, maybe the the strangest things about jQuery is that it's a function language that is based on generators and backtracking. Uh, and maybe the sim if you have programmed other languages, uh, it's kind of like if you in Python when you have yield, in jQuery you always yield. That's like the standard. There's not even a keyword for it. It's like, oh, comma is kind of yield in jQuery. So you you, you always. Uh, it's like all function expressions can return zero values. That means like no value, or one or more. So it's like every expression can do can do this. And it's uh, it comes from a language called Icon that used to that's a very long it's like from the 80s that is inspired by this. Uh, so you can see here are some examples here. Here is uh, you can read it as this like a prompt kind of, and then you see what how JQ would. Interpret this. So it's like literal so numbers are just numbers, strings are strings, and an array is just an array. But then you see down here when you create an, an object literal, so you can see that you can start to do arithmetics here and it just calculates to six. So you can do uh, those kind of things. And then you see the, and here's the usual syntax for how you use this uh, pipe operator. Where you kind of, you, it works kind of like shell scripts with a pipe that you have like an implicit. Input argument, so you don't have to. We don't have to talk about the first argument because that's always implicit. So this this uh, this expression is the literal hello, and then you like call the function length on the hello, and then you pipe it to the next one. And dot here is the identity, so it's going to be five because that's the length of hello, and then it times two, so it's ten. That's like the so it's like the language is built to. Be able to do this. Be very composable. You just keep on adding more and more pipes. Oh, and I have uh, some more slides how this works, but we, we can skip because that's too much details. Uh, so uh, FQ was built inspired by this. So I, I joke that it's like the binary indenter, which kind of makes sense that it does. Uh, so it instead of just JSON, it can actually take J, like binary in. Or it can take JSON, or it even supports XML and other things. And then it runs a JQ program, and then you can get out, you can get binary out, or you can get like a fancy hex dump. Three stock. I will show you how it looks. Or you can get JSON out also, of course, because you can. It's just JQ, and it supports a lot of input formats. 108, I think. Last time I checked, now half of them are media related somehow. And uh, FQ also has. Uh, some ad additional standard library functions co compared to JQ so that, are, that are convenient to have. Uh, and we can, I can skip the details about the code value. And, and it also, it also re-implements re nearly all of JQ's CLI interface because that's very, it's, it's nicely designed, so I just stole that idea. Uh, and it also has an interactive like a REPL, if you know what uh, read, uh, evaluate, print loop. <laughs> so it's just a, it's like the bash has a REPL when you write. It just evaluates and then it asks you to type something else, type something else. Uh, so, so here is a, like a graph over all the formats that are supported. And you can even, it knows how they are connected. So you can show a graph here. So you can see that this is uh, MP4. I think this is Matroska. And you can see how they are depending on using other formats. So you can some of, some of the chains become very long. They are even recursive, so they go around. They are circular. Uh, and this is all the the media formats that are supported currently. So you can see that they are. So you can see, for example, that FLAC is uh, is actually like split up into uh, like the logical parts of a FLAC file. So there is like a FLAC format that just uses other FLAC format format decoders. Uh, so, and this is like basically how we use it. I, now I will think I will do a demo how to use this. So I hope it goes well. <laughs> <coughs> is it big enough? 
I want to have quite big. Uh, it uses a lot of. It wants a lot of width, terminal width to to display nicely. So the tool is uh, is just a CLI tool, and it looks it looks and feels very much like JQ. You can do help, and if you do, let's say, I think I have an MP3 file here. So if you just run this on an, on, an MP, of a, on some kind of file, you will, and you just use the dot, which is like don't do anything, just show me. <laughs> then it will actually show you just the, like the root level of the of the file. So here it shows that there is a header. There are one headers, and there are three frames, and then there are no footers. Uh, so you can, uh, uh, we can do an interactive. So now I open the file in like in, in a REPL mode instead. So now you can do the same thing, just dot. So now I don't have to, now I can just type. So you can do, uh, let's say we want to look at the first uh, uh, MP3 frame here. So, so now you can see how uh, FQ has uh, decoded this. And it also shows you like symbolic representations of things. So you can see that uh, the bitrate is fantasy 56 kilobit. And that is actually in the file, this is encoded as four, but that's kind of useless for a human. So it actually has uh, translated it to 50. This is what, what it makes sense for us to see. So, but I was going to open uh, MP4 file instead, I think. So here is an MP4 file. And the uh, MP4 files, I don't know if you know about, they are like a, a structure of boxes, uh, a tree of boxes. So here, are, so they are represented here as, a, uh, <coughs> as arrays, like arrays of boxes that have boxes that have, oh, yeah. So you see the first box is uh, the, the typical f tip box which has brand brands, so you can see them here if you want to. And you can also convert these things into JSON if you just want to have it as a... So, ah, maybe I should show that. The, this, the view here is that the, the, the thing you see here is just uh, the same as hex dump or anything. This is like a, a hex representation of where in the file this is. So you can see that these, these bytes are f tip in the file. And then you have a ASCII representation here also. So these are like the same, the same bytes in the file represented in two ways. And on the right is a, like a logical tree of how it's actually structured. Uh, so let's see. I was thinking we're going to do a demo where I calculate the aspect rat ratio of the video track in this file. Uh, so I will use, maybe it will go a bit fast, but <laughs> hopefully you can. So there's a, FQ has a function called grep, and it has a version of it called grep by, which it takes a condition, so you can, so you can give it like a, uh, you give it like a lambda, that is like a, con this kind of like a condition. You can run code here to say, what, what, what are you looking for? So I tell, here I tell FQ that I'm looking for boxes that are called track, which are tracks. So here it finds two tracks. Uh, and then I want to, because I know how, MP4 files work, so I can say. So I find the, the two track boxes. One of them is the video and one is the audio. I know I want, only want the video. So I, want to, I know that there's a, there's a box called handler that is under the track box that tells you that this is video. So then I can say, so for each track box, uh, I think it's called handler. Yes, here. So there's it. this is the thing that tells in an MP4 file that this is video. So I can do feed, what did it say, feed. So, so now I just, uh, it says true or false, because one of them is video, one is audio. So then you can do in JQ, you can say, you can use something called select, which is like it, uh, uh, so it's based on this, this condition, it can, uh, it can give you or not give you something. So it, it outputs, it doesn't output the thing if it doesn't make sense. So okay, okay. So this. So now we are back to the track again. But this is the on the track that is video. So now I know that the, in in the in the under the track track box there is another box called uh, I think it's called TK track header. Yeah, and here is the 
here is the width. So if I want to calculate the spec ratio, I could do this. So this is the spec ratio of the. So what you what I usually do is that I use the the REPL to to kind of like play around and figure out how to how to write the query to find this, and then I usually usually quit out, and then, then remove the interactive version and then just cut here, and then you can run it on this. Or you can just tell a FQ to do it on all the MP4 files in this directory. So there was, I think there's a big, big back button here also. So that one is a bit wider. <laughs> uh, so I can try to see, uh, let's see. So uh, another thing with the FQ is that I want to be able to, because the, the idea is to use FQ to also automate a lot of things. Because I, what if I have uh, hundreds of files and I want to do a query, all of them, to find like a specific one that is, is different from the others, or do so. It's like it has support for uh, it has support for multiple inputs, and one way you do it is that if you don't say anything, it just runs the same query on all of them. But uh, there's a way where you can tell uh, FQ to not read anything. If you do that dot n, and it tells you I don't read anything, then then it's up to the query to how am I to find it. <laughs> Okay, maybe I will skip this, but oh, actually, I have it here. I think I prepared it here. So this was the query I was going to write. You, you can do this instead, and then you can you can actually make it build. Uh, so here I got an object out with just the file name and the aspect ratio. So it just told FQ to oh, using a JQ filter to build this. So uh, yeah, then I don't think I have time for more. If you want to have questions, then I guess there are time. Time for that now. <laughs> Thank you so much. This looks like an amazing tool, and I can think of a thousand ways I can use it. It's, the web page. It's, it's all open source, and I want uh -huh. people to help me write the coders, please. Or documentation or anything. Or just use it. Tell me what doesn't make sense. I wonder if we have any questions. Yeah? Any questions at all? Come to you in a second. Um, this is really, really cool. Uh, sorry, Kieran O'Leary from the National Library of Ireland. Um, did you ever, um, was there any point in the early design of it where you thought of it as maybe that it could accept input from things like Media Info, Media Trace, FF Probe, uh -huh. at, and, and rely on those decoders? Mm -hmm. Or is there something in, in the design of this where it's like you just have to write your own decoders and that's the uh, easiest? I think the, the idea is that the, the DSL is built in a way so that it, uh, it automatically keep track of where you are in the file for you. So it kind of needs to be... It would be if some, some of the other ones can, can export uh, like the bit ranges for all their fields, then you could probably do it. But I haven't really looked. I actually, in the beginning, I actually tried to use Hexfiend for this and try to kind of make Hexfiend be able to import. Because the problem with Hexfiend is just too slow. It's with, you write the decoders in TCL, which is just... Yeah, I, I didn't say this is written in Go, so so it's it's quite fast. I would say for it's fast enough for what it's doing. It's it's using so much memory anyway, so it's like it's not IU or decoding is not the problem at all. It's just yeah, you decode one bit and then it will have to take have the name and the range and the symbolic representation. So it's that yeah, yeah, it's just decoding time and everything just dwarfs memory allocation when you run it. So so it's not memory efficient. If someone wanted to contribute to your project, maybe add some formats or wrappers that aren't covered, is that possible? Mm, the, you, yeah, you write it in a, it is Go code, but uh, the, co the code is very, you don't have to know much Go to write the decoder. Uh, because the DSL takes care of most, you just like, list more or less, uh, the code is, the code is, the code is. So, uh, we have time, I can look at one of the coders if you want. <laughs> Well, more question here. Uh, practically, it's a one and a half question. <coughs> uh, one question is: uh, uh, Do you can also show the individual timestamps and all kind of timestamps? Uh, because, uh, as far as I know, there is a different uh, kind of timestamps inside the file. So, can we see that? And mm -hmm. uh, the half question is: Do you think that uh, this can be in some way used to? Repair some broken files. Mm, yeah, for the first question, it, it depends on the, like for example, the MP4 decoder. That 
the, the timestamps will be in this STTS box, I think it's called. And then I think there are other. Then, and, that, and that box is decoded, so you, just get, you will get the list of all the timestamps for all the samples. So it's up to you to, uh, to do something with those. You can see them. You can see them. And the half question? Mm, yeah, yeah, you can, you can, you can fix. I have uh, fixed broken files with this, or even broken files <laughs> in a way that I want it to be broken. Because we, you want to use, if you want to use, uh, you want to do regression tests, or you want to reproduce weird crashes or things. So that's very, very useful to be able to see exactly. You can actually modify things with FQ, but it's. Uh, it's, you can't just say like change this value to this. You have to like slice into bit ranges, and uh, it's a bit complicated. To Including for more file. Yeah, okay. yeah. They're, 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 it's called MD4 decoder, code, but it, it, it decodes also QuickTime and Move and all the ISO BMFF files, <laughs> kind of ish files. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Mm. I really appreciate a round of applause. So our next presentation today is Josef Vitovets. Um, he'll be talking ingesting preservation and access of digital archival packages using Archivematica and Atom. That's a lightning talk. Do you see it okay? Yeah, um, yeah, sorry. yeah there you go. So, hi everyone, my name is uh, Josef Vitovets and I work in uh, Narodny Filmový arch Archive uh, in Prague, which is like a Czech uh, national film archive, and I work there as a software like developer, engineer, and like, you know, like the coding stuff. And I'm gonna have like a short presentation uh, on ingesting preservation and access of digital archival uh, packages using uh, Archivematica and Atom. Uh, to put into context uh, why I have a presentation on this subject, uh, in 2020, uh, Národní filmový archiv in Prague started a three-year-long project called uh, Audiovisual Work Outside the Context of Cinema, Documentation, Archiving and Access that aims to develop a long-term sustainable strategy for the preservation and access to the art of the moving image. Uh, the project uh, is implemented on the basis of like multidisciplinary cooperation of like the historical team and digital archiving specialists and the prerequisite uh, for the project is the long-term cooperation uh, of the National Film Archive with visual arts uh, collecting institutions and the implementation uh, of the developed methods and procedures into their collection exhibition activities. Uh, also it works with the underlying uh, like premise of digitizing and digitally preserving works originally created in a wide range of analog and digital professional and amateur image formats that are like difficult to rep uh, reproduce like technically today uh, yeah so like the whole process uh, that has been like created within within this project is uh, much more complex than what i'm going to present today as, as you heard but i will focus mostly on the archiving and present presentation part of the whole chain. Since the project uh, was created in, uh, independently of uh, existing preservation workflows uh, in our archive, uh, we had a chance to build uh, something from scratch. So we, we took this advantage and did like a research uh, on the available like solutions and tools and eventually uh, decided on Archimatica and Atom 
the main reasons uh, were like obviously that both are like free open source uh, tools and also implement widely used uh, international standards so even in case uh, we will decide like in, in the future to use like a different system we still can easily migrate our, our data to, to the new system. So uh, let's start uh, with Archivematica first. Uh, for those of you who are not like familiar with it, uh, it's like an integrated suit of open source software tools that allows users to process uh, digital <coughs> objects from ingest to access in compliance with the ISO OAIS uh, functional model, which is uh, depicted uh, on the picture. Uh, it's based on the so-called like a microservice architecture and like you can imagine like uh, those uh, microservices as uh, granular like, system tasks uh, which operate on an entity that is equivalent to uh, OAIS information package. It can be basically like anything from like Python script like to free like open source external tools like Media Info for example. And by chaining uh, these microservices, you can create like your own custom workflow. Uh, tasks slash microservices are like predefined in Archivematica, but you can write uh, your own scripts too. Uh, but we, we didn't have to uh, actually to customize it much, because uh, Archivematica already uh, did everything uh, we needed. So. Oh. It's a bit, yeah, sorry for that. Uh, so basically uh, the life cycle of uh, archival package in Archivematica is divided into three, three functional parts which the data passes through. The first one is transfer, then ingest, and then archival storage. Uh, in Archivematica transfer uh, is a process of moving any set, basically like anything uh, to anything like digital to, to uh, Archivematica and turning the data into uh, submission information package, SIP, according to the rules defined in the system configuration. Uh, Archivematica is uh, like a format agnostic, so meaning that it can accept, accept like uh, anything, as I already said, and any file that you, you, you pass to the system, basically. Uh, a single transfer can be like homogeneous or it can be a mix of many like different formats and how quickly Archivematica can process a uh, transfer uh, that depends uh, on two things, the size of the transfer, both the individual objects and the transfer as a whole and also the transfer like complexity and by complexity for example you can imagine like uh, you have uh, something like zipped or, you know, like if it's zipped, it's much more like uh, complex for, for Archivematica to process it. Uh, and at the bottom right, you can see like the detail of uh, one microservice responsible for identifying file formats. This one uh, particularly using Siegfried uh, file format ident identification tool. And on the left, uh, you know, it's a bit hidden, but uh, there is like the structure we use for our SIP. Uh, I would a uh, bit like contemplate on it. There are like three main uh, directories. Uh, the first one is like DOC or like doc, stands for like documentation and contains uh, documents such as like acquisition report, uh, conservation report in PDF formats as well as generated media info file in HTML format. And yeah, as you can see, our package also includes the media info itself that could be as well like generated by Archivematica. However, since our digital operators uh, have to generate the media info anyway, we decided to uh, include it in the package. Mm, PRE, uh, that stands for like preview and contains basically in our case both like video preview and sets of stills. And the last one is uh, VID, like bit, and uh, they are like where masters are located. Yeah, well, I would like to move to the next stage, uh, which is called like ingest. 
and in just leg uh, is a phase of which SIPs uh, created during transfer are run through uh, several microservices. So also, as, as it was on the previous stage, uh, the one I would like to mention and uh, which is also de depicted on the on the picture like below uh, is normalization, which means you can decide like uh, if the SIP is supposed to be like normalized for uh, for preservation that creates uh, preservation copies only so no access copies are created and no DIP will be generated or the SIP can be normalized for access to that that IP will contain originals only and no preservation copies will be generated or as you can see on the picture they can be like uh, you know you can do both the third one is like uh, archival storage uh, so yeah, after like uh, your successful like ingest uh, of of AIP, uh, the AIP should appear on on the storage. On the left, you can see how the AIP uh, look in Archivematica, and two upper pictures uh, on the right shows the representation on a file system. Uh, the AIP itself uh, is packed into like a packet packaging format. Uh, the manifest files are a list of calculated checksums for each file and the rest is inside the data directory where you can also find a generated uh, maths file. The data structure shown uh, in the transfer slide uh, are then loc located in the objects folder. Mm, and in, in order to fully preserve our data we must put them on LTOs, right? So Unfortunately, Archivematica, or as far as I know, uh, does not do this task for us. So we had to create a Python script, which is like responsible uh, for uh, for that and and communicate with our tape library. Basically, like the script uh, checks like Archivematica storage service API every day and go through uh, all packages. And if a package does not exist on LTO. It just saves it there. Uh, yeah, at the very bottom, there is like just like an example of like one function how we communicate with Archivematica Storage Service API. Mm, yeah, let's move to Atom, which is like an abbreviation for access to memory. That's a web-based open source application uh, for standards-based uh, archival description and access. And as Archivematica uh, is developed also by uh, Artifactual, so it's not a surprise that these uh, like two systems can work together. And receiving the uh, IP is quite uh, straightforward <coughs> uh, as long as both systems are like configured uh, correctly. However, it's uh, like difficult to automatically like um, achieve the same structure as in uh, in, in a transfer or it, it is like that uh, what we were struggling with uh, because like all files are moved uh, to the item level and the remaining levels represented by folders in SIP are missing so it's necessary to create those missing levels manually every time new DIP is transferred but that's probably the only flaw when it comes to integration between these two and in order like, to satisfy our needs, uh, we also made a few adjustments to Atom. Like uh, we started with just like the you know, UI, uh, some, some basic like uh, customizations. Also, uh, we imported our own, uh, you know, the um, dictionaries. And the, the biggest uh, modification is probably like generation of identifiers. Uh, this can be provided by Atom as well, but without the ability to reference the works from external systems. So for that purpose, uh, we modify the source code a bit to be able to connect to GraphQL API of our like identification system to to enable like generating uh, identifiers. Mm, this system then, I mean the, the identification. Uh, then stores the, the Atom URL of the work in addition to the generated identifier which can then be like further referenced. 
Uh, one example of how we use uh, this external like referencing uh, of like these atom like identifiers is like uh, one of the outputs of of the project is uh, like a book that uses like a printed QR codes QR codes sorry so a reader is thus able as they read uh, to access like previews uh, of the works mentioned in a book. Yeah, that's probably it. Uh, I think at the end I would like to encourage everyone uh, to try both like Archimatica and Atom if the use case allows you to do so. Even though we have uh, run into troubles a few times, it's very well like documented and uh, in case of any issue we were unable to resolve, there is like, a still like possibility to ask on the user forum managed by, uh, directly by the artifactual team. So, I mean, thanks like, to the open source community, like, you are doing like, great things. And yeah, here, are, like, here is like, the link actually, like, the, the one below, to our like, uh, running Atom instance with all the data I was talking about. Uh, even though descriptions are in Czech language, Atom interface uh, is like, still in English, so you still can watch like, lots of like, videos and you know, dig, dig deeper. So, yeah. So if you have like, some, some questions, feel free to ask. Thank you, we only have one minute, but we could throw a question in if any has one. We have one question from online audience. Ervin is joining us online today. Hi, Ervin. Um, he asks, how much time did you invest in fine-tuning the system to your needs? Like, you mean like tuning the system to our needs? Like, yes. Oh. Actually, I would say like not that much. I mean, we maybe like expected uh, to spend much more time. But you know, we we uh, still like at the like beginning. We have like uh, 120 like packages. So maybe like in the future we will um, think about it like more and more and do like some some our like own scripts or you know some customizations or something. Thank you. That's yeah. really great. I'm sorry, we're out of time now. If there's any yeah. more questions, please do engage with Joseph. Yeah. Yeah. In the. Yeah. Hold it closer. Next we have Evanthea Samaras, Dr. Evanthea Samaras. Um, she will be presenting from a video link that we have findings from a doctoral research project to investigate film and TV visual effects records and archiving practices. Um, we're just signing her in on Zoom now, but I've got a little, pres uh, a little introduction. Dr. Eva Evanthea Samaras is an archivist and researcher with experience in government and audiovisual archiving, as well as media and theatre production. Eva has worked in the Australian archive sector since 2013, during which time she specialised in digital record keeping and preservation. Presently, Eva is employed as Assistant Director, Digital Archives Innovation and Research at the National Archives of Australia. From 2017 to 2021, Eva undertook her PhD in the, at the University of Technology, Sydney, for which she collaborated with the global film and television digital visual effects industry to explore their records and archiving practices. Eva may remember her excellent presentation at No Time to Wait 3 at the BFI in London. Hi, Eva. Are you there? Hello. Hi. Good morning. Uh, good evening here in Australia. <laughs> oh, good evening. It's Recording okay. in progress. I'm going to go straight to play your video now, Eva, if that's all right. We'll come back to you shortly. We have a video? Yeah, that's fine. Right. back at no time to wait. Some of you might remember that I presented my research back in 2018 at no time to wait three in London. Now that I've finished my research, I think it's fitting for me to be back to share my findings at no time to wait six. 
I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land where I live and work, Boonwurrung country in Nam, Australia. I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging, and I extend my respect to any First Nations people watching today. Let's begin. Simply put, archives are records that have enduring value. Archives are records which transcend from their immediate context to a wider context, which enables them to function as homes for our administrative, creative, social, political, and cultural memories. Visual effects, or VFX, is a specialist creative and technical field of media production, generally carried out by visual effects companies. It utilizes digital filming technologies, animations, and other forms of computer-generated imagery, or CGI, in situations where visual elements such as a scene, character, or effect is required for a film or television project, yet cannot be achieved during live action shooting. Visual effects generally involves combining CGI together with live action shots, although visual effects companies can also work on completely CGI projects such as 3D animation films. The international visual effects industry was valued to be worth $3.9 billion in 2019. This GIF is what's called a visual effects breakdown of a shot from the 2015 film The Martian. It shows background environment set extensions and colour filters that were digitally created and combined with live action footage by artists at a visual effects company called MPC. Over recent decades, digital visual effects have evolved into a global industry and have become an integral component of modern media production practice and telecinematic discourse. Presently, there are no efficient, consistent approaches in place for archiving visual effects records, and there is deficient representation of digital visual effects in film and television libraries, archives, and museums, or LANs for short. The creation of visual effects archives will ensure that trustworthy information about how, why, and who of various film and television projects is preserved and accessible. How do we make this happen? Well, my research aims to address this by documenting current practices and determining ways to improve them. And to do this, I partnered with the visual effects industry. I worked with six different companies from around the world and interviewed about 20 visual effects practitioners. I also undertook a placement at the Australian Centre for the Moving Image with a time-based media conservator to understand practices around conserving complex digital objects. And I consulted with the tertiary sector and practitioners in museums and libraries and archives to expand my thinking about how visual effects archives could be collected and used. So, what did I learn and discover? Well, before we get into that, I'd like to share a case study to give you a taste of what I'm trying to address in my research. Now, a lot of what I'm covering in this case study was um, outlined in a recent paper of mine, so I encourage you to look up that if you'd like some more information. So, I had the great fortune of doing my research out of a specialised visual effects academy at the University of Technology, Sydney, called the Animal Logic Academy. And while I was there, they had a whole cohort of master students that were studying visual effects and animation techniques. And as part of their work, they were creating a 3D animated short film called The Bounty Hunter. Now, the great thing about the UTS Animal Logic Academy is that they use industry standard hardware and applications. So it was a great opportunity for me to investigate information systems and the types of assets that are generated during production. One of the shots of the Bounty Hunter is PL020, or Planet Shot Number 2, which features the Bounty Hunter's spaceship landing over a blue alien worm. While only 160 frames long, this small shot of the project provides a good case study as it illustrates different kinds of visual effects assets and multiple file types that were generated using different industry applications. A key application used at the Academy and many visual effects companies is Shotgun, a cloud-based review and production tracking application. 
An examination of the Bounty Hunter project in Shotgun revealed that SHOT PL020 has 10 key assets. Inspection of the worm asset in Shotgun revealed that the students at the academy undertook multiple tasks ranging from concept art to animation, character lighting and surfacing. For each of these tasks, students generated a range of different file types using professional digital content creation applications, including Autodesk Maya, and here's an animation rig of the worm using Maya. Students working on the Bounty Hunter project also used Foundry's Katana lighting and surfacing tool and Adobe Photoshop. They also used Adobe Substance, which is a 3D painter tool, to create the surfacing of the worm. This tiny shot in the animation project also features assets associated with the planet environment, the spaceship, and a virtual camera, plus a whole heap of other digital records that were generated as part of the project, such as sequences and shots, which were composited, edited, and output as high-quality ProRes 422 mod video files for review and feedback. Assets, tasks, shots, and sequences were logged and tracked using Shotgun. Training guides and tips were shared via wiki pages. Day-to-day -day announcements and production information was disseminated via Slack. Pipeline and technology tools and code were maintained and updated using various platforms and online code repositories. And administration records were created and maintained in Google Drive and Content Manager EDRMS. So I hope you found this case study illuminating Despite being a small project, students at the UTS Animal Logic Academy created an industry standard project using industry tools and hardware. So what else did I discover in my research? Well, in the next part of this paper, I'm going to share some of my research findings with you. So as I mentioned earlier, I partnered with six visual effects companies to learn about their records and archiving. On the whole, companies are undertaking their records management and archiving in similar ways to each other. IT and data management teams oversee the archiving of production assets, which are typically stringently controlled and tracked during production, while other types of records are generally managed in an ad hoc fashion by multiple departments. Let's take a closer look. So key records of visual effects are production pipeline and editorial outputs known as assets and shots, which are generated using a variety of software tools. But these types of records are not found in LAMS. They rely on bespoke and commercial software and they become obsolete very quickly. These records are what is typically archived in visual effects companies onto linear tape open magnetic tapes. A copy of some of these records is delivered to the client. Unfortunately, the tapes are not always migrated to newer formats, making the data harder to restore and read over time. Most of the contextual information about these records is not archived. Instead, it remains online in separate systems to the tapes. Each project contract is different. There are no consistent requirements from the studios about the formats and types of records that should be delivered with the final shots. And under copyright law, the ownership of the records tends to sit with the studio, not the visual effects artist and company that created the records. These are all the other types of records typically generated in visual effects companies. These records are not usually archived. They are generally managed by separate departments in visual effects companies without governing policies or procedures to ensure they're managed efficiently. As the worm shot case study revealed, the visual effects industry uses a lot of proprietary formats. Visual effects production is always evolving, meaning that pipelines are in a constant state of change and the software alters from project to project, making it difficult to open and read assets as time goes by. For example, when discussing a decade old project with a practitioner, it became clear that assets from the project were no longer usable. The geometry cache that we would have used back then is a proprietary caching format that we don't use anymore. The rigs, the character rigs that we used were done in soft image, which is end of life. Nobody uses it anymore. The UVs were done in a proprietary format, which we've changed subsequently. And the renderer that we used to render the characters has changed. Aside from our ability to actually load up the geometry in our old format and convert it to a new bit of geometry, they're effectively useless. 
Despite these challenges, the industry has also made efforts to develop more open and ubiquitous file formats for use during production. An early example is the Open EXR format, developed by Industrial Light and Magic, or ILM, first released in 2003. Open EXR is an open source, high dynamic range floating point image file format for high quality image processing and storage. The format was designed to meet high color fidelity needs of the visual effects industry, namely for compositing, and uses data compression to reduce image file size. More recently, in 2011, Sony Pictures Imageworks and ILM produced the Alembic format, which focused on the interchange of 3D model geometries. Using Alembic reduces disk storage requirements as it bakes in complex digital geometric construction data, such as polygon meshes and particles, into an extensible format that is supported by common visual effects tools. Also, during 2016, Pixar Animation Studios undertook an open source release of their Universal Scene Description USD framework. Essentially, USD is a common format using hierarchically organized static and time sample data. It can be used by various digital content creation applications to support the interchange and augmentation of 3D scenes composed of elemental assets such as 3D models or animations. As part of my research, I explored the inclusion of visual effects records in film and television lands. I examined 11 established lands with extensive experience in collecting film and or television material. I only found three to have first-hand visual effects records in their collections. Limited examples of digital visual effects records include showreels and shot sequences at the Eye and the National Film and Sound Archive of Australia while UCLA has paper files of a prominent television visual effects producer, Dan Curry, who worked on multiple Star Trek series. There are much more examples of physical records about related practical special effects, such as matte paintings, photos, and production files. And many labs also have digital animation film collections. While I could not locate a formal collection policy for each organization, none of the policies that I examined mentioned visual effects. However, quite a few labs are looking to collect computer games and immersive media. The Academy Museum and the upcoming Lucas Museum of Narrative Art, both in Los Angeles, are planning to exhibit visual effects. However, it's unclear if they will acquire visual effects records for their collections. I also interviewed the Visual Effects Society, or VES, Archives Committee Chair to learn about their collection. While he wasn't a qualified archivist, he did work in the visual effects industry and has extensive knowledge about early computer graphics and visual effects production in the United States. He indicated that the VES does not have a formalized process in place for acquiring and sharing their collection. They have limited resources. Much of the work is achieved through word of mouth or people contacting the VES directly for help with research or to make donations. Their collection is mainly physical records and tapes housed in their office and a storage facility. And they don't have a digital repository to manage digital visual effects records or a catalogue. I should note that after I did the interview, the VES Archives Committee changed membership and I tried to get a hold of the new chair, but they did not respond to my emails. So during my interviews with visual effects practitioners, I asked them about which records should be kept as archives. Interestingly, they did not suggest the asset records, which is what is currently archived in visual effects companies. Quite a few of them struggled to identify records that may have long-term value, as this is something they had not ever considered before. For those that were able to provide suggestions, I've curated their responses and example records into the following themes. Creative process, such as breakdowns, art department records, and wiki records. Crew and labor, such as crew lists, summary and summary timesheets, internal and external communications, such as key emails, milestone projects, so records about award-winning projects and major new techniques, and technology development, such as software and source code. As the first scholarly investigation of visual effects records and archiving, this research has taken important first steps to document, describe, and assess archiving practices in the film and television visual effects industry. But there's much more work to be done. 
So I'd like to spend this last section of the paper reflecting on the importance of visual effects archiving and also highlighting the main challenges and some of my recommendations for improvement. The research, including opportunities to present at conferences like No Time To Wait, has introduced the field of visual effects to the cultural heritage sector and raises questions about the representation of digital production practices in film and television lands. If institutions are vying to collect immersive media and computer games, why not digital visual effects records? Currently, visual effects is an invisible job. If visual effects archiving was to be embraced, the scale and globalisation of visual effects labour would become more visible. Uncredited artists could gain some acknowledgement of their work, and the many visual effects companies that were forced to underbid for work and then close down would not be forgotten. We could visit an audiovisual archive or a museum to engage with our favourite superhero and learn that it took globalised systems of people, code and machinery working in concert to bring the characters to life on screen. As many visual effects records are generated through the production of film and television projects, it's highly plausible that film and media scholarship and practice could benefit from visual effects archives. Visual effects archives have the capacity to support investigations into the globalisation of media labour, gender inequality in film and television, feminist studies about digital voyeurism, female character design and performance and much more. However, to ensure that visual effects records are identified for archiving and are managed and preserved accordingly, current practices will need to improve. So here are the key challenges I found through my research. Visual effects culture and operations lack a general awareness of records management and archiving. In my research, I didn't come across a single record specialist or archivist working at a visual effects company. Backing up to LTO tape is understood to be archiving. All of the focus is on asset records, despite their short-term value. Companies seem to be retaining assets for contractual reasons, not because they have ongoing value to the business. Now, this is probably the biggest challenge, copyright. Studios are the IP owners of visual effects records. To date, they have not donated visual effects records to film and television lands. They treat the records as IP, not cultural artifacts. This is despite the fact that studios have a long-standing history of donating their analog records and artifacts to publicly accessible institutions, such as the Academy Film Archive, the UCLA Film and Television Archive, and USC's Moving Image Archive. Finally, key national film and television lands, including the National Film and Sound Archive of Australia, do not appear to be asking for visual effects records. This is despite the fact that many governments are offering visual effects companies handsome subsidies and that many collection policies are being expanded to include games and extended reality, record types that are extremely similar to visual effects. So a key outcome of my research was the development of these recommendations for the industry. Now, these approaches may seem obvious to archivists, but maybe not so much to visual effects practitioners. So more information about these recommendations and the overall research can be found in my thesis, which is now available in the UTS Opus repository. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you've enjoyed hearing about my research and its outcomes. Now, hopefully I'll be joining in to answer some of your questions. down. Thank you very much Eva, that was wonderful. Um, would you be able to present your, do you have hosting? How do I get you big? Yeah, I might need a bit of help, sorry. First time this morning. I wonder, do we have any questions in the audience for Eva? No? Yeah, we have one. I'll get you started, Eva. Hello, thank you so much. Welcome back to No Time to Wait. It's lovely to have you here. Thanks for having me. <laughs> um, it's, it's a massive topic of research, I think, and you seem to have been incredibly thorough in your research and in your presentation of it. I wondered if maybe you felt there were any gaps at all in there. I can't imagine there are, but would you say there were any? 
Yeah, um, I'd say one of the biggest gaps was that um, I, I had struggled to get um, studios on board with my research. Um, I was only able to work with one um, archive group within the studio and, and it would have been really great to have had more. Um, and that was an issue that my examiners picked up when they were reading my thesis and they were like, oh, is it a, we're not sure whether this is it's good enough just to have one. And I said, well, look, one's better than nothing, so I'm, I'm keeping it in. Um, but yeah, that would have been a, a, a great opportunity to have collaborated with some more studios. So the studio that I worked with was more of um, everything's de-identified, but they generate more episodic content and visual effects heavy content which was great and the archivist had a really sort of good handle on what was what was going to be coming to them but it would have been good to also have engaged with like a bigger kind of film studio but maybe in the future. It seems like this is a wonderful approach for the archiving industry to get some insight I think into in industries. If you had um, more funding where would you where would you go next with your research? Um, it's probably two things that I would have like I'd love to be able to do. Um, one would be to partner with uh, with an art, like an audiovisual archive, maybe like the BFI or something, and do some work with some the curators and archivists, and, and partner with uh, potentially a visual effects company, or um, and maybe trial doing um, some some transfer work and documentation work, and sort of see what what could happen out of that process. Um, and then the other thing that kept coming up a lot, especially when I was talking to um, dev teams in visual effects companies, was the potential of maybe creating a, a piece of software, like an archiving module that could be connected to something like Shotgun, so that maybe there's a way that they could flag sort of assets and records that are, have been logged, in, logged into Shotgun that maybe has long-term value for the business and for sort of uh, other kind of you know, sort of historical, hello, <laughs> sorry for you, other kind of historical purposes. So, yeah, as because I have to say, like, seeing these presentations, I'm always super impressed by, you know, what can be achieved through, um, you know, technical expertise and, and coding and everything. And that's, that's I'm a traditional archivist in my training. And so, yeah, I, I, I like those, I like that ability to just be able to, create software and stuff, that's not my skill set, but I'd love to be able to work with someone to do that maybe one day. We have, I think maybe we can just squeeze in one quick question from the um, the online viewers. Uh, Connor Lynott was asking how helpful can film directors be in helping to preserve VFX? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I guess it would depend on, on the director and their influence. So um, directors, like big scale directors that have good relationships with visual effects um, practitioners, like, uh, you know, like, I guess examples like Avatar and things, for those kind of big scale projects, like, there'd be probably a bit more of an understanding. Like John Favreau has a really good relationship with um, visual effects companies having sort of really delved into the, into the field, having not previously done it until he sort of got into the Marvel universe. So there are, I'd say that's a good approach. If Because then if the directors are kind of pushing it, then the studio may get on board because they have a bit of power. So I like that idea. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Thanks again, Eva. We really appreciate you coming late. Thank you. Lovely. Next we've got um, Jerome Martinez and he will be talking on the state of raw cooked. Two seconds. Hello. Um, I will speak a bit about raw cooked. Um, raw cooked is uh, first uh, for people who are not aware about that. <laughs> um, the, the main issue solved by raw cooked is when you have a bunch of DPX or TIFF files, a lot of files, like for example, thousands of files because you have one file per video frame. So if you, you have one hour of content, sometimes your storage becomes just crazy. Um, so I don't, I don't understand why it was done like that, but it is the case with the scanners. And it is not playable by several players, uh, not Windows Meta Player or VLC. It is just impossible, and uh, the size is huge, especially for 4K content. 
And uh, there are sometimes with some interoperability issues uh, when you have a, a DPX from one scanner and you want to use in the workflow, but uh, the workflow just support another flavor of DPX. So our the goal is to uh, fix that and we create a different, um, a, 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 only one package with Rocook, so you have one file. <coughs> with all the video, all the audio, all the sidecar files just in one file. And this file, this file is playable by a lot of players because we focus on only uh, standard, standardized um, format law, Matroska, FFV1 and Flux for the container, video and audio. And also we, with a huge size, it is still huge, but we divide um, the, the size by two, so for, for your storage, it is still a lot, but a bit less expensive. Um, but one of the issues in some archive is for legal reasons, or for the workflow, it, it, it needs to be reverted to DPX, so it, we can use the storage of Matroska and FFV1 and FLAC only for the storage or for player, but when we need to go back to the DPX, it is possible. It is the goal of Hoku. We solve this issue. You need to store, you need to, to still have your DPX. So we, we compress, we store with one file, and when you need the, the DPX, we can revert to the DPX. So a lot of difficult, uh, difficulties with that, because DPX uh, is pretty old. Uh, there is a spec at SMBT, but uh, some scanners are not spec compliant. Very funny. Uh, there in the spec, it is when you have some padding bits. So, for example, if you have 10, 10 bit content, uh, it is stored three times 10 bit, 30 bits, but there is some padding to uh, um, 32 bits, and it, it, sh it shall be zero, but it is not. So when we promise to revert to the DPX exactly the same DPX files, we need to handle such cases. So we don't know, it is a bug maybe in, a, uh, in the scanner, there is no, it, the, the, the bits are a bit useless, but we promise to revert to the exact DPX file, so we need to store that. And uh, we need also, uh, the promise is to be completely reversible, so we do a lot of checks with our cooked, and um, it is sometimes difficult to do that. Uh, with Rocook now, uh, thanks to the sponsor, we have a lot of uh, flavors supported. 8, 10, 12, 16 bit, RGB or only gray. Uh, also, different wave uh, for the audio, different channel count, different frequencies, and so on. So uh, we, we develop in priority uh, the support of uh, the DPX files from our sponsor. And now we've recooked, uh, we have several uh, sponsors, so we, um, we try to, to have uh, a small cost per sponsor and to have uh, several sponsors. So now we have more than 20 recooked sponsors and users. So it is, it was, uh, there was a need about such kind of um, uh, uh, project. Um, a lot of archives were getting their DPX and they were saying, okay, I need to handle my thousand of files and I have no choice. But when we talk, for example, uh, here at, uh, at No Time To Wait, we see people have the same kind of problem. So why not being together and to pay every sponsor just a bit and we can create <coughs> such kind of tool. So, um, so yeah, with the text version of the sponsors, not only the logos, but thank you to uh, all the sponsors for that. But uh, now we have still some issues. Um, some very already a lot was done, but now we need still to, to develop a bit. Uh, we, we use FFV1. Uh, it is an open source lossless format, but it is slow, so we need to, to improve it a bit. Uh, it is the most requested improvement, uh, okay, because the performance is a, a bottleneck but uh, it is something not so quick to do. There are some alternatives. Uh, Joanna, for example, used 
a lot of uh, GNU parallel for optimization because it is not only uh, the, the CPU sometimes, it is also the storage which is slow. So it is good to, to run different uh, raw cooked um, on different, uh, with GNU parallel. So when one uh, instance of raw cooked uh, is stopped by the I.O., another one can use uh, the compression and so on. So yes, it is slow, but when we do a lot of raw cooked instances in parallel, it is uh, also better. Um, when, uh, the problem with compression is when, when you have a storage block corrupt, it happens sometimes with a LTO, uh, we, we may lose a bit more because we compress and it, uh, if the corrupt block is at, at the beginning of uh, a FFV1 block, you lose the complete block, the slice. So for that, uh, it, some sponsor requested to, uh, to have uh, some erasure code so we can retrieve the uh, lost block the, uh, in the storage block. So we developed uh, some uh, error correction code. We have a proof of concept and uh, we hope to, to have something stable in the next month. <coughs> Uh, we, we try to be the zip of uh, DPX, but for now it, it is all or nothing. When you revert to DPX, you have to, to, to revert to all the DPX only, even if you only want one file for a specific reason. So, as we want to be the zip of DPX, we need to implement to be able to, to get one, only one file, for example. So, it is the long term uh, idea we have uh, with ProCooked. Um, also, with now with 4K content, uh, it may be a big file at the end. So, okay, a lot of small DPX files and we created one unique file, but sometimes uh, it was too small at the beginning and now it is too big. <laughs> okay, so some sponsors uh, would like to, have to, to be able to split uh, maybe 10 minutes or just maximum size, like one terabyte for storage reason. <coughs> So this is something we want also to, to implement directly in raw cooked. Uh, for the moment, we have only a command line. So uh, it, is it is easy to use when you know the command line, but sometimes it is better to have a graphic interface. So we plan to have a graphic interface. So how we, sponsor, we, we do the sponsorship of raw cooked? It is open source. All is open source. Uh, but uh, there is a small thing, we put a license key uh, on the deliverable, on the binaries. So when you download the binaries from our website, you, you can test with uh, the 10-bit RGB, uh, it is open, but if you want to, to use other uh, flavors of DPX or TIFF, there, there is a key to, 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 to buy. So it is still open source, but when we we deliver something, uh, we, we put this case so for motivating people to uh, sponsor a bit um, uh, or, or pro cooked. It was a discussion between the sponsor and it was a way we found to motivate more people to, uh, to sponsor raw cooked. Uh, we ask 1,000 euro um, for uh, a sponsorship and uh, we we, we don't want to have one big sponsor uh, paying a lot, we want to have more uh, small sponsors. So 1,000 euro compared to uh, the storage cost divided by two, it is not a lot. So do the computing and you will see it is not so much. Uh, for the moment, uh, we, uh, we have a good financial sustainability, we have different sponsors and compared to the cost of the development, it is more or less okay. We keep getting a new sponsor, so it is fine. Um, we plan to sell the GPU because it is the most uh, requested thing, but it is long to develop, so we plan to sell the GPU. The GPU accelerated version, still open source, but maybe not available to everyone. We'll see how we manage that. And when we implement more and more options, we put a license key also on that, so up to have a, a good financial sustainability about that. So this is how we do with Rokuk, so it is a different business model, but still open source, but trying to motivate several small uh, entities to participate uh, together to the, um, to the finance of Rokuk. Wonderful. Thank you so much.
wonder if anyone has any questions. For sure, what are we having here? Unique opportunity. <laughs> I have one. Um, so the community help um, to, to, to make this product more sustainable, well, how would you recommend people might be able to help the open source project to be more accessible, be more, um, yeah, just to, to be endurable and to, and to what? Yeah. Uh, sorry, can, can you repeat that? <laughs> yeah, I'm not very good at it. I've very much have I. I wonder if there's any way that the um, users can help you more, maybe, with documentation? Um, or? Yeah, we, we are, on my side, I am very technical and sometimes I forget the documentation, for example. Uh, so, and my English is not so good. <laughs> so, if you can participate to uh, work group by creating a documentation and help, we have a, a manual of work group. Um, but for a moment it is very light. Uh, you can also do some uh, automation about uh, how to, to be sure that Rokuk works well with your workflow and so on. But yes, the most important thing, from, in my opinion, for people who are less te technical is to document everything and to have a good manual of Rokuk, for example. So it is very easy to do, so if you can, please do. <laughs> Not wanting to self publicize but I helped by just recently putting together a cheat sheet on the parallelization that we use at the BFI. And I think it would be great if we could have maybe a more user friendly, easy intro cheat sheet if anyone would like to help or help. I don't know. Uh, another point where people could help is about the case studies that are interesting to show how it works in practice. So, how to exactly uh, a, a good point? It is say how you use raw cooked in-house. It will be also good, so you, you show to others how you do it. Okay, we have one more question here, or? Uh, small remarks, uh, Steve from Matroska. Uh, you mentioned that you want to use a file splitting. Uh, yeah, I'm sure you know the segment linking in Matroska. That would be very useful. It, because Matroska was created when people were mo putting movies on CDs, so you had to split your files. So it's a built-in feature of Matroska. And basically, when you put all your files in one place, when you open one of the files in VLC, it's seen on one, uh, like the sum of all files, uh, virtually. Yeah, exactly. There is the segmentation feature in Matroska. Um, the issue we have there is that we use FFmpeg for the compression for the moment, and if I remember well, they don't support that. So, uh, yes, we, we think to, to have our own Matroska mixer, maybe, uh, in order also to optimize. Uh, we have different passes for the moment. We do the analyzing of the DPX, and then we do uh, the transcoding. And we plan to merge that and to have our own Matroska mixer. And if we do that at long term, because it has a cost also, uh, we plan to, to have the, the feature, the segmenting feature in uh, Matroska. Yes, it will be good to have. Just it is a matter of cost of development always. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. We're out of time. I think we just yeah. I think we need to go to break. I'm sorry. Maybe you could grab him at the break. Um, thank you so much. I know from personal experience what an amazing tool Rockwood is. So thank, you. thank you. Thank you from the community that uses it. Um, if we want to have a quick break, we'll rejoin here at, at 11. 11. Yeah, we're already late, are we? No, no, no. no, no, no we'll we break here. Already. Thank you. Back at 11. Many thanks. And if the people who I'm uh, introducing.
camera zoom and this one. How are you doing? Everyone can see you if you want to say hello. Thank you for having me here. So we have a video that Hakamo has um, pre-recorded for us, so we'll start by playing that one now. Hello everyone, my name is Jacobo Castellanos and I work with WITNESS, a human rights organization working globally with communities on the ground to help use video and technology to defend and protect human rights. I am part of the Technology Threats and Opportunities Program. And um, today, I want to talk to you about leveraging trust by tracking the provenance of digital media with open standards. And more specifically, to talk to you about our work within the C2PA. So that is the Coalition for Content, Provenance, and Authenticity, where technical specifications have been developed and are being developed to track, to, to trace the source and the history of digital media. So I'll start off with two videos that summarize, that'll do a much better job in summarizing uh, a lot of what I wanna share with you today. They're both about a minute long, and I'll start with this one that gives a brief overview of what the C2PA is and how it works. The Coalition for Content Provenance and Authenticity, C2PA, is a group of companies led by Adobe, Microsoft, Trupic, BBC, Intel, Sony, Arm, and Twitter that have come together to develop technical specifications for certifying the source and the history of media content. This yeah, sorry, we just have to share the screen. One second. Uh, it should be down at the bottom. I think it's just pushed down. Okay, I can do that. Bit. And this one? Uh, yeah. Two Great, three. okay. Just admit that one too. Right, apologies. Uh, we probably have time to restart that as there's been a few people coming in the room. I hope you don't mind, Jacobo. One second. Hello, everyone. My name is Jacobo Castellanos, and I work with WITNESS, a human rights organization working globally with communities on the ground to help use video and technology to defend and protect human rights. I am part of the Technology Threats and Opportunities Program. And um, today I want to talk to you about leveraging trust by tracking the provenance of digital media with open standards. And more specifically, to talk to you about our work within the C2PA. So that is the Coalition for Content, Provenance and Authenticity, where technical specifications have been developed and are being developed to track, to, to trace the source and the history of digital media. So I'll start off with two videos that summarize, that'll do a much better job in summarizing uh, a lot of what I wanna share with you today. They're both about a minute long, and I'll start with this one that gives a brief overview of what the C2PA is and how it works. The Coalition for Content Provenance and Authenticity, C2PA, is a group of companies led by Adobe, Microsoft, Trupic, BBC, Intel, Sony, Arm, and Twitter 
that have come together to develop technical specifications for certifying the source and the history of media content. The C2PA has developed technical specifications that are meant to constitute a common agreement for provenance information to be created and processed throughout the life cycle of a digital asset, from the moment of its creation to the moment that it is published and consumed, crossing potentially through multiple tools or devices. The C2PA has launched version 1.0 of its specifications, which means that tools and technology can now be built to create this interoperable provenance and authenticity ecosystem. Okay, let me go to the second video that talks about how uh, this system could be used by uh, human rights defenders, civic and community journalists, and other communities that we center, serve, and support to fortify their truth. Provenance and authenticity infrastructure could help activists or journalists offer more credible image or video evidence of human rights violations. Imagine that a human rights defender captures footage of a war crime using a C2PA-enabled camera. The provenance information would offer verifiable signals to suggest that this is a raw, unedited video. Then, with a C2PA-enabled editing software, sensitive information such as the faces of individuals that appear in the video may be blurred or redacted, leaving a trace of what was done to the media file and what was not. Finally, a C2PA-enabled publishing tool would allow viewers to trace the source and history of this asset in order to determine its authenticity. Okay, let me go back to work mode so you can see a talking head along with the slides. Um, so that was a quick summary of a, a broader, complex system, and I hope that it was fairly clear. I'm sure it raises more questions than answers. Uh, but I do have this next slide right here. I'm actually going to go uh, full screen again that summarizes the workflow. So we have this image right here along with its technical and non-technical metadata. So that is how we see images and we know images today. What the C2PA does is that it helps you create this verifiable contextual information from the point of its creation, right? So at this point, we have this box right here, which is called a manifest that tells you what camera in this case was used to take this picture, what location, at what time, and it's signed by TruePic. The information in here could vary. And then as we go across the pipeline of this particular image, we see that at the second stage, it went into what it seems Adobe's Photoshop, where it was edited, colors were changed, it was timestamped and signed by Adobe. And then at the last stage, it seems that it was published by the New York Times, as we see here, but before that, it was compressed and captions were added. So what the C2PA is doing is capturing this verifiable information across a workflow in order to give users uh, indicators of authenticity. Um, so what is at the heart of the C2PA is its trust model. What is trust based on in this case? And technically speaking, there's two things that the C2PA is doing. The first thing is that it's verifying the identity of the signer, right? So the signer in this case, in this example that we he see here, which is the active manifest, so the last manifest before you're actually consuming the image or video, we see that it's signed by the New York Times. It could be signed by any individual, organization, company. It could be self-signed by anyone or anything entity that has an X.509 certificate. And the process of signing could be automatic you know, if just by using an image, you could automatically have something signed perhaps, or it could be more of a manual process. Um, and so what the C2PA does is uh, verify the identity of this signer. And the second thing that it does is that it verifies that the information that is being shared about an image or video, so in this case, that it was compressed and that captions were added, is in fact connected to this particular image or video that you're seeing, right? So. Um, two things that are being done, verifying the identity of the signer and verifying that the contextual information is tied to that image and video that you're seeing. Now, I, I mentioned that at the heart of the trust model is the signer, and there's two reasons for that. Uh, the first is because it is the signer that determines what information is attached to an image or video, uh, what, what information goes into that manifest. Uh, if you may decide that you want to include a timestamp or that you may not want to include a timestamp or that you may want to include the camera manufacturer or not. The signer determines that information. 
But the second and more important reason as to why the signer is at the heart of this trust model is because what the C2PA is doing in its design is leveraging existing relationships of trust. So if you trusted in this case the New York Times before, then by verifying that this image or video that you're seeing indeed comes from the New York Times, then you may be more inclined to trust this image or video. Um, here I want to offer just a brief parenthesis to talk about how Witness uh, came into this. Um, we've been working uh, with uh, communities on the ground that use video to protect and to, and to defend human rights, recognizing that uh, this uh, digital media could often be undermined or dismissed, that there's a need to fortify the truth, and that provenance uh, information could be one of the mechanisms that is used in order to do this. Right? So in 2019, uh, uh, Witness published this report, Takes Where It Didn't Happen, that I'll share in the notes that pinpoints to 14 key issues that need to be addressed uh, when thinking about or designing this provenance and authenticity ecosystem at this early stage rather than at a later stage um, of its development and its deployment. Uh, Witness has also been working with the Guardian project on its application proof mode that offers uh, visual evidence that can be verified. And the last thing that I'll say about Witness's role in this is that <clears throat> We've also been thinking about it from a synthetic media lens. So we recognize that more and more there's tools to generate uh, uh, or manipulate images with AI and videos. And so there is a, a heightened need to, uh, to verify or to discern what is true from false, what is authentic from an authentic, what is real from what is fake. Uh, and especially and more so for communities that are marginalized and whose truth is often dismissed or undermined, as mentioned before. So uh, Witness uh, joined the C2PA, the Coalition for Content, Provenance and Authenticity, with two objectives. Oops, and I'm going to jump to this slide right here. The first objective was to carry out a harms assessment, and that is what you're seeing here in this slide, and I'll talk about it in a second. The second thing that we've been doing in addition to this harms assessment is trying to, well, having conversations with our partners on the ground, with the communities that we center serve and support, to identify uh, the, the, designs, uh, the designs that need to be incorporated into these standards, into the tools, into the regulation ecosystem, so that it could actually be leveraged by human rights defenders, by activists, by civic and community journalists. And, and what needs to be included in all of these stages so that it could be used by them. Um, and that includes, for example, archiving. How could um, archiving communities leverage uh, the C2PA, leverage these technologies to facilitate their process, to authenticate their media, to retain control of their media? Um, and I'll speak about that more in a second. Um, but the other part that I was mentioning is the harms assessment. So Witness has been leading the Threats and Harms Task Force of the C2PA. <clears throat> and within this task force, we've led this harms modeling where we've adapted a, a harms modeling framework that is divided into these four categories that you see here. And we've been asking the following questions. How could the C2PA lead to a denial of consequential services? How could the C2PA lead to an infringement of human rights? How could it erode social and democratic structures? And how could it injure? And so. In conversations with partners uh, and communities, we've identified a long list of types of harms and specific harms. And again, this will also be linked in case it's of interest or relevance to anyone. And for each one of these harms, we've uh, been trying to identify existing or potential mitigation strategies. So what could be done at the specs level, at the tooling level, at the regulation level, at the media literacy component level to uh, avert the possibility of these potential harms becoming actual harms. Um, I'm not going to go into detail here just for the sake of time. I do want to mention just one example. Um, we think one of the conclusions or one of the potential harms that we identified is that the C2PA could exacerbate existing inequalities. And one way, there could be various, but one way by which this could happen is by, if we connect it back to the trust model that I mentioned at the start, is by adding more credibility to images that come from uh, recognized outlets as opposed to those that come from perhaps communities on the ground who don't have that same level of recognition as the New York Times does, as, as in the example that I mentioned at the start. 
because as mentioned the trust model is to leverage existing relationships of trust right and so for bigger outlets bigger companies organizations or recognized individuals being able to verify that something indeed comes from you may be enough for a lot of people to trust it but when it's a news outlet that very few people know about, when it's an organization that very few people know about, when it's a, a witness, a bystander that uh, captures uh, evidence of a, a human rights violation, they may not have that same privilege. So there's a list of potential harms. Again, I'm not going to go into them. I'll just mention this last one just uh, uh, to offer one more example, we believe that another potential harm from the C2PA is that it could reduce options for anonymity and pseudonymity. Um, there could be various ways that this could happen. Uh, people may inad inadvertently disclose information. Uh, certain tools may simply not have the functionalities that are required to ensure privacy, to ensure anonymity, or they may have them, but they may probably, or they could just not have the right user experience that enables um, users to effectively retain control of their information. So the last thing that I want to say about this harms assessment is that we're looking at it from different angles. Uh, I think the call here for the archiving community is that we also need to look at it more deeply from an archiving perspective, both for harms but also for opportunities. Um, and as I'll mention later, that uh, we're, this is a conversation that we're happy to have and that we hope to have in this space, but also stemming from uh, this conversation. Um, by way of conclusion, I wanted to somehow connect it uh, more specifically to archiving. Um, and so I think there's two things to say about the C2PA. First is that it brings a new trust model to the authentication ecosystem. Uh, and along with this trust model, a, a, specific, a specific technical design, technical specifications. And this trust model, along with its technical specifications, comes with pros and cons for the archiving community. So uh, one uh, pro, for example, is that it could, in one way, facilitate the process of authentication. In others, it could make it more difficult. But there's still a lot of open questions. What are, how could uh, the design be better suited to uh, enable uh, communities to archive. Um, how could we prevent harms from uh, the C2PA model in archiving, right? So that is one part. The second part is the fact that, well, we've got to recognize that uh, provenance tools don't stem from this. There are tools that have been used before. So there's the example of SAVE that uses the Guardian Project's uh, uh, proof mode code to authenticate images that are being preserved. But the one thing that the C2PA, along with other efforts, such as the, the Content Authenticity Initiative or Project Origin, what they are doing is pushing us away from niche tools and niche usage towards more widespread, towards more systemic use of provenance and authenticity. And that has implications for the archiving community. So on the one hand, for example, by creating this ecosystem that we may be facilitating that more tools, more services, more hardware, more, more software includes this system of capturing provenance information, thereby enabling um, a chain of custody of sorts that could facilitate the work of, of archivists to authenticate content, perhaps, but also recognize that by creating an ecosystem, we may also be raising the stakes of authentication. We may be requiring adding more uh, a higher need to include provenance information and that is problematic because we recognize that there are legitimate reasons not to want to or not to be able to use these systems so for example they may be they may come at a financial cost there may be technical barriers that don't allow many people to use these systems or it could be misused by governments or corporations to surveil or to put checks on on, on freedom of expression and so in these scenarios, pe people may not be able to use them or not, may not want to use them for legitimate reasons. And yet we may be creating an ecosystem that is adding the need to include provenance information and, and thereby undermining archived content that does not include it. So there are a lot of open questions. I think what I want to uh, leave you all with as a way of, uh, yeah, just to end this uh, presentation is to say that we're hoping to open up this conversation to think about more specifically one key question that we have is how could communities uh, use these systems to uh, retain control of their archives 
what could what needs what are the red flags that we need to look out for what are the designs that we need to think about what are the tools that we need to think about and um, i'm hoping that uh Part of this presentation at least opens up that uh, discussion within this uh, space and beyond. Thank you very much and goodbye. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Hakaba. <laughs> Let me see if I can bring you back to full screen. I may need help. So I wonder if we have any questions immediately in the room for Hakaba. Yep. You can stop sharing, right? You can stop sharing. So we had a few little um, issues at the beginning there with your um, presentation technically, so we're going to give you a couple of extra minutes. Um, so I guess I wonder if a question from myself, if, if we wait for some in the room. Um, I wonder if five years from now, um, if the provenance and authenticity ecosystem becomes mainstream, what kind of um, scenarios can archivists expect to encounter, do you think? Hey, everyone. Uh, so thanks for bearing with that presentation, pre-recorded presentation. Um, so thanks for that question. Um, I think that a, a good scenario five years from now will be one where uh, verifiable provenance information is just one of the many elements that strengthen archiving as a practice and as a community. Um, I think that one of the great things about media is not just that it tells a story, but that the media itself is part of the story. Um, in fact, uh, the source and the history of media can be the story in and of itself. So where a picture was taken, uh, by whom, uh, what camera was used, or if it was edited and how. I think that uh, for a long time, uh, metadata has been sort of an afterthought um, it's something that not many people know about and those that do just it's not considered often uh, but if providence and authenticity does become more mainstream I think it'll be just as important that more and more people know about it and understand uh, metadata and that uh, not just for reasons of privacy and safety but also uh, to see metadata beyond that as part of the tools in our toolbox to tell a better and more complete story um, so, so that is the first part of, of the answer. A good scenario is one where provenance and authenticity helps us capture a more complete story of a person, of an event, uh, of the video or the image itself. Um, and the second part of, of the answer is that a good scenario is one where uh, provenance and authenticity tools such as this, the C2PA, help us make better decisions about how we interpret the media that we're consuming um, and more generally how it helps us create a more trustworthy uh, digital environment or how, as witness has been uh, pushing for how we fortify the truth um, so i think to sum up uh, provenance and authenticity tools in the future uh, to to be something that's a positive i think it shouldn't shake up the archiving community to the point that it's something that is required, but it's just one of the many tool, uh, one of the many tools that we have at our disposal to tell a better, a more complete, a more trustworthy story um, for users now or in the future. That's wonderful. Um, it sounds like um, I mean I'm in awe of what Witness do, and this is just an amazing project. Um, and I love the reflexivity. Your your the process you're going through as well of being reflexive about the pros and cons of the of the the new system that you may hopefully bring in successfully um i wonder how we might be able to continue the conversation for you how might people be able to help you continue this discourse and develop something more yeah so i think for this the same applies i think for many technologies that are coming into the world is uh, how do we get involved? What are the spaces that we need to get involved in? Uh, what are the conversations that we should be having and who should be part of these conversations? So I think witness now, part of our work has been focused in, in the standard space. Uh, so uh, I, I think a good way to uh, come into this uh, conversation is to how 
to think about how we could shape the standards space, right? And and there's also a big question about who should be part of that. Uh, just because in standards in general, uh, I think at least it, it's been my experience, but I think it's, a, it's 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 part of a broader reality that they're usually very close knit. Uh, spaces where there's not a lot of room for everybody to be part of. There, there's usually a very small uh, group of, of, it's not a very diverse space, right? So I think that one way to participate is just to bring more people into these spaces. Uh, and, and that is what Witness is, is, is doing within the C2PA. How do we uh, get more people, if not directly, at least indirectly involved uh, in the process of, of creating these standards? Uh, but that also applies to the tooling stage, how uh, as tools are developed, how more people are part of their design and how more people are part of their deployment. Um, and so just to give a more concrete answer as to how more people could be part of this process, I think one way could just be, you know, reaching out either to us or to the C2PA uh, or joining the processes more directly. And um, I, I did leave my contact information there and hopefully that could be shared along with this presentation. And and uh, if, if this does seem of interest to anyone or or if, does, if this does overlap with your work, I think that the more people that we could uh, bring into this conversation, the better. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. We really appreciate the time you've given us today to come and present. So thank you ever so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I'm just going to close down. Okay. Oh, I don't want to end the meeting. I want to just get rid of it. <laughs> okay. So next we have Martin Zainstra and Martin Brinkerink. Uh, they're going to be talking about proof of provenance, how to know where a public web application comes from. No worries. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, yep. There's no audio except for what's coming out of this mic. OK. Um, so um, today we want to present uh, something that is very much uh, related to the presentation uh, you've just uh, seen. Um, but maybe a little bit more uh, 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 taking the same principles into uh, proving the concept in uh, uh, practice. Um, so um, uh, uh, what I want to present uh, together with Martin is uh, something that we've both worked on. Um, I, from my position at uh, the Netherlands Institute for Sound and Vision, uh, uh, looking at the use cases for uh, tools that uh, allow you to prove the provenance of uh, web uh, publications. Um, and Martin, uh, uh, as a freelancer who did uh, um, desk research for this project to see how it fits in a larger uh, set of technologies that are emerging, of which uh, the C2PA uh, initiative is one of the things that he researched in his uh, desk research. Uh, just to give you an idea of our roles in this project. Um, I'll first present the context of this project, then we'll go into two of the use cases that we've proven as part of this research project, uh, and then reflect a little bit on our experience now that the project has ended. Um, so uh, this is uh, the result of a research project that was initiated by uh, Public Spaces, which is an initiative that is looking for uh, uh, alternative technology uh, that not-for-profit organizations can use to build their software ecosystem uh, when they are serving uh, uh, the public good. Uh, so think of uh, public broadcast uh, organizations, other media organizations, uh, um, NGOs, organizations like that who want to have a tool set that fits with uh, a digital tool set that fits with their uh, remit and their missions. Uh, so think of uh, things like it being open, transparent, responsible, 
uh, user-centric, uh, mm -hmm. all values that these organizations want to also uh, portray in their technology stack. Um, and uh, Proof of Provenance is an initiative that falls under that uh, public spaces umbrella uh, that is uh, trying to take steps uh, for uh, particularly media organizations uh, uh, to be able to add their digital uh, expressions uh, with some uh, confidence in a very uh, um, uh, diverse media landscape uh, consisting of uh, media expressions being shared on social media, uh, provenance not being clear, uh, expressions being uh, uh, um, uh, recontextualized, sometimes not uh, represented correctly. Uh, in that reality, uh, media organizations are, as you may have experienced, struggling a little bit. Uh, proof of provenance is a very practical uh, approach in exploring what can we do to add some more confidence and uh, um, uh, trustworthiness to uh, uh, official uh, quote-unquote media expressions. Um, in this project, uh, which was really uh, quite practical, uh, really proving this concept uh, uh, in practice, we took uh, existing uh, technology in the Netherlands from an initiative which is called IRMA, uh, I Reveal My Attributes, uh, is what the uh, uh, abbreviation stands for. Um, this is technology that allows uh, individuals or organizations to uh, expose uh, uh, particular attributes uh, that uh, uh, belong to them in a privacy-conscious way. So. Uh, you're, for instance, able to uh, identify yourself as uh, uh, by name. That's also possible, but not necessarily. This also speaks a little bit to the threats that were presented in the earlier uh, uh, presentation. Uh, you could also identify yourself as a profession uh, or identify yourself as an inhabitant of a particular uh, city or somebody of a particular age group. Um, and these uh, uh, attributes are registered at a, a central authority and there they can be uh, verified when you uh, use this technology to uh, add a signature to something that you want to share uh, as a media expression. Um, so this was already existing technology that we used in this project uh, to add uh, digital signatures to uh, online media expressions. Um, and with this proof of concept, we wanted to um, uh, enable a process where uh, a publisher or a creator or writer uh, could confirm uh, an attribute uh, with an external authority. Uh, this could be, for instance, I'm web editor of a particular public uh, broadcast organization. Um, they could then sign a media expression with this attribute. Uh, so for instance, uh, the web editor of a public uh, broadcast organization would work in their content management system and they could use this technology to uh, uh, add uh, a signature to an article that they are writing in this uh, content management system. And then uh, uh, with this integration they could publish that uh, and then the public could uh, uh, see that the signature is present in the online publication and they could verify this signature with a browser plugin uh, that we'll demonstrate a little bit uh, further in uh, the presentation. So uh, I'm now going to ask Martin to present the two cases that we explored in this project. No trip. No trip. Um, so there are two cases that we want to present and then with some reflections on, on this. Uh, by the way, my name is Martin Zijnstra. That's Martin Brinkerink if you want to avoid confusion in the, in the media. Um, the workflow diagram, uh, um, how this now works. So Marta explained this in, in, in bullet points, but now in a, in a diagram. So uh, for example, we have journalist Alice in the top, top left. Um, she registers at an external authority. She says, I am a, a journalist. And the external authority says, yes, you are a journalist. Then she gets a, um, uh, a, uh, a a proof of that, which she stores locally, uh, which she can use as a uh, as a as a signature for 
uh, media expressions. So then to use her local, uh, her, her local certificate, that's the word, certificate to sign a particular media expression. And the certificate only says this is a verified journalist. So Alice can be remain anonymous um, and you trust the external authority to verify that indeed Alice was a journalist on the, at the moment that she required the, um, the uh, certificate. So then uh, the signed expression is published to the web and the general public can use a, um, a public uh, key infrastructure, which is an infrastructure where you can share these, uh, these, these um, certificates uh, with the uh, expression itself and then see they can indeed infer that Alice was a journalist at the time of uh, the signature and also when it was signed, etc. Um, so and then there's two use cases that we uh, explored in this, in this project. Uh, one is uh, signing web uh, publications by broadcasters. So a public broadcaster wants to um, give an indication that they are indeed the author of the piece and um, they don't need it's written by a journalist or by the broadcaster employee themselves. Uh, so uh, they provide that with this signature, with this certificate. Um, so the media um, consumer can research that and vouch indeed that this has been written by that person, verified by that external authority. Um, but also they could take uh, media from third parties with the same signature. So if you have a uh, journalist in, an, in a conflict region, um, we don't want to know their names because that's a security risk. Uh, we can have them s uh, get a certificate identifying them as indeed a journalist um, and have their own media publication signed with that and that can be communicated onwards. So you can also up, upstream can get um, these media search signed. So, uh, and, and the last point, yeah, so you can uh, protect the identity of the person while still verifying that it's indeed a journalist. So that, that would work something like this. Um, you would sign your um, your content with an app, the Irma app. So we use existing infrastructure for this, um, where you just have to use your own certificate on your app, uh, use QR, this, uh, this QR code, and then um, it uh, provides you with a, um, with a signature, uh, a cryptographic signature, so a, a string of uh, letters and, and numbers. So and then the second use case is then when you are a media consumer. Um, so you find, find this material on, uh, on a web page and you want to see if that is indeed um, uh, signed by a uh, recognized uh, person. Um, so it's published um, and then you want to know, it, has it been changed? Um, and you want to also maybe distribute it further. So um, we developed a, a, a basic standard. It's a very ad hoc standard for this um, and that can all be found in our documentation. Um, and that looks a bit like this. And we may also develop a uh, plugin for Firefox. Uh, later on, you can have a link to test it out yourself. So you go to this uh, to a web page that has uh, proof of provenance content on it, and you can see uh, in this case there are seven uh, signatures on the on the page. Uh, so and you click on it, and if you click on it, you see the next page. Uh, and then in this case. Uh, we can see that the publisher actually changed three parts of the, um, the media expression, the title, the image, and part of the body, whereas some other parts, like the author and the abstract, were not changed. Uh, and then you can see so uh, which is valid and which is invalid, uh, and also why it is invalid, um, which is a good way to verify the, um, the provenance of material and see if it's unchanged. Um, and then, you, of course, you can also use that to make a copy of the work, including the signatures, and republish it somewhere else. So you can also verify that uh, what you have taken from a uh, public broadcaster is indeed by that public broadcaster, and you haven't changed it yourself. So if you want to try this yourself, uh, this is a tiny URL um, for uh, the demo page that we have, uh, and the source code can be found at the GitLab of uh, Waag Society. I'll wait until the photos have been taken. <laughs> Demo page is in Dutch, unfortunately, but uh, Google Translate works perfectly. So, uh, yeah, for the, for the people at home, the demo page is in Dutch. Uh, 
but uh, you can use Google Translate. All right, um, then some reflections. So we did two, uh, two reflective reports on this. Um, uh, this one was made by me. I did a SWOT and gap analysis also to be found on our website, so you can find, find it there. Um, and our main outcomes here, so we, we demonstrated how it works. Um, uh, but currently it only works on um, static media, so uh, only for text and images at the moment, and not for uh, video or any other interactive media, which, um, which is something that we want to explore further in the future. Um, and also the metadata on this is now stored on the web page itself. Uh, and this is a risk uh, because if you remove the signature, then you have an unsigned uh, uh, media expression. And uh, most of the things that we found on the internet are unsigned. So then uh, it, it, it flows back to a normal trust situation. Um, and of course, there are similar initiatives. So there's also some competition between those initiatives. Uh, there should be only one standard as the previous uh, um, presenter also indicated. Uh, because if you only have one standard, then everyone uses the same thing uh, and it's easier for uh, your user experience. Um, and to improve the user experience, we're also thinking about adding um, the initial publication platform as part of the signature, as part of the um, certificate. Uh, so you can also see where the material has, has come from, if, even if it has been copied and used somewhere else. Um, and as we said before, um, most of the things on the internet are unsigned by our tools. I think almost all, except maybe two pages. Um, but you can, we should be able to dis distinguish between those uh, objects that are signed and unsigned. And we can see it now um, in, in, our, in our demonstration here, but that could be better. Uh, so that's uh, the reflections that we did from this report. And there was a second report on the use case for, for uh, web archiving, and I'll let the other Martin uh, introduced that. Thank you, Martin. Uh, so this was my uh, main role in the project, actually, uh, to think about what this uh, proof of concept actually means for archives, uh, because that's where I work. I don't work at a media uh, organization. So uh, I looked at this project to see uh, how does this tra translate to the practice of, uh, uh, of an audiovisual archive in my case, but I collaborated with uh, the KB National Library of the Netherlands uh, on uh, uh, this report. Um, and we identified that there are actually two uh, uh, important values uh, that can be taken from initiatives like this for archives. Uh, one, uh, we saw this as uh, a great way to uh, uh, actually validate provenance information uh, for content that we archive from the web, uh, which is uh, something that uh, uh, we are doing uh, increasingly uh, in the Netherlands, um, based on these uh, attributes that the proof uh, provenance technology uh, allows to be embedded in the page. Um, and thinking about it a little bit more, uh, we could even see us also using this to self-sign uh, um, the crawls that we take from the internet. Um, uh, also because uh, next to the signature, it also adds uh, a hash uh, uh, that allows you to verify if content has been changed uh, from the time that you've uh, crawled uh, the content. Um, but uh, looking at the current web archiving tool sets that we are uh, using in practice, uh, there are some important gaps that uh, don't currently allow us to wreak uh, these values uh, um, um, uh, uh, in, in our daily uh, practice. Um, we would need to add uh, mechanisms to detect and validate these uh, uh, embedded pieces of code, uh, these digital signatures in the HTML uh, pages, uh, which is currently lacking uh, from popular web crawlers that uh, we are using to create our web archives. Um, and it's also, we feel, very important to then be able to meaningfully represent what 
uh, it means that such a, a piece of uh, verifiable uh, provenance information is attached to a web page that has been archived. Um, uh, it's also something that we didn't mention in this presentation, but uh, we did a few workshops uh, um, with uh, journalists and uh, 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 um, media creators, um, and you often see people conflate the idea of provenance with the idea of trustworthiness of the actual content that has been signed. Um, and in order to really represent these web archives, we need to distinguish uh, uh, which level of validation we are giving to the content. We are not telling that the content is correct, we are telling that the content uh, verifiably came from a certain uh, signee. And that distinction also needs to be reflected in tools like the Wayback Machine when we would use this uh, in our web archiving uh, procedures. And with that, I think we uh, see if we still have a bit of time for questions. But I'll leave that up to the moderator. Okay. Thank you so much. That was really interesting. Um, I wonder if we have questions in the audience. We do, right away. Hi, I'm Lude. Um Imagine I'm like a lawyer and I'm this barred from practicing, but I'm still signed. How long does the certificate last? If I'm like a doctor and I start selling snake oil, but I'm still signing uh, medical documents or something, it wouldn't, I mean, how long does it last and how do you prevent abuse uh, or identity theft, I guess, or something like that? With the, um, uh, the expiration of the certificates, I'm not sure how it currently works with the technology. Do you know, Marta? The yeah, the authority decides, but I don't know if they set I don't know what they've set uh, as an expiration date in this uh, uh, particular uh, um, proof of concept. So the, the authority decides the, uh, the expiration date of the certificate. Uh, and that depends. So you, uh, for example, in the Netherlands, there's an authority that verifies your email address, right? That's the, our, um, our IP, uh, our domain provider, SCDN, uh, so you, then you verify your email address. And that, I think that's a year. Um, you can also verify you as a person at the municipality of Eindhoven, Nijmegen, Eindhoven, Eindhoven. Eindhoven. Um, and that is, uh, uh, that, that's also a year, I think. So if you have a different authority for like being a doctor or maybe uh, being a, a, a law practitioner, then that could be like half a year, 10 days, or maybe even a day, right? Okay, but now imagine I did something bad. How long does it take for my identity become, to become invalid? And Yeah, so the certificate is, is given to you by the authority, and that cannot be subtracted because it's a, um, it's a certificate that is uh, locally for you, or is, is it? I, I, I can answer much for Hold on a second. So, so, so there's a the certificate has an expiry date, and we like to make them as far in the future as possible because we don't want to reissue them. Um, but we have a certificate revocation list, which we make as short as possible so that it's as short as, uh, as possible, and we can add people to the revocation list. Although functionally, CRLs are almost complete crap in the world. So the answer is we have a really big problem when it comes to certifying people and getting their um, permission to be a doctor revoked while actually not revoking their permission to exist as a person, <laughs> right? So this is a big problem and I'm, I'm really enthusiastic that you're doing this because I think it's really going to bring this into, you know, the public. Thanks for the, uh, thanks for the clarification. Is it still on? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Did it answer the question? I think Do we so. have any more questions in the room at the moment? No, I think that's it. Anything online? No? That's brilliant. Thank you ever so much. That's really wonderful.
video in it? Okay, okay. fine, we'll see. <laughs> okay, next we have uh, Rochemarine de Grot and Bob Corre. I hope I said that okay. Um, they're going to be talking today about increasing findability of audiovisual heritage collections on the web with the NDE data registry. I should add that Bob works for the uh, Konin Klicker Bibliothek, National Library of the Netherlands, and today is also representing the Dutch Heritage Network, and Roche Marine uh, works for Sound and Vision. Thank you. So let me first introduce the Dutch Digital Heritage Network. Uh, the aim of this uh, Dutch network is to increase the social value of the cultural heritage information maintained with libraries like the National Library, archives like the National Archives, museums and other cultural institutions like Sound and Vision. We work with a natural strategy and this starts from the end user perspective and it, it encourages institutions to provide digital uh, heritage information that's more visible, usable and sustainable. There's a whole program around this, and it's about building strong cross-sector networks on the level of expertise and information. Linked data is regarded as one of the enabling technologies. So these end users usually start with Google. They find stuff, but many topics do not show up. So we build portals, a lot of them, which one to choose. And can I browse from one portal to the other? Are they interlinked? And is the information within these portals up to date? Because usually uh, behind the scenes of the web portals, there's a lot of aggregation, copying of data from uh, sources. Not an ideal situation. We're working with some design principles to, uh, to get to a discovery infrastructure. We're rethinking the network and we're saying we should um, make uh, the data at the source much more usable. We, we refer to data and not copy data. So we can build portals uh, which are dynamic views on these uh, data sources. We apply linked data principles, use web-centric technologies, and where possible use decentralized and distribu distributed uh, technologies. Of course, these design principles are also applicable uh, besides the heritage fields, even uh, outside of the Netherlands. We've built a roadmap for this discovery infrastructure. Uh, let's start at the, at the top, the web portals. We envision these to plug in to knowledge graphs, so they can ask, give me data about a specific topic and which data is related to that. So we have to build a knowledge graph for this. Um, this knowledge graph is fed uh, by the data set register, which I will be talking about next, uh, to discover relevant data sets in the heritage fields. But also, it's plugging into the network of terms, which will be another presentation this afternoon. But it all starts, of course, with a, a collection management system at the heritage institutions. There is a lot of data, and they should advertise this data in the dataset register, so it's known which datasets are out there. And these collection systems should use more links uh, and not strings, so they use the terms from the network of terms. So the dataset register aims to give more insight into the availability of datasets in the heritage fields and to encourage the use of these datasets. This insight can help so software and also search engines like Google to find datasets. By analyzing these datasets, we can build a knowledge graph on heritage for better use of this data. This tool has, has been built uh, within the network of uh, uh, digital heritage and is now being managed and promoted by the, uh, the National Archives. 
So the principle behind this data set register, uh, heritage organizations are encouraged to provide data set descriptions of the data sets they supply. And here a data set can be a data dump of their catalog, Sparkle endpoint, uh, any data that's coming out of their systems and can be shared uh, under a license, preferably uh, open license to the community. We encourage them to publish these data set descriptions Again, uh, we like the data to be at the source, so the organization should uh, publish their own data set descriptions. But register the URL of these data script descriptions with the data set regi register so we can find them. Because the data set register crawls these data set uh, descriptions, stores them in a triple store, and refreshes this information on a regular basis. So at the end, we have a uh, uh, a data set register which can be searched uh, via a, a website or a more machine readable via Sparkle queries. We started with um, designing uh, a layout for these data set descriptions. We made requirements for data set descriptions. We didn't think um, made anything new. We just chose an ontology which is uh, very good. Schema.org has a good um, uh, data set description uh, uh, requirements. So we adopted uh, these. The benefit of this is that when an organization is using these data set descriptions, uh, also Google understands your data set descriptions. So it's also findable by Google. So our main focus is um, getting these data set descriptions as a machine readable data. So we have an API uh, which can be used to uh, notify us about this URL. And the, the triple store, you can uh, reach, it's a public triple store, you can search uh, with Sparkle. Of course, it's all very technical, so we also made a demonstrator, an API demonstrator, which uses the API but can be used by anyone. Unfortunately, uh, only in Dutch at the moment, so bear with me. Um, it has um, uh, uh, several parts. The main part, of course, is uh, getting uh, the data set descriptions searchable. At the moment, there are over 700 data set descriptions from several uh, Dutch and Belgium uh, heritage uh, institutions. Which, which can be uh, searched. Well, this is what a data set description looks like, one of the search results, sound and vision. Um, um, the quality of the data set descriptions is very important, so that's a task for the heritage organizations. They really have to think, how can I sell my data sets? So provide a good title, a good description, a license is uh, required. Who made the data sets? Who published the data sets? And also, of course, the technical information. How can we get to the data, the, the so-called distributions? In this case, uh, it, it points to a Sparkle endpoint with sound and vision. So at the moment, uh, we are um, communicating towards uh, heritage institutions to publish their data set descriptions, to make them a better quality so we can get a much, uh, much larger uh, part of the data set in the Netherlands uh, uh, online as data set descriptions. And the next uh, step is to promote the, the use of the data set uh, register. One of the first will be our own knowledge graph. Because we know where the data sets are, we can uh, extract more knowledge from these data uh, sets to uh, to make it possible that portals use the knowledge graph to make dynamic uh, portals. So I'll now give the, the mic to Rosmarijn to tell how they use the dataset register. Thanks, Bob. Uh, yeah, my name is Rosmarijn de Groot. I uh, joined Sound and Vision half a year ago, and I'm a product manager for the Heritage and Research Department. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, show a little slide about the collection of Sound and Vision. I borrowed this uh, slide from my colleague Willem, who will be presenting this afternoon. So if you see the slide again, then he's the uh, original author. Um, but we have a core collection of audiovisual productions, so uh, uh, television programs, film, radio, music. 
uh, and the supporting collection of non-audiovisual materials. Uh, so for example, there's uh, books, there's photographs, costumes, logs and scripts, uh, and also press archives since we um, integrated with uh, a press archive. Um, and in total, it comprises of more than 800,000 hours of radio, television, film and music. And of course, uh, much of this data is still protected by copyright. Uh, we publish um, the open collections in our general public portal, but we also publish it as uh, data in our open data lab. Um, yeah, you can see some of the data sets that we've published uh, in those circles. Uh, almost all metadata is published under a CC0 license, but this excludes the summaries and the descriptions uh, because they're made by the broadcasters and we're not the, the authors of them. Um, there's a limited amount of objects that we can publish under an open license. Um, a part of our collection, the open images data set, uh, is um, um, uh, published under a... Um, public domain license, and then we, for some data sets we have uh, agreements with the, uh, with the rights holders. And we publish them in several distributions, so either through a Sparkle endpoint or a OAI PMH or as a downloadable file. And these are also the data sets that we publish in the data registry. Uh, I want to open this link now, see if it works. Yeah. Yeah, so we're the publisher of 11 data sets. Uh, Bob already showed uh, the first one. Uh, this is the entire catalog of Sound and Vision. You can see a short description. Uh, we talked about quality of descriptions. I think we'll talk about that later. Um, there's the URI, the license, uh, and this is available through a Sparkle endpoint. The open images data set, uh, the description is in Dutch, but it's a bit more thorough. Um, uh, available under a public domain license, and there's also there's an OAI PMH um, distribution, but there's also uh, you can also uh, enter the data set on EU screen. Um, yeah, we'll just quickly go through the other ones. They're partly um, data sets of um, around the Second World War because then the copyright was confiscated. Uh, the GTAA is our thesaurus, and uh, Willem will talk this afternoon on how we also make that available in the network of terms. Uh, with Barend and Van Dorp, we were able to make, uh, there's, it's a Dutch uh, TV program, and we were able to make uh, an agreement with the rights holders. Now I have to get back to my presentation. Thanks, Raza. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, so why do we register data in the dataset registry? Well, we see it as a core task as a public institution, but also as a partner in the Dutch Digital Heritage Network to provide access to our holdings um, as far as possible, of course, within uh, copyright restrictions. We want to enable others to reuse our collection data and in doing so improve the discoverability, contextualization and increase engagement with various, various audiences. So by registering in the uh, NDE dataset registry, we improve the findability for our data in the heritage field for both humans and machines. And the NDE registry is also connected to the CLARIA registry, which is uh, the registry for the humanities and the social sciences. So we also improve the findability of our collections, collection data uh, for the scientific field. So how do we publish data? Uh, it's a custom process uh, because our collection management system is not yet able to uh, uh, publish uh, uh, itself. So we have a spreadsheet with all necessary information. We can uh, add data or change information over there that is transferred to a turtle file that is loaded onto our linked data server and then we can either queue the dataset uh, register API or we just wait until it refreshes uh, on itself. So yeah, in the future, we would like to define more or better data sets. Uh, for example, you saw the uh, Sound and Vision catalog. Uh, it's, it's quite hard uh, for a user to understand what is actually in there. So uh, next year also, um, 
for Podium Kunstbinnet, the presentation we saw this morning by Remco. We are a partner in that, and uh, we will publish a, a subset of for our music collections, uh, specifically for Podium Kunstbinnet. So we really want to work with uh, users to um, improve the usability and improve the descriptions. Uh, we want to publish, if possible, more metadata fields under an open license, and also once they're available at other distributions. Um, so, yeah, thank you for uh, listening, and uh, Bob and I are happy to uh, answer any questions. Thank you very much. That's wonderful. I wonder, do we have any questions in the audience at the moment? Hello, this is um, Paul Duchesne. I was, I was just wondering if you could um, possibly share any like that transformation to Turtle, whether you've used kind of custom systems or you've used um, any kind of pre-existing tools. Yeah, I, I think I would have to uh, ask my colleague Willem to <laughs> answer that question. Okay. Could you, um, shall I give you the mic? Uh, so the, <coughs> you saw the, the uh, uh, publication flow in four steps. Um, and uh, it's actually just um, getting all the data from a spreadsheet <coughs> and convert that to, uh, to Turtle using, yeah, um, uh, yeah just uh, uh, custom-built software. So, yeah, it's not really something that we publish. It's something that we use. Um, and that's just a practical way of uh, getting it done. So instead of... Uh, having to find some way of uh, <coughs> having like an, uh, uh, an edit editing uh, system that also has the publication possibility. Uh, yeah, we just decided let's, let's just build it ourselves and manage it uh, ourselves. It's, uh, as, as you've seen, it's about uh, 11 data sets at the moment and uh, yeah, it's, it's quite functional. It can be improved uh, uh, later. But uh, if you ever want to uh, know more details, then we <laughs> should talk later. <laughs> yeah. I can say something about this too. Uh, within, it, the, within the project of the dataset register, we also talk to a lot of uh, suppliers, uh, vendors of collection management systems to promote uh, the, the data set descriptions, the API. So there are already several um, uh, content uh, collection management systems which can make uh, and publish these uh, data set descriptions, but not all. So there's also uh, the, the possibility to make them by hand. There's a form on the, on the website, datasetregister.nl, which you can just fill in, and at the end of the road, you've got some uh, JSON LD which you can then post on your website or even on, on GitHub, uh, so we can get to this uh, data. Thank you. Any more questions online? Yeah, have one at the back. Um, it's kind of related. Uh, uh, it was just something that I thought of. Like, um, since archives now are visited online, um, we can't. Ma we are. Um, I think we're. In our institution, for example, we have to measure the visitors we have. So and that's also a use of our portal. And I just thought about um, it would be so great n not to have to be rely only on portals of like sole institutions, but to have like shared ones. But I, it just came to my mind that um, it might be a hindrance using shared portals where you can't measure your um, how many users you have and uh, uh, visitors you have, and yeah. But I'm, like, actually, I, I think archives shouldn't be measured by the number of visitors. But okay, thanks. Thank you. That was Marion Jacks. I, I agree. Um, as an institution, you want your your data, your your heritage objects, to be uh, used, be viewed by the by the public. The f first thing you think of is your own website, but as you start sharing data, it's all over the world. And uh, I think it helps getting your uh, objects into the world with your end users when aggregators and web portals use your data. It becomes less visible uh, in, in amount of uh, visitor numbers, but I, I think it really helps that the end purpose that your objects are being viewed and used by a lot more people. 
Uh, but I, th I really think that you, it's a very important point you touch upon, and there's still a lot of advocating we also have to do within our institution to actually uh, get people to understand this principle that we not necessarily want to have a, a number of visitors for our web portal, but that we want to increase the reach of our collection materials. So, yeah. Wonderful. Anybody else? Any ideas or questions? No? I think that's it then. Thank you very much. <laughs> much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. So our next um, presentation is online and it's going to be delivered remotely. So thank you ever so much. Um, it's Sebastian Mashdorovich, Masch and I'm sorry, I hope I've said that correctly. Um, he's going to be presenting on the collaborative pres preservation of cultural heritage, saving Ukrainian cultural heritage online. Hi, Wonderful. Sebastian, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Am I yeah. on? Wonderful. Yeah. OK, uh, should I start? Can, we, can you boost the audio a little bit for that? Is it possible? Hello, We're just going to try and lift the sound a little Hi. bit here. I'll just keep talking. Perfect. So no, that's perfect. Check. Thank you. Begin when okay, you're ready. Should I start? Then. Thank you. OK, we're ready with you when you are, Sebastian. Thank you. OK, great. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, very happy to be here. Um, sorry also um, if this is a bit last moment. Uh, you have been all very accommodating uh, in making it, uh, fitting it into my busy schedule. So let's dive right in. Uh, my name is Sebastian Mastorovich, and today I'm presenting on the um, grassroots initiative that I co-founded, which is called Saving Ukrainian Cultural Heritage Online, or SUCHO. And uh, just a bit about myself, um, I'm an IT consultant for digital humanities and I'm currently working in Vienna. Um, I'm one of three Sucho co-founders. Um, the other ones are Anna Kias from Tufts University and uh, Quinn Dombrowski from Stanford. Um, I'm also a PhD candidate in history at the European University Institute. And I studied history film and East European studies in London. So I'm especially happy to be in an event like that where, you know, audiovisual sources are also at the front. Um, if you want to find me on Twitter, you can do that on um, at, under the handle Story Tracer. Um, and the rest of my work you can see uh, at storytracer.org as well. So what is Sucho? Um, Sucho is a global grassroots initiative of more than 1,500 volunteers. Um, which generally speaking now um, supports the digital preservation of Ukrainian cultural heritage. Um, we started only with web archiving. This is how Sucho was created. So um, we have archived over 5,000 websites so far um, that contain the already digitized public collections of cultural institutions such as museums, uh, archives or um, other cultural places. Um, that amounts to over 50 terabyte of web archives that we have created. Um, and um, now that, uh, you know, we also uh, see the need for more digitization on the ground of materials that are not digitized yet, we have raised over 200,000 euros to buy digitization equipment for Ukrainian institutions. Um, we consist mo mostly of librarians, archivists, uh, humanities researchers, and uh, researchers and technologists, but it's really an open grassroots collective. So, you know, we have people from all walks of life in there. Um, if you want to find out about our work, you can visit our website, uh, sucho.org. Uh, you can also find us on Twitter. Um, um, under the handle Sucho Org. Um, and if you ha uh, would like to cooperate or volunteer, um, you can reach the three co-organizers, that's me, Anna and Quinn, at info at sucho.org. So what is this talk going to be about? Um, it will have two parts. Uh, the first part will be a bit longer, the second part a bit shorter. Um, and in the first part, I'm going to talk mainly about the direct Sucho missions. Um, the mission we have to help Ukrainian cultural institutions. Uh, I will talk about the various projects that we are doing, uh, the web archives I have already mentioned, uh, but also about the Sucho Gallery, um, the Sucho Meme Wall, 
uh, our wiki and the equipment fund. Um, and while I'm doing that, uh, I will also try to, um, you know, tell a bit the story of how we did manage to collaborate remotely with so many volunteers. Um, and then the second part will be on a more abstract level. Uh, I will try to reflect a bit on the lessons we could perhaps learn from Sucho. Um, number one that's been on my mind especially is um, how you can enable more of such remote grassroots collaboration. Which tools, uh, which techniques, uh, which approaches are needed to do that. Um, and then also which dangers exist for digital cultural heritage that might not so be at the front of everyone's mind. Um, and then in order to mitigate that, um, how could institutions collaborate better to protect digital cultural heritage? So, but I'll start with the web archives and um, the web archives, um, I would like to uh, point out uh, that idea started all on Twitter. So on uh, two days after the um, first day of the invasion, um, Anna, who had never met before, um, posted a tweet um, asking for a virtual data rescue session. Um, Anna is a musicologist and music librarian. Um, and so because there was a conference at the end of the week of uh, musicologists, uh, she tried to gather some people and discuss um, how they could um, help rescue uh, music collections from Ukrainian uh, cultural heritage institutions, digitized collections. Um, Anna has been involved with in data rescue efforts before. I had never heard of that, um, but I saw that tweet and I commented on it. And so because uh, in the weeks before I had been working uh, with a uh, web archiving suite, uh, open source tool suite that's called Web Recorder, I suggested that that might be uh, a tool to not only capture music collections, but um, cultural heritage uh, collections that are digitized in general. Um, I made that comment and, uh, you know, tried to go to sleep, but really couldn't uh, because it was kind of haunting my mind that maybe at the end of the week, there was nothing left to save. You know, maybe the server would be down or all of Ukraine would be occupied. So I started trying to, you know, look for Ukrainian digital collections and trying to web archive them with Web Recorder. Um, and then the next day, um, I asked um, the entire Twitter community of digital humanists and cultural heritage, heritage professionals that I was connected to, um, to submit links to a Google form of all the digital connections that we knew, uh, that they knew, so we could start you know, trying to download them. Um, and that got quite a bit of a response and people really submitted, started submitting thousands of links. And I mean, the growth in kind of reaction um, from, from the entire community was really exponential. So by day two, we already had 400 volunteers. Um, and by the end of a week, we were a thousand. Um, so it all escalated quite quickly, um, I would say. And to give you an idea of, of why and, uh, and that was necessary and um, uh, which websites we were trying to save, what we were focusing on, I would like to give you a personal example of a website that I uh, crawled, uh, which is the State Archives of Kharkiv. Um, which um, I picked from the list that people submitted um, and I tried to archive it with Web Recorder. What you see right there on the screen is the web archive. Um, I discovered that it had 100 gigabytes of data, um, files uh, documenting uh, criminal cases during the Stalinist time, literally court cases, um, of people being sent to the Gulag or being shot, uh, other files documenting the Holodomor. Um, and this is just a WordPress website with uploaded PDFs. But obviously, this is very extremely valuable uh, cultural heritage. Um, so on the morning of the 3rd of March, I finish, finished my crawl, uh, downloaded these 100 gigabytes, and then it was a kind of dramatic situation because by the end of the day at 5 p.m., the website was offline. And um, then we unfortunately got um, footage sent to us, which shows um, how the State Archive of Kharkiv was shelled 
And I've only learned this week, unfortunately, that actually one of their buildings is completely destroyed. Now, this website has come back online uh, just a few months ago, and that really gives me a lot of hope. Um, but for m several months, we just didn't know why it was offline, and we kept the copy um, just to safeguard it. Uh, unfortunately, that's not the case for all the websites. Um, what you see here is the website of the uh, Regional Library of, of Kherson, which I guess you all know um, has been occupied by Russian troops uh, um, for several months now. Um, and it, it contains equally important data, for example, catalogues from the library itself, um, you know, from 1874. Um, Unfortunately, this website is down and we don't quite know why, because if you this what you're looking at is the web archive. But if you uh, look at the original URL, you will see that it says account suspended. And as we progressed with doing our web archives, uh, we really discovered different risk scenarios. And so we, we are not quite sure why this account is suspended uh, from a web hoster. You know, the web hosting account has been suspended. It could be that occupy, occupation authorities shut it down, but it could also be that the person that was supposed to take care of payments for this web hosting account, the sys admin, let's say, um, isn't able to take care of it anymore for a number of variety of reasons. Um, they could be fighting at the front, they could be fleeing, or they could also be you know, um, much worse scenarios that I don't want to imagine. Um, but that gave us a, a kind of um, sense that it is not enough to, you know, try to archive things that have, for example, a Ukrainian domain name or things that we found out were hosted in uh, Germany, example, and other places abroad. Uh, we really needed to download as much as possible. We couldn't know beforehand which things could be at risk for which reasons. So I'd like to talk a bit about the tools that we've been using um, to, on one hand, uh, create these web archives, but then on the other hand, to collaborate as well as a grassroots initiative. Um, so our first um, stop has always been the Wayback Machine of the Internet Archive. Um, any um, website that uh, we discovered or that was sent to us by volunteers, um, we have submitted to the Wayback Machine of the Internet Archive. Um, but we quickly discovered, and this might be interesting uh, for a lot of you who work with um, audiovisual collections, that the Wayback Machine and the crawler that is behind it, which is called Heritrix, um, which many national libraries and big institutions use, um, sometimes has trouble with uh, the way websites are coded today and also um, the, the, the way they are structured. Um, so what I mean by that is that um, technically how the Heritrix crawler works is that it looks at the HTML code and looks for links, you know, pointing to different parts of the site. But today websites can be highly user interactive and also um, based on uh, loading things on demand. Um, so that the only thing that the Wayback Machine crawler sees when it opens a website is actually a script, which then waits for user interaction for more things to load. And that is the big difference that the tools of the web recorder suite can actually achieve. Um, um, the browser tricks crawler, which is the main component of the web recorder suite, what it does post to the Wayback Machine is that it actually opens a instance of Google Chrome. It spins up a browser and then opens the website like that and saves anything it sees. So if I could sum it up is that the Wayback Machine behaves more like a robot, but the browser tricks crawler actually emulates a human looking at the website. So what that means is that if you have um, heavily user interactive sites that, for example, um, depend um, on uh, modern UX techniques like infinite scrolling, you know, when you scroll through a website and it keeps loading more data or very important for videos, for example, that you, you know, need to click on a video to load it. And before that, it is invisible to a robot. Um, 
the browser trick scholar can achieve these things and um, by emulating human behavior, which oh, you can also customize, it then produces really high fidelity web archives um, that can capture a lot of the things that we care about, such as PDFs, uh, MP4s, video files, audio files, all the things that in a sit in emergency situation like this is really the things that we want to save. And another great thing that uh, about the web recorder suite is that it works with a new web archiving format, which is, um, let's say, a further development from the standardized web format that is broadly used now, which is WARC. So uh, what comes out of web recorder is a WAX file, web archive collection zipped. Um, and what's so special about that is that you know the, uh, the, the crawls that you make end up in a single file. Actually, you can have several calls all put together in a single file that you can download and that you can view with the viewer, which is called replay web page, even offline, or uh, you, know, you could put it on a USB drive and give it someone. So from our perspective, that is really important because it makes it easier to restitute, to potentially restitute web archives. Um, it's an extremely well-formed self-contained format and um, it loads when you put it on a server super efficiently so that uh, our biggest web archive, for example, our biggest WAX file is 1.4 terabytes big, uh, but we can load it with replay web page because it's such good software. Um, it only loads the home page, and as you click further through the web archive, it actually loads the rest of the data. So it keeps um, the, the traffic very low. Um, and these were the tools that we might primarily use for web archiving. And to co coordinate between each other, we really use the tools that many of us are familiar with uh, from our work life, uh, especially after the pandemic, remote work tools, namely Slack and Google Sheets. And um, what came out of that then, um, you can kind of see on this slide, which is a, a ginormous master spreadsheet, uh, which we call the, the giant spreadsheet. Um, where the main thing that people would do is um, they would claim a website. They would take personal responsibility for trying to crawl that website. And this spreadsheet has around 20 tabs and several thousand rows, but it worked surprisingly well. Um, and it also allowed us to really uh, have a super low threshold of people to collaborate. Every, almost everyone has a Google account. Everybody can instantly start working. Um, and on the right, you see some of the uh, extremely professional task forces then emerged from trying to solve some of the more complicated problems that actually emerge uh, when you try to do something like that. So now we have a lot of task forces that, for example, do scraping for repository uh, websites uh, like DSpace, for example, the situation monitoring team, there was a domain discovery team or a Wikidata team. But that worked really well because people were used to these tools. Um, and what emerged from that then is, as one of our volunteers uh, has called it quite aptly, um, a sort of digital Dunkirk. So uh, the crawling was actually done at the beginning on the volunteers' devices because it doesn't take much power to do web crawling. It just needs a lot of parallelization. A lot of people need to do it at the, uh, at the same time to try to win this race against time that we were, you know, uh, racing. Um, so we had people, for example, at MIT um, getting an army of Raspberry Pis at task, and people would um, install um, Docker for the first time, which is the software you need to run our scripts. Um, and then they would run out of disk space on their personal computers and start uninstalling games to make more space for web archives. That was quite amazing to see. Um, Later on, uh, we also got um, uh, some donated cloud server capacity, which allowed us to spin up the cloud instance of Browser Tricks. The developer of um, uh, Web Recorder, Ilya Kramer, is part of our team. And uh, he had just announced his plans for Browser Tricks Cloud, which runs on Kubernetes, but uh, it was in no shape or form ready. Um, but he just said, okay, let's do the alpha, alpha, alpha version. And what you see here is then that all it takes for a volunteer um, is to actually enter a URL and click start. And then you can actually see in the cloud version, the computer 
saving the website, seeing what the computer sees as it, webs uh, as it, as it tries to save the website. Um, and that really allowed us to scale up and involve people that are also not necessarily hyper-technical. So for example, my um, co-founder Quinn then uh, recruited her son to do a lot of web archiving, her eight-year-old son, Sam. Um, and then together with Sam, they trained his school class, uh, the Malcolm X uh, Elementary School in California. Um, so we really able through this uh, deployment of a self-hosted software as a service uh, to give a lot of people a leg up uh, where you know coding or using the command line might have been um, an, a barrier. But that has been phase one of web archiving and uh, we have extended into doing more things. So now uh, for phase two, we have the slogan uh, curate, donate, educate, because as we were receiving feedback from Ukraine, um, it was clear that web archiving is not enough to help in this emergency situation. So the feedback that we got from a meeting with 300 cultural professionals was that, first of all, it was really important them to raise awareness for cultural heritage by exhibiting online. Very important as well to get equipment uh, for digitization hardware for materials that are not digitized yet and support train and training and digitization, metadata and curation methods um, which a lot of people need that are eager to digitize to protect their collections, but they might not have the, the training um, as in other institutions. Um, also digital preservation platforms. So where do you upload something once it has been digitized is a really great need. So um, as a response to this, we created the Suture Equipment Fund um, to buy equipment, digitization equipment for Ukrainian institutions. And um, it's a separate transparent budget from our operational budget where we pay our server costs from. Um, and we try to um, buy equipment as much as possible from the Ukrainian market. It's a very complicated thing because we are all librarians, archivists, historians. We have very little experience with that, but we have plans how we hope to uh, make this possible in a, in a, on a bigger scale. Um, if that's something you'd like to, to contribute to, um, you can find the donation button on our website. And we can also now um, enable tax deductible donations for institutions that might have that requirement that uh, pay, uh, donations might be need to be tax deductible. Um, this was our first delivery to the Vernatsky National Library. Um, Amazon Web Services and Amazon were very generous and um, uh, donated very several hundred devices because they really needed everything. Um, but we would like to reach a lot more smaller institutions. Um, so one of the places that we are trying to cooperate with now, and this might be very interesting for you as well, as um, you know, people who work with audiovisual stuff, is the Center for Urban History in Vif. Uh, we want to explore whether they can help us distribute equipment and give advice to a smaller institutions um, across Ukraine, especially in the east of Ukraine, how they can digitize. And they themselves also need equipment. Uh, they are actually, uh, they have created the Urban Media Archive, which is the leading audiovisual collection in Ukraine. And they have received materials uh, from Mariupol, which has been completely destroyed. And they now really need a professional film scanner um, to, to scan those uh, audiovisual materials. Um, they also need further support with software, training, and also proposal writing, because it's a very stressful thing to do in a war situation. There might be funds out there, but you know, the experts in proposal writing, it would be great if people from the audiovisual space um, could, could offer their help uh, for the urban media archive. Uh, maybe there is a film scanner, um, a used one that uh, someone could provide or could be bought cheaply using Sucho funds. I just want to put it out there because I think this is a fitting um, venue to, to mention this. So what we have created um, um, as a response to the uh, feedback from Ukraine is also the Sucho Gallery. Um, which acts as a first upload platform. Right now, we are only curating it with items from the web archives, um, but it's supposed to be an um, exhibition space. It's based on Omica, uh, where people, where uh, institutions 
their collection upload directly. And if they have no prior metadata experience, enter basic metadata um, that already uh, describes the items well. Um, there's also the Sucho meme wall, which is getting quite a, a lot of traction now, which is a completely separate team of people collecting Ukrainian war memes. Um, and this is already used in a class at Taras Shevchenko University in Kyiv. Um, and it's really a really impressive thing that I hadn't in no way or shape or form thought of as cultural heritage before. But of course, it's the most immediate, immediate form of dealing with the war. So it de definitely deserves archiving as well. And the plan is that, you know, some of the methods that we have used, but also the methods uh, of digitization that Ukrainians will uh, compile can be gathered in the Sucho wiki so that a lot of people can work on writing tutorials and doing um, video courses and so on. We want to gather this self-learning resources there. So um, just a tiny bit about what uh, I think could be learned from the experience of Sucho. Don't want to take too long and also leave some space for questions, so I'll hurry up. Um, but I really think that um, we have some valuable insights now about how you can facilitate more grassroots collaboration online. Because grassroots collaboration can take many shapes uh, and is also needed in a lot of different areas. You need it in volunteer initiative like ours, uh, but there also needs to be a way for activists to organize online. Um, but it doesn't have to be political as well. If you think about research across institutions, um, they, they have an equal problem of, you know, trying to uh, organize and do things digitally um, uh, if they don't have the tools uh, available by the institutions. And the stumbling blocks to really doing grassroots collaboration online that I have identified is on one hand that the commercial tools, the remote collaboration tools such as Slack, uh, Airtable or Notion um, have very high prices if you want to use the features that are really useful. So, you know, it ranges around 10 euros, $10 a user usually. And that is in no shape or form possible for just a bunch of people who want to do things together. On the other hand, if you are at a research institution and you might have some collaboration tools, these are not usually accessible to outside external collaborators. You know, you are locked in into very cool tools, but they can only be used by members of certain institutions or consortia. Um, and then there's a lesson as well about digital community empowerment. It was really important to us, you know, to, uh, to learn that you need to meet people where they are. Um, and to be aware of people's digital literacy. And in response to that, make really good self-learning resources. So uh, making good tutorials, online workshops. Anna at the beginning did, as far as I remember, three live Zoom workshops a day to get people rolling. Um, and this effort, this grit, this investment in volunteers is really needed if you want them um, to, to contribute to, to such a complicated task. Uh, then what we found out as well is really important to have familiar tools or user experiences. So even if it's not Slack or Google Sheets, the things, the tools that you're supposed to, that, that, that really uh, give, a, give, a, give a benefit are the tools that are as easy to use as Google Sheets or Slack. And we also, I also think it would be uh, foolish to outright reject proprietary tools at the beginning of remote collaboration. Rather, I would say start with proprietary tools, get going, and transition to open source tools when the right time is right. Um, you know, but it's really at the beginning, you cannot have the ideal solution it was a really valuable lesson for us. <clears throat> then I think there's great potential in actually self-hosting some of the open source tools that are out there. Um, I only want to, I don't want to read them out, but here's a list of extremely useful self-hostable open source tools that are basically clones of commercial tools that are out there. But the catch is that in order for people to use some of these open source tools, someone needs to set them up, maintain them, host them, and give them to strangers for free. It's really hard to start because people cannot host their own service. So I think there's really a need for institutions or nonprofit foundations 
um, to integrate some of these tools and provide them for people who want to do good civil society work. Um, and uh, there is a huge potential for a lot of <clears throat> good work that needs to be done remotely. Um, and very, very quickly, uh, there are also some ideas about digital cultural heritage protection. Um, really, the lesson is that it doesn't take a wall. Uh, digital infrastructure is critical, and uh, there's a multitude of ways uh, cultural heritage data can disappear. Um, it can be man-made disasters, it can be natural disasters, but it can also be ransomware attacks, uh, link in software rot, or just the end of funding. Um, and I, we think that one of the solutions to that might be really informal solutions um, of institutions across the world collaborating, for example, akin to the model of twin cities. I take care of your data, and you take care of my data. Uh, in a very informal, simple way, this is how a library at one of the end of the world could help a library at the other end of the world um, back it up. There are also more sophisticated solutions like backup buttons for aggregators who right now are only aggregating but not saving, um, and also preemptive web archiving, since we have seen that web archiving is a really powerful tool. Um, but I would like to stop there um, and really thank you for your attention and just reiterate once again that, you know, please help Ukraine in every shape, form, uh, way that's possible because uh, they really need all our, all our help at the moment. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was an excellent presentation. And every question I thought, how have you answered within it? It was brilliant. Um, that said, I wonder if there are any questions in the room today? We have a few hands up. Um, I will how I'll ask you if you can hear it when we uh, when we do the present when we ask the question, but it may be that I have to run back onto stage. Okay. No problem. Oh, okay, thank you. No, it's all right, I have a helper. Thank you. Uh, Steve on as well. Hi, uh, thanks so much for your presentation and for your efforts. Um, I wondered uh, how you cooperate with, and if you cooperate or are supported by Europeana in your efforts? Did you hear? Yes, I, I think I did hear that. So to, to give you dirty secrets, most of these uh, slides are for my talk at Europeana a few uh, weeks ago. So yes, uh, Europeana was one of the first institutions that donated to pay our server costs. And um, I've, I've issued a call at Europeana 22 to really um, for the network to become active now, because what I, what I haven't included in these slides is that we've also been asked to advise for the creation of a digital national library of Ukraine. The Ukrainian Library Association is planning that together with UNESCO and IFLA. And that's something we say really is beyond the scope of Sutro. This is something volunteers cannot do. So, you know, through the Europeana network, I hope that some people can emerge that can take over that task. You know, there is a place for institutions. Um, and But yeah, Europeana, uh, the entire Europeana team and network have become really good friends already. Hello, uh, Steve. Um, in the presentation, you mentioned that uh, people were volunteering to say, hey, I'm going to scroll that website. Is, uh, for each website, is it only one person or you have multiple person? And if you have multi multiple, do you, um, how do you decide which copy is more correct than the other? They might differ. And also because it's so war, you might have actually uh, uh, bad people trying to insert bad data and claim, oh, look, they had this on that website or things like that. How do you uh, deal with that? Okay, uh, I think uh, what I heard is about, you know, what do you do if some, several people claim the website and how do you reconciliate that uh, after the fact? Well, that's a very good question because um, actually the collaboration worked very smooth and very easily. So, for example, it could be that people that can only use browser tricks claim the website, but then ran into some problems. Browser tricks is also not magic, right? In some places it failed miserably, like I said, uh, there is, for example, DSpace or rep repository websites, which have a weird link structure where it just goes around in loops. Um, or uh, what we found with historical collections is that, for example, you sometimes have a calendar 
that goes endless into the future or way back into the past. So there's just always the next link. So when a problem like that emerged, someone, they might have asked for help and someone else took over. But generally speaking, if we got a good version, because, because we had a quality control team of Ukrainian speakers who checked, did the essential things get saved? Um, we, we have one or two versions, let's say. Now, what's really hard is to even index them and, and make them available with some metadata. And this is what we're doing right now. So we're taking this huge haystack and putting it, uh, we were trying to form a data model uh, to, uh, to, to say, okay, what belongs to which institutions and what does it contain and so on. This is where we are at right now. Um, uh, and there's a smaller group of people working on that. Uh, but the collaboration at the time worked surprisingly smooth. There was not so many clashes, rather people giving each other a hand with different skills. Thank you. Any more questions? Yeah, we have two, two more questions, maybe more. Hi, uh, Lucy from the BFI. Um, one is more a comment and then a question. Um, so just about your film scanning, just you've probably already done this, but whether you've reached out to like FIAF or EMEA, who may have um, organizations who could give a film scanner maybe. And then the question is, um, in terms of the websites, like do you go back to some of the websites to see how they've changed over the months and if they've changed do you then kind of recrawl those websites and um just that kind of idea do you do you do that at all like how often do you kind of recrawl the websites if you do um and are you seeing any changes especially if it's in um now unauthorized russian occupied ukraine Thank you. Uh, for the first question, um, no, uh, we haven't reached out to these places yet because the, the conversation with the Center for Urban History only started last week. Um, we have known about them a lot. So I would ask you, I didn't get the acronyms either, um, please to send us an email. Uh, I, will, I will remember your question. Could you please tell us these potential partners? That would be great. FIAF um, and AMIA, I believe. So that's A-M-I-A, AMIA. Okay, yeah, uh, yeah, if yeah. someone could send well, we me will send them to you, yes, absolutely. <laughs> that absolutely. would be great because uh, I'm new to this world. So like I'm interested, but I'm new. Um, and then the second one, yeah, this is exactly what we need at the moment. So basically we also just need a, a well-formed index before we can try to uh, ascertain the status of the different websites. Uh, one of our volunteers, a real wizard, uh, Benjamin Schmidt, who is a digital humanities professor from, from New York, in the sometime in between made a script that actually tracks all the domains that we do and tracks the status whether we they were offline or online and we think that around it fluctuated uh, between like five or ten percent that uh, websites were going offline or online but we haven't connected that with our web archives yet and we can't uh, regularly uh, crawl them yet until we have basically made an authoritative list that is connected to the versions that we already have. So a lot of sorting and cleaning up to do. And we're trying to finance uh, contracts at different institutions like the Bavarian State Library to Uc for Ukrainians to do this work as well. So it's not just us working on that data. But first we need a list and uh, uh, an, av uh, an ability to view what we already have. And then we can try to track this metadata, which is really important, obviously. Wonderful, thank you. We have a question online, I think. No, that's actually from me. Hi, Sebastian. Oh, it's Rasa here from Sound and Vision. Thanks so much for, for being here with us. I would love to learn a bit more about how you collaborate and involve organizations and, and citizens on the ground in Ukraine, uh, mm -hmm. especially in curation efforts, kind of helping to identify the, the really high at risk assets uh, or really kind of important assets that may not be so visible, let's say, for other volunteers? That's a really good question. And that's one of the toughest tasks, I have to admit. Um, many of us had never worked with Ukraine before. I don't speak Ukrainian. My co-founders don't speak Ukrainian. We all have a bit of an exposure to, uh, to Eastern Europe, like I speak about our co-founders. 
um, but but uh, we we are really outside of our compass and we don't have pre-existing connections. So this is what we have trying to do over the last few months. And it's a slow process. Um, we have some examples now, like the National Library, and something that we are more focused on, which is smaller institutions that don't get so much publicity. And there we have the Cherkasi Regional Library. We are trying to buy a professional book scanner for now. And they had, out of their own initiative, already fundraised for a smaller scanner and um, and uh, explain to us the things that they want to digitize, which is really enlightening because you don't think about this. So they have made a competition uh, for children's drawings of displaced internal refugee children who process their, 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 their traumatic war experiences um, through, uh, through drawings. And that's the first thing they want to digitize. Uh, then they have 1,400 rare books as well, but they are friends with the Ethnological Museum next door, so they would also like to use the book scanner to scan tactiles, textiles, which is possible. But this is a very slow process, and we realize that it's also too slow when we do it from outside of Ukraine. So this is why we would like to see if a place like the Center for Urban History, which knows a lot of the smaller places and has tried to get them to digitize before the war, can do that and we can give them the funds to then fulfill the needs of the different smaller institutions because uh, it's a really an expert task and we are all do volunteers doing it on the, on, the, on the side. So we think, you know, if we can give a Ukrainian institution like this the resources, I think it would be more efficient. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I think we're out of time, unfortunately. We're three minutes over. But thank you ever so much and if we could have a quick round of applause again for you again. Many, many thanks for coming today. We really appreciate it. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Um, okay, so it's lunchtime. I'm just going to leave you there for a minute, Sebastian. Sorry. <laughs> um, you'll be rejoining again at 2 p.m. today uh, when your chair will be Yvonne Ng um, from Witness. Um, I've been asked to say we're not eating lunch in the room right adjacent to us because there's another event on in there. But if you could make your way to the reception, that's where the No Time to Wait lunches will be. And also any unanswered questions online today, I'm sorry we didn't get around to you, but they are being added to the collaborative notes and we're hopeful that presenters will answer your questions there. So thank you very much. Thank you.
schedule change. Um, Alexand uh, Alexandru Stan very graciously um, uh, moved his time slot till 4.50 at this afternoon to give the IETF seller working group a bit more time for their session. So that will we'll have this for the next 45 minutes. And it will be a working group meeting. We'll have people joining remotely. Um, Michael Richardson will be uh, moderating. But if people in the room want to ask questions or participate, um, we just put up your hand and we'll pass the bike around, you know, throughout the whole the whole session. So there won't be a Q&A at the end. Um, so I'll hand it off to you, Michael. Have to turn it on, then it works. Good. Um, but if I turn it on and off, did that set it? Um, IT crowd fans, please raise your hand. Um, <laughs> also, we brought the internet today. Um, but anyway, okay, so hi, my name's Michael Richardson. Um, and uh, uh, well, I'll t tell you what, just just tell me your name as we go by. Hi, I'm Moisai. Yes, to you. Jérôme Martinez. Dave Rice. And we have a, a few other people that regularly join us, which I don't see online or uh, here. Um, so um, I'm what we what, what you've joined us is now is our monthly meeting, which normally would be Tuesday at 9 p.m. Um, uh, at the last Tuesday of the month, and we've moved it from Tuesday of this week to Friday at this time. Um, so this is in some way a bit of a performance theater, if you like. Uh, uh, for what we're going to do. Um, and so to, IETF sessions are generally quite uh, interactive. Um, so, you know, please interrupt. And um, this is a, a, a working group session in that sense. So you, uh, what we're going to do, so uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the IETF and what the work itself. Um, and I said normally it would be longer because we thought we had a half an hour, but no, we don't more time than that. Um, most of the work in the IETF happens by email. Um, it, the IETF itself started around 1987. I'll come back to that. Um, and we have, we now have this sophisticated tool called Meet Echo, um, which you are seeing now, which is used by five or six other conferences. And it's a, uh, it's not Zoom, as I can tell you. It, it's, it's very heavily Heavily, heavily customized for our hybrid and fully online meetings, um, and uh, uh, you can you can use it too. You could have used it for this. Um, uh, but it is it is is actually extremely high, uh, designed for having rooms full of people and then some people remote. Uh, our goal is to get you involved. So who is the IETF? So I put a kind of a couple of of things. This is what my mother thinks I do, right? Which is run around and do weird, you know, stuff in a mask or some security stuff. Uh, my friends think it involves a lot of cables and stuff like this. And um, they're partly right, but mostly wrong. Um, what I think it is, is that we're designing some new beautiful architecture for the future involving, you know, something there. Um, in, in, in practice, uh, my experience is it's, it's mostly arguments. Um, and when they go badly, they, they work out like on Friends where no one quite listened to each other. And we were on a break and we should have split up or something like that. So the ITF is the Internet Engineering Task Force. And, um, oh yeah, one more slide here. What I tell my dentist, right? Um, so um, you know that thing in your browser that says HTTP? Yeah, that's our protocol. We designed that in the 1990s. And it wasn't our first protocol, and there's a whole bunch of other other layers there. Um, and uh, um, the layer is everything below that point um, down to the just above the physical layer. So we don't design connectors, and we don't design electrical systems. Um, but from that layer all the way up and above us, HTML, the, the thing we heard this morning about the problems with the, the uh, browser, uh, what was it called? The... 
the Ukraine thing where the browser and the infinite scroll and if you have a robot it can't go by well that's not our problem that's an HTML JavaScript problem there's another organ standards organization above us that deals with that and I don't do that um, so well I don't personally do any of that stuff I'm involved mostly in in network security stuff and I was actually brought into co-chair this working group with these fine gentlemen because apparently I know something about how to get the document through the process and um, that's a little bit of a arcane knowledge and anyone who works in a government department understands that you know getting your document or your policy up through the right approvals is you know a job in itself um, but I have met all those people that have done those things and uh, we're a relatively small very open community and the if you have some interest in somehow getting involved in HTTP or quick or DNS or anything like this you can do it for essentially no cost uh, we don't have a membership we're a meritocracy um, we don't often know who's enfranchised and we have a complicated process as a result so we don't have votes because we don't have everyone in the whole planet's enfranchised and we don't know who would count um, so as I said we also do all these other things um, which you've probably heard of um, and um, IPsec is the for instance the thing that I have worked on for 25 years has nothing to do with with this uh, effort here um, so we did this codec called Opus in the early 2010s um, and we did it because all the other codecs the voice codecs had terrible IPR issues and the people that were building um, SIP and WebRTC based systems wanted a code uh, something that would be decent and wouldn't be plagued with IPR claims left right and center and for the as a result of that good work um, as I understand it um, the AV community came to the ITF and said we'd really like to standardize what is essentially Matroska and it was formed in 2015 and when did I join? 2018? Yeah, it's Terry. So basically there was a fellow from Mozilla who was overworked and they needed some help. So this working group, we published RFC 7894, which is EBML, Extended Binary Markup Language. Um, it's a little bit like an XML without all the insanity. Um, and we published that in 2020. Um, and we published FFV1. Uh, for version 0, 1, and 3, if I got that right, um, in August of 2021. Um, and the Matroska document, which is, of course, an instance of EBML. Um, well, I think we're pretty close, right, guys? So, um, there. Um, almost all of our meetings, so while the IETF meets three times a year, even in pandemic, we still had three one-week online plenary sessions, even though it would have made more sense to have it differently. Um, and so we have a meeting in a week and a half in, in London. Um, and uh, that'll be our third meeting back from uh, pandemic. Um, but this group meets only as what we call virtual interims. So that means they're completely online. We use this tool that you're seeing now. Um, and uh, they're mostly working group sessions. We try to avoid slideware, as you're seeing now. Um, anyone can join. There are no fees. There's no membership. Um, and it really is a meritocracy. Say smart things and we'll listen to you. Um, if you're rude or violate our code and conduct, there may be sanctions. And we have a 500 email long debate going on right now about one historic core contributor who has been an asshole. And, uh, we're basically kicking him out and people are arguing over whether that's a good thing or not. Um, so. We, we, we finally tra started to take our code of conduct seriously. And that's probably a good thing. Um, so working group itself, that may be a little bit small to see, maybe even on the big board. Um, so this is our, our data tracker. Um, this is also a bespoke application, open source. You could implement it yourself for your own group if you like, but again, it does what we need. Um, and this is a view of the documents that are in our working group. Um, so you can go to datatracker.ietf.org um, for IPR reasons. Um, you often need a, to log in, and that's not because we're afraid of our intellectual property being stolen, but because if you contribute something and it turns out that what you contributed, you had intellectual property right, claims on, then that gets us in trouble. In other words, 
you wind up being in a position to sue the other people. And so we want to be sure that if you contributed something that we know who contributed it. That's the only reason we have a login. And they're available for anyone. Okay. Um, we do a lot of our work on GitHub. So um, these guys have whatever, 400 some open issues at times. And uh, we try to work through them, figure out which ones are important and close the ones that uh, with pull requests that matter. Um, and finally, uh, there's a mailing list and that's an image of the archive of it. So without logging in or doing anything else, you could follow the mailing list. You can follow the meetings on YouTube, um, if you want to. Um, but if you want to contribute again, we sort of just need to know who you are or our lawyers need to know. Um, and yeah, so I mentioned about the lawyers. So one of the things is, is by participating in the IETF, you agree to the IETF processes and policies. And if you have something to contribute and you do contribute it, and you say something then, and it turns out that you have a patent on it, then we just want you to tell us. That's all we want to know is maybe we'll avoid your technology. That was it. So the obligatory has to put this up. Um, some URLs. Um, and I mentioned them all. And I said, if you like, you could go visit them on your laptop or this kind of stuff. And I'm going to end this part of the presentation here. Right, and my co-chair did not show up, which is interesting. It's in Texas somewhere. Yeah, well, I don't know what happened. Um, almost that stop slide. Oh, oh, I know. Yeah, so we have to go over there and do we? Yeah, we just stop the video from there. Can you just click on the thing that the upper left that says the has the video the camera icon? It's okay, I'll do it. I know. I I stop. I it's my fault. It's not. So uh, we're gonna go into. Uh, what we hope is our working group session and um, over here note-taking tool Open it. so you may have seen etherpad and then it got renamed and then it got renamed now it's called Hedge Doc. Okay. So this is what we do. We wind up sharing a common uh, thing. Uh, we and everyone else, all of NTTW, I guess, right? So uh, among the group up here, did you read the minutes from last time? I guess not, since I apparently didn't post them no, until didn't. 10 minutes ago. So I thought they were automatically posted when I posted them to the system. So I guess we won't do this part here, you know. Uh, no. Uh, we'll do, have to do that next time. No. Okay. Um, overall status. Matroska was updated. I think was, we're past 11, I thought, aren't we? Steve? Yes, I use since... Oh, okay, cool. You get local control over what you get to see. Go to... Okay. 
Told you this was performance theater. Someone's going to have to push the down button to, you know, as we go that, go through that point. Um, anyone else used HedgeDoc or Etherpad to have a meetings online, collaboratively create things? Yeah, so it's basically just a big editor and you can fight over who gets to type what. Okay, and the other cool thing is that someone's taking notes and writing along and spells something wrong and someone else corrects you and fixes your fixes the uh, name of the of the uh, person whose name you got wrong. So what was it we posted? So the, yeah, I posted version 14. 14. On the first of October. Right. Okay. It says submitted to ISG for publication. Right. So when we thought we had less time, I was going to more time. I was going to do a diagram um, of what this means. So um, submitted to IESG for publication. So the way that the IETF is architected is that so we have all of us who are working and contributing. Uh, me, who's the co-chair of the working group, and then I report to an area director who is in charge of the whole area, and there are 13 or 14 of them, and they are supposed to be the managers of the organization. None of us get paid uh, by the ITF. We're all, all of our employers have volunteered our time, and my manager, the AD, the joke was it's a 50% commitment of his time, but it's a 50% of an 80-hour work week. So it's a bit of a joke, but it's become a full-time job, unfortunately. So now we've asked him, he says, we're ready, our document is ready. Would you please review it? And if it's okay, then you'll advance it to the next thing, next level. And then what will happen is that those other 14 people will review it. And then we'll get a series of comments and discusses. And it works by rough consensus, which is not the same as the Quaker system of consensus, but um, is similar. So... Um, you can have objections, but you can't have too many. Um, that's what the point is. Um, so we're going to do that next, um, and that will be the next step for that thing. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, it's on the status page, it's, it's, it says AD evaluation so 22 days. It says it's supposed to be under 14 days. Yeah. And then action holder, so Murray, 21 days, it's supposed to be. Yeah, so we're not making our service level agreements, are we? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna apologize for Murray. That's it's a two hundred page document. It's a two hundred page document, but um, and also his his uh, co AD has just returned from maternity leave a week ago, so he's been holding the fort down for two people for about four months. So I imagine he will catch up in the next couple of weeks, and I hope that we will be in. Uh, at the IESGQ by Christmas, perhaps earlier. Depends on how many comments he has. So it's a 200-page document, right? Um, which you can review. 150 pages of it are what element descriptions, right? Uh, so, yes, and a lot of it is also in the EBML RFC, which is 50 pages. So they have to know that before they start doing the transcript. That's true, but he's already reviewed that one, so he should be okay with that. We published the data. Okay, so um, milestone review. Okay, so one of our other documents is this FLAC system, and Jerome was talking this morning about, uh, well, I noticed that, yeah, EVML, FLAC, and, you know, as Matroska is your container, your single file container for uh, the, what was it called? Ra, ra, raw, raw cooked. Yeah, there you go, raw cooked. So that's an implementation of our spec, essentially, exactly. right? And so that's really cool to we, hear about. We have Matroska for the container part, uh, FMG1 for video part, and FLAC for the audio part, and everything inside that is for lossless content. So the first two are RFCs already, which I mentioned earlier, and then FLAC is work in progress, and so we did not make our July 2022 milestone. Um, and what do you think? Well, we uh, had a working group last call. Yeah. Uh, it's almost ended. Yeah. Uh, we've had a lot of comments. And they've all been processed. 
So I guess the next step is to uh, wait for writer. So 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 um, they've been processed, but you haven't posted the revision. The revision, you did repost it. Okay, so that's cool. So that's um, that's what's just updating. So revised document. So but I didn't. Uh, I don't remember seeing the revised document. But maybe I missed it. Posted. Okay, so uh, ready for Shepherd write up. Review. That's type. So that's good. So we didn't make it by July, but we made it by October. So that's a little happy for that. Um. Do you want to summarize any any major changes that you want to talk about? Well, Black at some point uh, was developed in 2001, and the original author wrote a nice document about how Flux is supposed to work, uh, or how Flux is structured, uh, but a lot of details were missing. So currently we have a document where all the details uh, should be it should by now be a document where you don't have to look at the source code and reflect your implementation to with your own. Uh, the document became, I think, four times as large as it was in the first place. Uh, so it's come a long way. A lot of people have, uh, have been involved in uh, reading it and finding things they would like to have uh, explains better. I'll just mention Martin. I said your name wrong again. Mark, Mark Tin. Mark, Mark Tyne. Yeah, Mark Tyne um, has basically jumped into this in what? Spring of this year? Yeah, so basically jumped in pretty late and took over this and we're extremely help pleased about this. And I don't think you've been involved in the ITF at all ever before. Right? So, um, Really cool, and you know, you can use the next one. Um, it's a small working group. Some working groups have 300 members and uh, process 10 documents at the same time, but ours is not simple. Uh, and we need people to read the documents, right? And, and particularly, if you read the document and you say, I don't understand something that is so useful, that's terribly useful, or this sentence is nonsense. I even say uh, that that's really really useful to us to know. Okay, so moving on, uh, we're going to move on to Matroska. So we just learned that it's submitted to the ISG for publication. Um, were there any other things that we needed to talk about that might still be open? I hope you to. No. Okay. We just merged the. A request to add a track one codec, codec to the codec specification, but for now we're not working with that one. Right, so like really on topic for this conference because they try to get a track one uh, from what so this right, right, Sony discs, yeah, yeah, right, to actually be able to read the content. Uh, with a FMPEG and have a way, a sustainable way to keep the files for the day with the, old, with the original codec. So we have a separate document. Um, you could implement Matroska without any codecs, which would be bizarre, but it might be interesting if all you cared about was, say, showing what the, the uh, you had a player that simply wanted to show you what the chapters of the movie were. Right, that would be a possibility. You would never need to decode the codex because you're never playing the content, but you could tell people, you know, this is the parts of the movie or the other thing. Go ahead. You're gonna yeah, it. I wanted to say, uh, with this example, it is a big example about how to participate to Matroska. Uh, the people behind the ATRAC uh, codec uh, wanted to have uh, mat uh, support in Matroska, and uh, they are not part of the working group. 
but they come and they say, okay, I need to to, to have a support for uh, my codec. Um, it, it, it can be bizarre. We don't care actually. We, we accept any codec from anyone and we reserve uh, a specific codec ID for this specific codec. So the barrier is not big. You just have to write to, to the Matroska mailing list saying, oh, I need something. What can we do? Uh, and right. can I reserve uh, something for me? For me? So, so the list of codecs, though, what I was trying to get at, to, to, I was trying to, trying to, to come to step slightly back. So the list of codecs is in a separate document. And in that document, we have a list of codecs. And I think we got like 50 of them or around that number. Yeah in that list and one of the things in that document is it says that if you have a new codec you want to uh, have an identity for it then there's a process by which we ask you to go through and you say basically just email a, a thing and it'll go into a table and we have a there's a, a, a eight people in california who keep track of this table it's just an xml table and there's a if 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 the person who asks follows the right instructions, which in some cases just means, you know, I, my name is Bob, my Kodak is called ATDRAC1, and, you know, the definition of my format is, a, is in this website here, then you would get an identity would be added for you, and this is what happened for these, these guys who were doing the Sony uh, uh, disc man, disc man, mini disc, yeah. Disc. Only person I ever saw have one was my brother, and he only had the only he, all of his mini discs were were labeled "Walking to School Music," and then a date, and I don't know what I never quite knew it was on something cool, um, and then his mini disc player you know died. And I wonder if we'll cover all this stuff now. So, we just still need the hardware. Yeah. It's still, all right, so uh, so that happened, um, and we our next step I think is going to be working on the Matroska codec. We need to write the IANA considerations um, for this, which is means we have a whole bunch of different things. I was going to put up a slide, but I thought we would run out of time. Um, there's a whole bunch of of different possibilities. From you have to have an IETF consensus document that's been extensively reviewed in an RFC published, like that's like the highest level, uh, to uh, any document in a stable place will be fine, to, um, you know, uh, I wrote this document at this other standards organization and they did something would be fine, down to this is my name and address and, and you can contact me here, and then, you know, there's a whole range of different things and you have to decide what is. It's probably going to be more towards the the lower end of things, you know, uh, for that, if someone comes along and proves they're not a, 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 a spam bot, that, you know, we'll give them a number. Just have to write that down in the document and see how it works. Uh, we said there's no flack issues left. That's that was from last time. Uh, and then I guess uh, one of the last things, because I think we have about five minutes left here, Actually, you want to talk about EBML? Oh yeah. Okay. So let's go to a other business. I'll just close this other this other note. I was going to say about we have a new version of FFV one that we are, I guess, say planning. We we plan yeah. to be stalled for a month, but we and, plan to do it. And so one of the questions is essentially is, you know, there are some bits and pieces that V three doesn't do, and we have a V four conceived, but we don't yet have a, I would say, a, a, a big enough reason to, to step forward. And so you might have some ideas of things you want in a video codec that you could help share with us would be great. Even if you don't know how to implement the requirements are as good as implementation. Okay, so you go ahead. What, what do you want to talk about? Yeah, uh, you remember for BML, we had some changes. People discover bugs in the specifications, and also we found some issues as well. So there's like uh, eight uh, errata to add to the document, and uh, we postponed it until Matroska was ready in case we need big changes in the document. 
And now that my trust case in the pipe, we can actually go back to EBML, send the errator, and actually find a way to do it. So I will probably do it this weekend. So that's cool. So the RFC, there's a site called the RFC, rfceditor.org, which is the authoritative site for all of the RFCs, all nine and a half thousand of them. And on that website, uh, so the RFCs are immutable, which is often very frustrating to people when they find spelling mistakes. Um, we don't reissue them ever. Um, so uh, what we will do is two things, is either you can post an errata, which is what Steve is going to do, and there's actually a way, if it's done in XML, that we can show you the RFC plus the errata, and we'll say to you, but this is not normative because we can't be sure, you know. Um, and then what will happen is we'll respin and we'll produce a new RFC with a new number with the errata included. Uh, but we probably won't do that for maybe at least a year uh, just because it would take us that long to get there anyway after our other time. So, yeah. And, uh, yeah, if you find a rata or things that could be written better, then you can also do that. You can also submit things through the GitHub, which is also very useful, but understand the GitHub is totally not normative at this point. Anything else from you guys? Uh, yeah, it's something not exactly related to that, but the whole Matroska specific specification is based on one big XML file that is generating actually the specifications for all the elements in Matroska and that code is also used in uh, MKV2 Nix and also in my tools MK validator and uh, Kclean and I regenerated all the code uh, recently since now everything is stable and uh, so basically the code matches exactly the spec from now so what you're telling is we have spec driven code yes that's kind of useful since there's uh, quite a number of elements and i already did the work to do the same for uh, fmpeg the tmuxer i think okay uh, it was not much but I need to update the code and one of the question was if the xml should be integrated XM, uh, the F, uh, F and the FMP code, or if it should be outside. That's up for discussion, but basically we can do the FMP code as well based on the spec. Yeah. Um, it raises an interesting question of the XML code that I'm not going to bring it up too, uh, too pedantically uh, weird. Um, <clears throat> uh, but uh, thank you for telling us that. So that's good. So anything else from the, the room? Any questions? Oh, your question? Uh, yeah, hi, I'm Kate Murray from the Library of Congress. And this is a, a bit of a super dirty question, but did the proposed media type for Matroska change recently? So was it something else? And now it's going to be video slash Matroska or audio slash Matroska? In previous I, versions, there used to be an unofficial because it wasn't registered. So I think it was video slash x dash Matroska. It still exists, but now that, because uh, according to the ITF rules, that kind of uh, name is deprecated. Okay. So we made a new one, saying also that the uh, the old one exists, so people know that they may have to support us. But the official one is video slash Matroska. Thanks. Yeah. And and actually, it's it's a bit of a pain in the ass because what we would really like is all of the um, encoders, writers, to start using the new one immediately. But of course, that would be stupid because the players don't don't know about it. So what we actually need is all of the players to start supporting both as there, and then some few years in the future, we need all the encoders to start using ideally the official one. But that's like kind of a pedantic silly thing um so the reality is that both will be out in the field forever you know in, in when people dig up your archive of video content in 4500 year 4500 they'll probably still say video slash x matroska and that's okay i'm here um Markov, uh, same ttc 
20 and 31 fs i would like to ask you uh, do you feel a need uh, for uh, uh, extending future proof the essence type in mkv because my personal opinion is right now maybe it's a limited uh, number of a limited type of essence do you understand the question no, but I think the question is, do we want to submit it to SNPTA? No, no, no. Uh, this is the second question, right? No. Okay, so the answer is no. Uh, yeah. I, I think don't. that you, you anyway need to interact with Senti because yeah. for any reason. No, uh, uh, question, is, uh, question is, question um, is, in MKV there is a field which uh, name of the type of the assets. Video, we have, audio. Uh, we have video, audio, but also over. So uh, it is an informal part saying that everything beginning with P uh, underscore is from video, and everything beginning with A underscore is audio. But we can accept every kind of uh, essence. So which kind of essence would you like to embed in the media uh, in, in, in Matroska? Right now, don't know, and that is my question. Is it uh, future proof? It's preview all the kind of uh, essence that can be. Uh, it, it is it just a letter. Actually, in Matroska, it, it is very neutral about the kind of uh, essence you have. So we plan to add a time code, for example, and we will see how we put that uh, in Matroska. But uh, as a container, Matroska is very neutral about the block it transports. Yes, but uh, how we can describe the type of essence? We that... just have. There is. There are two fields. There's the name of the codec, which can be a string, so you can pick whatever you want. But if we prefer, as I said, a prefix with a certain letter, and there's also a track type, which there, it's a it's a number. So, for example, one is audio, two is video, uh, three is uh, subtitles, etc. And basically, it's a number on 64 bits. So, you have a lot of possible types. The, the, there's a list of numbers that are already set, and we can add more in the future. That's, that's the IANA considerations that I was talking about. Every single one of those fields has an amending formula. And some of them are complicated uh, or involved, and some of them are trivial, right? You just need to ask something. And I also said to say that over in the MIME type space, in another part of the ITF, going up into the W3C, uh, there is a, you know, so we have audio slash and video slash and application slash and image slash and whatever. Um, so they want to create a haptic hierarchy for things like vibrations and all these other things that are happening in video games and people would like to record right uh, so i guess the next version of whatever it's uh whatever justin tv or whatever the other video game watching things you really enjoy experience the motion as well as the video <laughs> Yeah, it's 64 bits. Yeah. Right now we're on so the new Is that enough for you? Because I don't want to run out of 64 bits. Dave, did you say you have a question? Um, I I know at this point that in, in the goals of the working group, there's only a, a couple items left, like the RFC for Black and the Trosco, which are close to done. I'm just wondering, like, once these RFC XMLs are uploaded, what is next for the working group? Does it get shut down or... Well, um, if we come up with more work that uh, we think we can do, then we uh, can ask to be rechartered with the new work. Um, that's usually well accepted. Um, and the only time it, it doesn't happen is with you know someone saying we should do you know, oil this ocean, and everyone else is like, yeah, I'm done. I'm going home. Right. Um, so. Yeah, we, we can exist for as long as there is work to do, but what they do like us to do is to to bite off small chunks at a time and say what we're going to do and then do it, and then based on that, we get standard. Otherwise, uh, the working group um, is closed, which doesn't mean it disappears. It just means we don't necessarily have meetings. We still have a mailing list. We still have a web page. 
the status of the documents can change, and it's relatively easy to reopen the review. If someone comes along and says, we need to standardize this new quantum video compression system that someone's invented. Yeah, we can do that. So, anyway. Seven. Yeah, thank you so much all for sh letting us have this inside view into your into your working group meeting thank you for having us um thank you Talk of applause. um so right now we're going to welcome to the stage bob court and willa melder who's who are going to be talking to us about increasing inoperability of audiovisual heritage collections on the web with the NDE network, uh, which we heard a bit earlier, um, uh, with a network of terms. So, some slides are similar, and I'm going to repeat it anyways. Because first, I want to introduce the network of uh, digital heritage. We're working uh, towards implementing uh, the national uh, digital heritage strategy. Uh, and its aim is to increase the social value of the cultural heritage information maintained uh, by libraries, like the National Library, the archives, like the National Archive, museums, and other cultural institutions, like Sound and Vision. Um, the NDE strategy starts uh, from the end user perspective and encourages institutions uh, to provide digital heritage information that is more visible, usable, and sustainable. We have an NDE program, and that's about building a strong cross uh, sector network. So really uh, connecting all the, the heritage organizations on the level of, of expertise and information. And linked data is regarded as one of the enabling technologies. We're guided by some design principles to um, go to a discovery infrastructure. And with this, we really want to rethink the network, uh, maximize the data at the source. So no uh, more copying of data, but data at the source, refer to data instead of copying, so we can build uh, portals as dynamic views uh, based on a common interconnected data layer. We apply linked data uh, principles, use web-centric uh, technologies, and where possible, uh, decentralized and distributed technologies. So going something deeper to linked data, we all know the five-star model by Tim Berners-Lee about linked data. And our talk is mainly about the five-star, linking your data to other uh, data to provide context. That's really Im important. So to give you an example of using linked data in a network, on the left you see some uh, creative works, two paintings and a book. And on the left, uh, the artist Van Gogh. So our, there are links, of course, between all those uh, entities. Uh, the painting, uh, or Rembrandt is the, of Van Gogh, is the creator of the paintings. And the book is about Van Gogh. So you can make those links and give a real meaning to, to these uh, links with link data. Uh, all these... Um, Entities on the left are uh, linking to one entity, the concept of Van Gogh. 
And that's really important to find those concepts in vocabularies or thesauris. And that's where the network of terms comes into play. With it, we want to uh, build also a, a knowledge graph. Where can we find works from this artist? And where can we find this data? And that's wh where the data set register, which I presented this morning, comes into play. So our roadmap for the discovery infrastructure um, begins at the top with the web portals, uh, which we want to be able to be powered by knowledge graphs. Knowledge graphs, uh, uh, which uh, get their data from the network of terms and the data set register. But of course, data at the source, so the, the collection management systems are really important. There, the users have to use terms, vocabularies, the sorry. Uh, so we don't have any strings, but really links. But looking at those collection systems, there are uh, a lot of vocabularies, the sorry. Uh, terms sources. So the, the way it was, what there are, uh, as a collection uh, management system, you had to make uh, links to all these sources. But that, that's a lot of work. Uh, should you harvest each of them, or can you use live APIs for that? Uh, a vendor has to uh, support multiple protocols, uh, multiple data models. So there's a, a range of complexity and maintenance issues with this solution. With the network of terms, it's more like a layer in between. Uh, so it's a tool uh, for collection management system. It's one specific uh, API which can be called, and the network of terms uh, does the querying of the sources behind it, the, the ones that the institution wants to query. Uh, so the interface from the collection management system to the network of terms is standardized on SCOS. And um, the, the API uh, that, that's used is GraphQL. That's uh, the one that Facebook all, uh, also introduced. And at the, the, the other side, the network of terms is querying all the sources uh, using Sparkle. But in the process, um, uh, translating and transforming the data so the end user in the collection management system gets one view of the results. Technically, we use a community uh, platform to uh, do these kinds of uh, transformations and calls to the other sources. So within the heritage views, there are a lot of uh, sources that can be used and are already now available within the network of terms. Uh, some international, some uh, national, some even regional. Um, about places, about persons, about subjects. Um, um, Willem uh, will go into the GTAA, the Common Vocabulary of Audiovisual Desire, I think. Uh, so that's the left bottom part, so he will go to much more detail. But these are all the, the, the term sources which are available to the uh, users. So there is, it, it's a tool for uh, vendors to include it in their collection management system. So this is a view of the GraphQL uh, interface. So programmers can really easy query the network of terms. Of course, to make it more uh, lively, we also built a demonstrator for this product. And there you can just uh, look up in, in your browser specific term, specify which uh, source you want to query, hit the search button, uh, this website is in English available, uh, and the sources are queried. This is done dis in a distributed, federated way. So the real sources are queried. There's no caching or uh, looking up in an uh, aggregated database or something like that. Real distributed queries. One of the features uh, that's uh, new uh, to the uh, network of terms is that you also have a reconciliation API. So if you're using a product like OpenRefine, you can reconcile your, uh, your data set to one of the sources within the network of terms. Uh, so all these Dutch uh, sources are now uh, 
available within OpenRefine. Some didn't have a uh, reconciliation API, and thanks to the uh, network of terms, now they do have uh, this reconciliation API feature. The network of terms is a technical product. All of, of our products within the, the Heritage Network is open source and available on GitHub. Uh, so anyone can uh, start up their own network of terms using this technology. It's just defining within a data catalog what are the sources, what are the Sparkle queries which have to be fired, and you have your own network of terms. There are several uh, vendors who have uh, already implemented uh, this API to the network of terms. So uh, a, a lot of organizations can already use uh, this functionality, but not all organizations are using it yet because using terms within their collection management system is something an organization has to decide, has to understand why it helps them to pay, get better quality and to become a part of the heritage network. This product is um, uh, maintained and promoted by the Cultural Heritage Agency in the Netherlands. So it's already, um, well, developed, really developed. So I'd like to give the, uh, the mic to Willem, who's going to talk about one of these uh, term sources. Thanks, Bob. Uh, hello. Elder from the <coughs> Netherlands Institute for Sanity. Um, <coughs> Bob talked about uh, the network of terms uh, being a, like a collaborative effort from uh, the, the Heritage Network. Our organization, Sanity Vision, is one of the uh, partners in the network and also one of the providers of a terminology source, um, <coughs> the GTAA, the Common Thesaurus for Audiovisual Archives. Um, and therefore, uh, we'll talk a little bit on uh, <coughs> how we connected our uh, infrastructure uh, to, to the network of terms. So, um, <coughs> first of all, show a slide that uh, was shown this morning as well, just to uh, introduce a little bit um, what we're talking about uh, when we're talking about the collection of sound and vision. Of course, a thesaurus um, uh, in itself yeah, can be interesting, but it, it, it's related to a collection, and the collection is, is more interesting than the thesaurus in itself. Uh, our collection is about uh, radio, television broadcasts in the Netherlands from a uh, yeah, very early stage. <clears throat> there are all kinds of uh, specific uh, collections in this as well, during the war, um, early uh, um, yeah, Polygon journals, the early um, broadcast news uh, bef before there was television. It's all in the archive and there are all kinds of um, uh, contextual uh, collections as well, about books, scripts, costumes, uh, objects like the first uh, machine uh, in the Netherlands that, that did a radio broadcast. Or, uh, well, all kinds of uh, stuff that has to do with uh, uh, audiovisual heritage in the Netherlands. Uh, in total, uh, when talking about the audiovisual part being like playable, uh, playable media, it's probably more than the, than the 800,000 hours that is uh, on this uh, slide. Uh, <coughs> but uh, then you have an idea of uh, how many hours it, um, it is, how large the archive is. So. <coughs> Um, this, uh, this slide uh, is showing um, all the collections at the bottom. So, yeah, uh, they're grouped as, as media and they're managed in a uh, collection management system uh, at the top. Um, it's called DAM, standing for Digital Audiovisual Archive in the Netherlands. And it's like a, a customized uh, uh, product from a party called VizRT, and the product was Viz1, and it's completely um, yeah, customized for our uh, specific uh, use case. And so it contains all the objects, all the digital objects, including technical uh, metadata, and of course, 
descriptive metadata, which is what we're talking about when we're talking about terms and, um, and the network of terms. So the collection management system has all kinds of metadata concerning uh, persons that are in the news or persons that have created some, uh, uh, some object, uh, genres, names, etc. And these come all from uh, a control vocabulary. Uh, and that, uh, that system is um, um, in use only for like a year. So before we started using this one, it's called uh, Just Scos, um, and it's created by Mayam. That's, that's one of the parties that's also uh, working together with the uh, Visual team guys to, to build a collection management system. Um, they built a Just Scos uh, system uh, because before that we had a, like a, an open source uh, editor uh, for uh, uh, for thesaurus management, vocabulary management. Uh, that was quite a good product in the sense that it was uh, it had a lot of functionality, um, a lot of services on top of it, and we could do uh, editing and management of uh, of the of the lists. Uh, and it also um, interacted uh, with the collection management system, but the developer base was. Uh, bit too, uh, too uh, low, so there were not very ma many maintainers, not very many organizations using it. Components uh, began to run out of life, uh, and at some point uh, we had to decide, well, uh, we're going to rebuild it. Uh, so um, the, um, the part that's shown here, that's actually the core, and in itself it yeah, you cannot interact with it from the outside world. It also doesn't provide the concepts that are represented in it to the outside world or to the web. So for that, we had to um, build an additional layer, um, and that's the GTA service layer. Um, we have like a web page describing all the APIs that are available on that uh, service layer. Um, and they are they're actually mimicking the, the functionalities and the services that we used to have in the, in the earlier platform. So there, there's backwards compatibility. Um, but we added uh, Sparkle uh, specifically for being able to provide the network of terms with, uh, with an interface to, to query. Uh, so, um, this is also a uh, custom, uh, custom build. And it uses open source components for uh, storing all the, uh, all the concepts in it. So just the concepts are all cost based uh, concepts, like open standard. And we're storing everything in, uh, in uh, Apache Jena uh, uh, triple store. It's also open source. And I forgot to mention that also the GTA in itself is an open licensed uh, data set. So it's open database license, meaning that it can be used and reused uh, with uh, attrib attribution and sharing alike. Uh, and I think SoundVision uh, uh, does that because of uh, when you share uh, your terms and people start using them, it, it can start to grow. There are a couple of other institutes that are using uh, uh, the GTA to describe their collections. Uh, and in the end, that's, that's the whole idea. If we start sharing terms, then it will be more easy to uh, interact uh, or to, to make collections interoperable, to connect collections via the shared terms. Um, so, uh, one more slide. Um, about how we did manage to uh, connect the service layer to the, the network of terms. So on, on top you have the, the Alma system that was on the previous slide as well. You see the service layer in between. Data is actually uh, synchronized between those two. Um, and on, in, 
in, in the service layer, we also provide um, the like the identifiers to the outside world, and uh, also the search uh, facilities for the outside world. Uh, so we provided a query so that the network of terms could uh, uh, look up, uh, uh, do the federated search, as uh, Bob described, um, or distributed uh, search, you said. Um, then it turned out that in itself, the Apache Yena was not, not uh, yeah, fast enough. The performance was not good enough because we had so many labels uh, for terms like, well, maybe up to a million and uh, uh, we got timeouts so then we needed to uh, to add an additional uh, Lucene plugin for uh, for the um, uh, for the spark endpoint and that that really uh, was not that uh, difficult and it speeded up performance uh, immense so now we have like uh, can search immediately uh, while you I had to wait sometimes for 30 seconds uh, in the earlier situation. So that was one of the things that uh, we very recently uh, did to improve the performance. And <coughs> we now go to the demonstrator that, uh, that Bob also uh, showed. You can, well, select one of the terminology sources from the GTAA. Uh, well, here, yeah, search term is Ritter. You can search for persons uh, with the name Ritter. And uh, the results will be there. There are still some things that we can improve from our side, or maybe things that can be improved from the, from the side of the network of terms. These are details, and we, are, we will step, step by step uh, be working on that. Um, so, yeah, to wrap it up, uh, we use several open source components. Um, we are connected now, and we hope that other institutions will. Um, um, find our terms and use them in their terminal, uh, in their collection systems. Uh, you can try it out yourself. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I guess that's it. Maybe uh, there are some questions. Uh, yeah, all right. Applause. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> You have time for maybe one or two questions. If anybody has any questions for <coughs> Willem or Bob, thank you so much for sharing your terms with us. Um, are there any questions? Is, yeah. Very clear. A anyone using the thesaurus the using those terms? Uh, thesaurus. All right, well, if there are no more questions, I would thank you very much for your presentation. Um, so right now I will welcome up uh, Kate Murray and joining us online on Zoom, we have Charles, Charles Hosail, um, and they're going to be sharing with us about accessibility features for digital audiovisual collections content. Hello, Charles. Can you hear us? Oh, yeah, I can. I was muted. Sorry. Great. Um, Hello. Second, Charles, we're just done. Uh, no. Oh, yeah, I'm good. I was wondering. I was like, hmm, what is happening? Hmm. 
Looking good. Uh, okay. Kate, are you ready? No, no, no. Hold on one second. Okay. <laughs> I'm very surprised to see Dush in our spreadsheet, though, but <laughs> it's in percent review. Um, uh, hi, everybody. I'm Charles Hosale. Um, welcome to uh, um, Accessibility Features for Digital Audiovisual Collections content. Um, I'm an archivist at the American Folklife Center at the Library of Congress, and um, I'll let Kate introduce herself. I'm Kate Murray from Badgie in the Library of Congress. Yeah. Um, all right, okay, next slide. Let's start. Um, did it go to the next slide? It I'm, did. Oh, sorry, you can't see it? Um, yes, we are now at, the, at slide two. Okay, I'm just going to go with it. I trust you. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, I already said I'm an archivist at the American Folklife Center at the Library of Congress in the United States. Um, in my role as an archivist at AFC, I participate in the Federal Agency's Digital Guidelines Initiative, FAGI, and I'm presenting with Kate here today who leads the FAGI AV Working Group. Um, we're gonna discuss FAGI's new AV Accessibility Subgroup and our work documenting and exploring accessibility features of digital audiovisual collections content. Our explorations are primarily concerned with the context of the US federal government, but um, they have broader applications and utility too. We see their reuse throughout the community. Um, just as an aside, um, note that all FAGI products uh, have defined CC licenses, which is CC universal license for worldwide use and reuse, and they're always free of charge. If you're not already familiar with FAGI, um, check out our website or catch up with Kate or myself or any other FAGI participants. Um, it's digitizationguidelines.gov. Slide. Okay. Um, the accessibility subgroup was formed uh, after accessibility features were highlighted as a concern at FAGI's December 2021 AV working group meeting. Uh, some major discussion points were a lack of guidelines for creating and presenting audio description of AV content, best practices for when to embed or when to use sidecar files, especially for subtitles, and the functionality of different AV players and web players. Um, in discussions among subgroup members, uh, we took note of and were concerned about the proliferation of AV web presentations, the use of different uh, players across the government, different agencies following different laws and guidelines and providing different user experiences and different approaches to when and what content gets particular accessibility features or enhancements. Uh, the goal of forming the subgroup was to create more discussion and uniformity amongst FAGI members, especially around accessibility of collections content. Uh, we focused on digital audiovisual collections content as distinct from content that an agency creates as routine government records. In conversing the subject, we observed that agency publications and documents often follow different workflows, rules, reg regulations, and records management practices than um, cultural heritage collections material and content. In some cases, it appeared that different departments managed access to agency records uh, versus collections content. Um, the gaps and needs that were coming into focus primarily concerned collections content. And med many of the FAGI participants are the custodians of that content and are primarily concerned with it. So we narrowed our focus to practices and considerations of that material. Slide. Okay. So we formed the subgroup and set out to plan our work. Uh, we discuss the current environments at the various, various institutions we represent and what goals and deliverables would be most beneficial to the group. We discuss differences and similarities between our institutions, practices, and systems. Um, 
And as we started to talk about these needs and gaps, we also considered and shared resources that already existed, uh, especially publications by IASA and uh, safety standards and the like. We decided to focus our first round of work on two deliverables. One, a set of definitions that would establish a common language between institutions, and two, a survey of accessibility features and practices at uh, federal agencies with cultural heritage collections. Uh, at the same time, we noted that AMIA had formed their new accessibility committee uh, at nearly the same time that we decided to form our subcommittee. So we reached out to them to make them aware of the efforts we were planning and to share our working documents. Uh, it's pretty clear that there are needs and gaps being identified and addressed like across the entire AV community right now, which is exciting. Slide. Okay. So our group's first report is our definitions of uh, definitions for key accessibility features for digital audiovisual collections content. Uh, you can read the report on the FAGI website at digitizationguidelines.gov slash guidelines slash accessibility underscore AV underscore collections. Uh, we held a few meetings and did independent research to collaboratively create this document. Uh, we placed a draft up for public comment on July 12th of this year, and it was up until August 15th. And during that, we received really useful feedback. Um, thanks to everybody, including some people here today, I'm sure, uh, that shared their expertise. If you have more feedback, please share it with uh, Kate via the FAGI website or Kate's email, which will be up at the end of the presentation. This document is organized into two main informative sections. Uh, the first is a summary chart of accessibility features for audiovisual content, and the second is the definitions. It also has brief discussions of subtitle and caption formats and accessibility functions in different AV players, along with a list of resources we consulted. Slide. The first section of the definitions document is the summary chart, where we've collected info about AV accessibility features, their use, their functionality, related file formats, corresponding rules, US laws, and guidelines, and any applicable technical standards. We consulted WCAG, uh, Section 508, which uh, these are American resources, uh, FCC guidelines and CFR rules, along with uh, file format and encoding standards. And we interpreted uh, these documents application to the various accessibility features. If you see a gap or have other information to add, please let us know. The image on this slide is a screenshot of the chart um, and the portion of the chart with information concerning audio description. We've observed that audio description, when presented to users, can either be a sidecar file or embedded in the uh, media file. Various WCAG 508 and FCC rules and guidelines discuss audio description, and a variety of technical standards explain how to exploit audio description. The accessibility features we examined in the chart are audio description, closed captions, open captions, sign language interpretation, subtitles, and transcripts. Slide. Okay. The second section of the definitions document is, unsurprisingly, the definitions themselves. The definitions are intended to create a common language and share understanding between FAGI members and to serve as a brief introduction to AV accessibility features. The features we've defined are audio description, closed captions, EBU STL, closed captions, sign language interpretation, subtitles, teletext, time text, transcriptions, transcripts, and video description. The image on the screen is our definition of subtitles. It was surprisingly fun to figure out the difference between subtitles and captions and what those teams terms mean in different industries, countries, and languages. The other definitions have similarly, similarly robust information. Um, now I'm going to pass it off to Kate to talk about um, our second book. Um, but before I do that, just a shout out to Charles, who only knew he was going to do this live about an hour ago. So um, thank you, Charles. 
Um, <laughs> so the group's second publication, which was just published this week, is uh, survey results, the current state of, ac of accessibility features um, for audiovisual collections content in five FADGI institutions. Um, it's also available on our on the FADGI website. Um, I'm not going to read out that URL, but um, you can get to it from the FADGI homepage. So in spring 2020, the subgroup created a survey to gather information about accessibility compliance. Oops, sorry. Um, about accessibility compliance um, for archival audiovisual collections content in U.S. federal agencies. And so um, as a reminder, archival collections content is uh, stuff that comes in through collection development policies, not stuff that, that is created by an institution like a webcast or something like that. So this is older material, current material that's in our collections. Um, the responding institutions, um, so the survey was distributed to uh, FADGI members who answered as representatives for their institutions. We received responses from five large federal agencies, but we are counting all of the Smithsonian institutions as one here. So this is actually a really great return rate. The survey mainly serves as a snapshot for the current use and implementation of accessibility features at these institutions. And so the responding institutions are the Library of Congress, NARA, which is the, the US National Archives and Records Administration, the Architect of the Capitol, the National Library of Medicine, and the Smithsonian. And the survey questions were grouped into four major areas, so we'll walk through a summary of findings for each of those sections. Um, the first group of questions related to federal accessibility rules and guidelines compliance. And remember that FADGI institutions are federal, US federal institutions, but we cross branches of government. So while executive branches like NARA have to abide by Section 508, legislative branch like the architect of the Capitol, the Library of Congress, uh, may not be mandated to do that by law. But we typically do what our executive branch colleagues do in these matters. So I'll spare you a lecture about the branches of the US federal government. Um, but just to quickly say that the executive branch reports to the president, while the legislative branch reports to Congress. And there's also a judicial branch, which is the Supreme Court and other federal courts. But the short story is there's lots of overlap here. But in practical terms, it means that some laws apply to some agencies more strongly than others. So with that background, let's look at accessibility at a high level. If you remember back to Charles' slides, there are a number of laws and regulations, such as Section 508, the CFR, which stands for the Code of Federal Regulations, the FCC, which is the Federal Communications Commission. Um, all of them have input into re accessibility requirements. There's also WCAG, which is Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, which is not federally mandated and is actually run by the W3C as a global effort. Each of the corresponding institutions to different degrees are aware of these and want to comply, but often they don't know how to implement the rules and guidelines. In some cases, they're just not sure what they're mandated to do by law and what they want to do as good practice for them as moral people. But no doubt these institutions want to meet all the requirements to best meet the needs of their users, but doing so has very real practical, financial, and systematic impl Im implications. Um, oops, sorry. One too fast. Um, also, they don't really know how to go about meeting these needs, even the ones that they are mandated to meet, or even how to tell what applies to them. To just pull a quote from the survey paper, overall, this signals a wide range of applications of the guidelines and regulations set by communities without one distinct standard taking precedence. Different federal organizations, even from within the same branch, are using various accessibility standards and various combinations to tackle these needs. All five are aware of the pressing need to provide accessible content, although the implementation is at varying degrees of maturity. Even without clear knowledge of the specifics of the federal laws and without a systematic approach to doing this work, leading to a myriad of implementation details. So the next set of questions addressed implementation, funding, and workflow. So when it comes to implementation, there's a wide variety of approaches. For example, the Smithsonian uses WebVTT for captions, subtitles, and audio description, and SRT files for other captions and subtitles. Sun Smithsonian content has a separate video track for audio description. The Library of Congress has several options, including, including the use of TTML and SRT sidecar files for content on lock.gov. The Packard campus uses both sidecar and embedded captions for preservation and access files via WebVTT, SRT, and SCC files. Another institution uses a vendor to create SRT transcriptions. All FADGI institutions use a combination of both external vendors and in-house staff to create captions, subtitles, audio and video descriptions, and transcripts. Some audiovisual collections have existing accessibility features such as SRT or VTT files, but their quality level is uneven after extraction. 
one institution decided not to work with the extracted SRT content because the manual review and correction took weeks to complete. So how accessibility features are funded is a very mixed bag. One institution has a small dedicated budget for transcription and captioning by an external vendor, and the report goes into some detail about what these costs are. Um, but in-house staff work on quality control and finalization is not separately costed or funded. The Smithsonian reports that there is not a dedicated budget for accessibility in AV content, but accessibility is being included, included in more vendor contracts. The Library of Congress reports that funding and metrics are more project or collections based than comprehensive. Vendors are instructed to preserve accessibility content when it is pre-existing, such as embedded captions or languages, but generally they are not directed to create new accessibility content where it was not present in the original. It's interesting to note that the Library of Congress publications likely have accessibility included in vendor contracts, but archival preservation and access projects often do not. Next we have presentation, access, and display. And the survey asked, institute, in, asked each institution to describe how they present and make available the collection's content with accessibility components. Each of the institutions mentioned that YouTube was, an external, was used as an external streaming service, and YouTube can have closed captions. Three institutions also used internal collections platforms or asset management systems to stream video or provide descriptions. NARA's primary point of public access is the National Archives catalog where accessibility features are presented as text blocks or text files in e and item level descriptions. The Library of Congress uses a variety of platforms, such as the lock.gov player, YouTube, VLC, um, me media player in reading rooms. Four of the five institutions offer multiple platforms or player options for content. One institution clarified that for the public, there's only one platform or player option, YouTube. However, for internal use, there are multiple platforms and player options. This theme of public versus internal could be seen in other responses as well. The Library of Congress echoed this distinction by explaining that while the library uses multiple platforms and player, players, it does not mean that the same content is available on multiple platforms. Four of the five institutions have approved players that enable toggling on and off of video descriptions, which is very important. Given that there are different platforms and players, it begs the question if and how accessibility requirements differ from the same content depending on the platform. NARA's practice has been to provide captions for content on its YouTube channel and for selected items or by request on other platforms. The Library of Congress acknowledges that the accessibility requirements vary between types of content rather than the platform it's shared on. For example, content provided Content created by the Library of, of Congress, such as webcasts or events, will always have closed captions. Where archival collections content put online may or may not have closed captions or a full and accurate transcript. While only two of the three respondents to these questions say that they have guidelines or documentation about accessibility features for AV collections content that could be shared, which really drives home the ad hocness of some of this work, it is positively counterbalanced with the reality that with the, with the good news that five, all five institutions confirm that they have an, ex, an accessibility office or other group within the institution with whom they can engage on such topics. And finally, at the end of the survey, participants were asked, given the opportunity to share about accessibility needs for their archival audiovisual collections. Three institutions expressed the wish to have content guidelines, as it seems there are no existing guidelines and or it can be overwhelming to know where to start. The Library of Congress specifically expressed the desire to prioritize accessibility as part of project planning and budgeting. The Smithsonian proposed uh, some specific areas where guidelines would be helpful, including creating audio, visio, it, audio and video description, like what could be described, how frequently the scene should be described if it doesn't change, etc., and getting a sense of the cost for large and small projects. Um, so what are the takeaways from these survey results? that FADGI institutional members have increased awareness of their legal and ethical responsibilities for accessibility features for audiovisual collections content. However, they remain very much in flux about implementation methods and workflows due to a variety of factors, including the complexity of the content, the limitations on approved applications and tools, systems integration, staffing levels, dedicated funding, and more. So what's next for the FADGI accessibility subgroup? We have a few specific steps that are spelled out, like adding the accessibility definitions to our FADGI glossary, which if you've never used the FADGI glossary, um, 
uh, it, it's actually really heavily used, much to my surprise. We get many thousands of hits a month. Um, and we'll sketch out a very high level template for embedded metadata for web VTT files, which focuses on provenance. Who made this file? How? And that might help with some quality control e expectations. And we have a few other possibilities, like potentially making sample files and, and uh, model collections, maybe some tool funding, although there is absolutely no promise on that, because <laughs> it's hard to get money. Um, but we're very interested to hear what the community needs as well. We've scoped this to US federal agencies, but the higher level takeaways are widely applicable. Oop, I don't know what just happened there. Okay, so um, Charles and I are the talking heads here today, um, but we certainly want to thank and recognize all of our FADGI uh, folks who worked in this project, so we asked for selfies for those who were game to send them to us. Um, Charles cheated and included his dog, because you can't beat that. Um, so uh, he wins the internet for today. Um, and I'll point out that Crystal Sanchez there is wearing her scarf from iPres, if, if you were in iPres. Um, and actually, we're, everyone looks delightful. I, I look like a crypt keeper, but we can uh, move on from that. Um, <laughs> so uh, a shout out to all these wonderful friends and colleagues. Um, and a few more camera shy folks who didn't want to share a selfie. Um, but it's a great group, and as always, I feel fortunate to work with them in FADGI projects. Um, so that's it for us. Hopefully we have like a minute for questions maybe. But if not, you can always reach out to me or Charles or through the FADGI website, and we're always happy to hear comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kate. And also a big thank you to Charles for coming through at the very last minute. Um, I think we still have him up on the Zoom if he's available yeah. for questions as well. So we do have a, a few minutes for questions if anybody has questions for Kate or for Charles. Um, Dave. Oh, sure. sure. My question, I wasn't sure, Kate, if you were addressing this, but were you primarily focused on um, prov providing recommendations for when, you, when your organization has a hand in the creation of the captions? Or would these recommendations apply to like when you're acquiring captions to another source, from another source? Like sometimes I get in captions and they're just, they just kind of look strange or um, they're not necessarily the same quality I would have internally. And then I always kind of debate like, is this part of the archival work, or is it like if I'm trying to clean up a metadata record, you know? Right, I think that's one of the discussions that we're having, and Charles uh, chime in here, right? That's one of the discussions that we're having in the subgroup. So um, uh, we were specifically thinking about the, the, this is content that we already have in our collections that we're expected to serve out, uh, but we, I don't know that we had gotten as far as guidelines for creating, uh, for asking other people to uh, send us, uh, you know, to, to send us v VTT files or, or or SRT files or like what that would look like. It was more for an internal guidance about what we are doing with the content we already have. Charles, would you agree with that? I would. And um, like, I think that was Dave. I didn't hear who was talking. Oh, but, sorry, that was um, Dave Rice. To go, to go off of that, like being able to switch between like maybe a modern caption that was made for accessibility purposes and then the historical preserved caption, if it is a tape that happens to have that. Um, you know, so the player, we should focus on having players that have that functionality. <laughs> Thanks, Kate and Charles. Any other questions? We can move a very short question, squeeze it in. No? Okay, well, with that, I think we're at time. So thank you so much, Kate. Thank you so much, Charles, Thanks for Charles. joining us. Okay. So, yeah. So our next presentation is from Andrew Weaver. Andrew lives in a very inconvenient time zone compared to here, so he is joining us. Oops, no, I don't want to do that. Um, he is joining us by video. He won't be available uh, for Q&A um, afterwards, so please take note of his contact information if you do have any questions for him. Um, Sorry, I don't use PCs and I don't know where any, <laughs> how to find anything. Um, it's a video. It, maybe it's in the downloads. Uh, yeah, with the, with the VTT. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah. And my name is Andrew Weaver and I- I don't think the sound. Yeah, you can hear it? 
Hi, my name is Andrew Weaver, and I'm the Media Preservation Librarian at the University of Washington Libraries in Seattle, Washington. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, today I'm going to be talking to you about our homegrown solution here to uh, the mass migration of audio CDs. Really quickly, I wanted to go into the background of why we initiated this project and where we started. Our library contains by far the largest media collection of all academic institutions in the Northwest United States. And within this, we have massive amounts of audio on CDs, both commercial and unique archival materials. Amongst those archival collections, we have a broad range of collections that were both donated to us on CD, comprised of content such as irreplaceable oral records of at-risk indigenous languages, as well as a legacy of past mass digitization efforts from decades past where CDs were archived in lieu of digital files. These collections can easily be in the hundreds of CDs, so we were very motivated to find an efficient method to start moving forward on their migration. After consulting with other archives who had engaged in automated workflows for optical media, we made the decision to purchase a NIMBY USB Plus device and to pair it with the DB PowerAmp software to create per-disc Q-Wave pairs. While that out-of-the-box workflow seemed to work all right for our initial small test collections, we soon began to run into issues when we applied it to some of the larger archival collections, particularly those that consisted of very low quality CDRs. I want to emphasize here that my purpose is not to denigrate a particular software tool, but just to explain that for whatever reason, it wasn't a 100% fit for our context. A part of this issue could be us desiring to archive as wave and queue pairs, which is a single wave file per CD with a corresponding queue sheet that contains information about track ordering and duration. This might be a case where we as preservationists were doing something that most users of DB PowerAmp software don't need to do, since private users ripping commercial collections often favor ripping CDs to individual files per track. What we noticed on our equipment, and again, we did not exhaustively test this externally, so this might just be a reflection of an interaction of the software and our local environment, was that when we would rip CDs, they would sometimes end up missing large chunks of data. This appeared to be due to the software's method of creating WaveQ pairs, where it would rip each track individually into the computer's temp folder and recombine into a single file at the very end of disk migration. For whatever reason, we found that some of this data was not being recombined correctly. We also desired a little more usable metadata output and logging about the capture process itself, as quite a lot of the RIP status information was dependent on the GUI. These issues led to a cumbersome workarounds, such as running background processes to log the length of every CD run through the NIMBY, and then comparing the CD run times to the WAVE files uh, after capture to find incomplete transfers. Eventually, due to the volume of disks we were processing, these extra checks became too much of a detriment to efficiency, and we began to explore other alternatives. In creating a homegrown tool for batching CDs, we drew inspiration quite heavily from the Iron Lab tool created by Johan van der Knef at the National Archives of the Netherlands. For those who don't know, Iron Lab, which stands for Image and Rip Optical Media Like a Boss, is an integrated tool for intelligently batch ripping all forms of optical media, including audio CDs, data DVDs, and video DVDs. It does this by using the command line tools for controlling the NIMBY robot that are included in DB PowerAmp, and then using Python to build an environment for ripping optical disks with the desired tools while creating package structure and metadata. Since Iron Lab still uses DB PowerAmp for the ripping of optical media, and we were trying to move away from that, we didn't end up implementing Iron Lab itself for our audio-specific collections, but I want to emphasize that it served as inspiration for our own tool by showing us what was possible. In looking into a system that would take the Iron Lab approach, we needed to find software that would work well in a Windows environment and had good control via the command line. This is due to the NIMBY being dependent on Windows. This took me a bit of time, as I am much more familiar with the Linux ecosystem and tools such as CD Paranoia that would have seemed to fit the bill well, but didn't have a comparable Windows release. Other popular tools, such as Exact Audio Copy, that work well for making Q-Wave pairs on Windows, would have been great, but didn't have good command line functionality. After testing out options, including a delve into the Linux subsystem on Windows, we settled on using the QTools suite of tools, specifically its command line program called QRipper, which does exactly what the name implies. It rips CDs to a single file and QSheet pair, and supports various levels of safe ripping using rerip comparisons and C2 checksums. I do have to say, I actually like DB PowerAmp's method of safe ripping that minimizes wear and tear on hardware a little bit more because it does it by doing multiple, uh, multiple full passes of tracks rather than back and forth approach within tracks used by QTools. But so far, we haven't burned out our optical drive, and even if we do, they're pretty cheap these days. Before I get into the specifics of what the tool generates, in case anyone is interested in checking it out later, here is the address for where the tool itself lives on our UW Libraries Preservation Department GitHub page. And again, the tool is using the Iron Lab approach where we use the DB PowerAmp command line controllers for the NIMBY. So DB PowerAmp is a necessary dependency even though we don't use it for the actual ripping. The tool is also written in Ruby, so you would need to have Ruby installed to you. 
So as we've just talked about, the core dependencies are pretty simple. You just need to install a copy of DB PowerAmp and its batch ripping add-on, the NIMBY batch drivers, and obviously the NIMBY robot itself, as well as a copy of QTools. Since we've mostly been focusing on reliable rips for this process so far, there aren't currently very many other core dependencies. But I imagine that at minimum, this will expand to media info pretty soon as it would enable some extra integrated QC checks, such as expected file length, etc., that we were running independently during the previous workflow. Once all the dependencies are there, the only setup required to run the tool itself is to plug in dependency paths into the configuration file, again, in a very similar manner to IronLab. Since our tool is only focused on audio CD ripping, this process is pretty simple. You just need to configure where the DB PowerAmp CLI NIMBY driver controllers are, as well as the path to calling the CLI ripping component of QTools, which is called QRipper. This simplicity is also by design, as since we envision having student workers helping us with these projects, and student workers often only remain with us for short periods of time before they move on to other aspects of their studies, we wanted something that was relatively set and forget in terms of its options and setup. Sticking with this theme of simplicity, to run the tool, there are only two mandatory parameters that must be set via flags. These are the number of disks to be ripped and the output path to the project directory. Our tool supports three levels of settings for RIP verification, which correspond to the presets within QTools. This is, again, by design, as we wanted to keep the usage as simple as possible and avoid any need for a diverse group of workers to have to navigate editing menu settings mid-project. The RIP options are Burst, Secure, and Paranoid, with the default being Secure. Secure settings mean the drive will read each disk session twice. If results differ or the drive reports C2 errors, then up to 30 more full or partial read retries are done for that section. This setting was selected for default, as we found that within our situation of ripping many legacy CDR disks, that it provided the best balance between quality and speed. For our disks, we don't tend to use Paranoid much, as honestly, we have found that if after 30 read attempts fail, that the odds of us getting something off of that sector are pretty low, and logging the error and moving on is the most beneficial for the collection at large. So really, the whole reason why we went this route to build out a custom batch tool rather than relying on commercial software is summed up in this slide about the outputs of the process. Every time you run a batch, the following files are created automatically. We get per disk wave files and queue sheets, as well as a queue tools log file and a console log of the RIP itself. This is then followed by a per batch CSV file that includes easy to read information about any possible RIP errors to allow for quick triage of problem disks. We have found that generating and storing this information provides us with much better and much more hands-off methods of verifying the quality of our batch RIPs than the previous method, which relied on working with a GUI-based program. Having one batch CSV file at the end allows us to quickly verify our batch rip integrity and not worry about losing that context upon closing the program down. The information captured in the logs themselves also provides a great deal of information that we can save to help provide a level of provenance about the files in the future. The QTools log, for example, contains a table of contents information about the disk. I like keeping this as an extra layer of redundancy in case anything ever happens to the paired queue sheet with the file. The console log, meanwhile, provides great information for parsing. I mentioned before that we plan on probably adding in media info file length checks. It is this console log that gives us easily parsable expected length for the disk. Having all these diagnostics available after the fact, and not just while in the process of running, has given me a lot more confidence in the transparency of our disk migration, and I found it very easy to use. Once the batch is done, the files require a little bit more processing before we archive them. The CDs are ripped into files that follow a generic timestamp pattern, so it is necessary to batch rename them all to the desired naming convention. We have a separate process to do this that is a part of the CD Ripper repository, but was by design not integrated to automatically run post-rip to give a chance for any necessary QC checks, re-rips, or any other post-rip verifications. Once the batch has been verified as being complete, the renaming process is as simple as creating a list of names in a text file in the order that disks were ripped. This will then be used to rename the rip files and associated metadata in chronological order. One key part of this process is that the script will also automatically edit the queue sheets to reflect the new updated file name, so that the validity of the wave queue pairs is not compromised. Adding this feature has saved us a lot of time versus updating queue sheets individually, and we found it pretty easy to use. The last part of our process is separate from the ripping tool itself, but I did want to mention it both for completeness and to highlight that it is yet another area where scripting around existing open tools has provided us with an excellent alternative to commercial software. After renaming, we use a very simple tool we made in-house to batch control the command line tool for BWF MetaEdit to embed BEX metadata into the files. This includes things like parsing collection numbers and IDs out of file names, as well as contextual information about the equipment used for reformatting. Once we have this metadata embedded, the final step of our process is to use another script that converts all these broadcast wave files into FLAC files. 
This script crosswalks the BEXT metadata into comment tags that work with FLAC while also using the keep foreign metadata feature of the FLAC tool to reversibly embed the original metadata. This tool also automatically updates the file queue sheet to reflect the change of extension for its paired audio file and has proved very convenient. I wanted to very briefly mention future plans for the tool. Probably the first change we are looking to make soon is to eliminate the need to specify the number of disks to be ripped and instead to have a process to automatically turn off after a couple of load attempts where the robot finds the disk. Again, the desire here is to keep the ripping process as simple as possible to cut down on training so this would seem to make a lot of sense for us. Also, as I said before, I also want to look into any log parsing for basic RIP QC we can do. Lastly, I need to experiment with how QTools handle CDs with pre-emphasis applied. This doesn't often come up, particularly with our archival collections, but we are a large enough library that we do contain CDs in the collection with pre-emphasis that might need to go through the preservation workflow in the future. I intend to do some testing to see what kind of flags QTools creates to reflect any emphasis detection, and then possibly to add the option for some automatic de-emphasis to be applied to a mezzanine file via FFmpeg. This isn't super high priority, but it is exactly the kind of nerdy thing that I love, so I'm looking forward to experiment. Lastly, I wanted to thank you all for bearing with me as I attempted to vocally describe a command line based process, and to apologize for not being able to be logged in to take questions live due to the awkward time difference with me in Seattle. For those who have questions or, and or comments, please hit me up via the usual methods. I felt inspired to share our tool by No Time to Wait's theme this year of transparency, teaching, and trust, both because the tool is working great for us, but also to highlight how we as an institution have benefited from all the efforts around open tools and open workflows that are present in the community. Both through drawing inspiration from other projects, as in the case of how Iron Lab has directly influenced this tool, as well as being directly reliant on tools such as the output of media area, the efforts of the open software and open archiving community have made our work possible, and I'm very fortunate to be in an environment that has been receptive to advocating for open solutions. Well, that's all for me. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope to hear from some of you soon. Uh, so uh, it's time for a break. Um, we will be back in 15 minutes. Is that right? 15? <laughs> Just don't, yeah. Yes, 15 minutes.
Yeah. Yeah. So, hello. I don't. Okay. Oh, there we go. Welcome back from the break, everyone, for a last section of our uh, No Time to Wait Six, and we're gonna, we're, we're gonna find at the end where No Time to Wait Seven is. So looking forward to that. Um, so without any further ado, we're about five minutes behind, so we're pushing the schedule just five minutes forward. Um, I'm going to hand it off to Jerome to tell us about the future of MediaCon. So, me again, but it is the last time <laughs> today. <laughs> um, we will speak about another open source uh, tool we develop. It is uh, MediaCon, and MediaCon is an implementation and a policy uh, checker. So what is implementation, what is policy? Um, actually, implementation, it is uh, what is in the specifications. So it is what we were talking a bit sooner uh, in the afternoon. Uh, there, were, there is specification and a file need to, conf to be conformed to this um, uh, specification. So it is not something you, you, you decide, it is uh, st a standardization bodies who, who decide about how it should be. And a lot of software are not compliant, so we try to detect the issues in the files and we report if it is okay or not okay. Uh, a policy report is more subjective. It is you. You decide about uh, what you want in your repository. If you want, uh, for example, only Matroska files, uh, it is the example there on, um, on the right. And uh, you, you can decide, oh, I, I accept only FFV1 and only FFV1 version 3 and so on. So it is very subjective. It is you, you decide about uh, what would be accepted or not in your workflow. And uh, in that case, uh, in MediaConch, you have two columns, one about implementation, not you. What about uh, something, uh, a column about uh, policy, it is your decision. Uh, you can also have some uh, an, an integration of media info, so you can know a bit more about your files. You can also go deeper in the files. You can have a trace of the files. So if you want uh, to, to check more deeply what is in the file and what has the, the meaning of a, any byte. So it is more advanced, but it, it may be useful sometimes. We have also gu uh, GUI for that, and we try to make the policy editor for creating the policy as easy as possible. So it is with a lot of drag and drop, with help. So you don't need to be an expert. You just have a GUI. You, you try to understand what has the, the media info fields, what is the format, what is uh, the, the, the frame rate, and so on. So you don't need to be very technical, and the GUI helps you a lot to create your own um, policy. And if it is not enough, uh, other people created policies, and MediaConch is made to share your policies. So uh, there are some uh, public policies created by uh, colleagues from you, maybe. And uh, you can uh, check the policies, and uh, download them, and uh, look at how they are done, and so, and so on. So the goal in MediaConch is that everyone can share their experience about wha what they do. <coughs> so now I will speak a bit about the future, but a bit later. Uh, let's start with the past. Uh, it, MediaCon started in 2015 with an European Union funding, and uh, they were interested that the archive are able to to um, to, uh, to to understand what are in the files. Uh, in, uh, in the last few uh, two days, we talk about the integrity uh, about, uh, of the files, and it is important not to only uh, check the, the, the first frames on, of the file. And you say, "Oh, I know it. It is MP4, uh, AVC. It is fine," but you don't know if your file is very uh, the integrity of, of the files. Uh, maybe you have some uh, an issue in your storage, but you, the storage didn't say it. Uh, oh. The block, I cannot read it again, I replace it with zeros, and the storage says nothing about that. With MediaConch, you are, you are able to detect that. We check the full file, so, and we, we, we are able to detect um, at any place if there is an error or not. Um, due to the European Union funding focused on open source format, MediaConch is mainly uh, developed for Matroska, FFV1, and PCM. 
um, that other companies in the project of MediaConch, uh, the project was called Preforma, MediaConch is on Matroska if everyone and PCM. Other projects were uh, about uh, uh, checking the conformance of PDF and TIFF. And with uh, the Preforma project and MediaConch, we needed to have a specification, uh, uh, the correct specification before we can compare to the specification. And this is the reason we started at the IETF working group. So we talked about it a few, uh, few hours ago. And the Preforma started the um, IETF working group. And uh, and we, from this working group, we created MediaConch to, to, to be able to, to, to check the, uh, the standards and to, ver to check the files if they are conform or not to the standard. Um, so MediaConch was uh, at the beginning focused on Matroska, FV1, but now other people were interested by other tools, uh, other uh, formats. So the latest development of uh, MediaConch are more about 3D audio, so totally different uh, place. So sometimes we work with stereo, and now with MediaConch we worked a lot on 3D audio because there are no tools for, co for checking the conformance of uh, 3D audio, so Dolby Atmos, MPEG-H, and so on. We have a lot of things about that. We don't do implementation checker from, for them yet, but we can have a policy checker for them. So, for example, you can say, okay, uh, I don't uh, know this format, well, this format very well, so I reject them, or I can accept because Dolby Atmos, okay, I, I can handle that, I accept it in my workflow, and package, I don't know it, so I reject it. So it is uh, the, uh, the choice in the policy checker. We also added uh, over policy checker um, about uh, over format, the text format, captions, TTML, or time code discontinuities. We also implemented different levels of logging. Sometimes in the specification, it is not written shall, but it is written should. So at the beginning, it was always errors for us. So now we have an error for um, shall, and we have a warning for should. We also have a fully online version now, so it is for some people who want to check before and upload the file. So uh, some people want, okay, um, the, the client should upload the file, but before uploading the file and after that checking it and saying, oh no, I, I, I don't agree, I don't accept this file, we can analyze the file before the upload. So it helps to improve sometimes the workflow, spe some specific workflow. With MediaConch, uh, we don't sell MediaConch, it is open source, it is free. So, uh, how we live, uh, how we develop it, it is uh, that we implement the user's needs. So uh, we, don't, we, we don't have a f the full featured uh, implementation checker or a policy checker. We implement some specific needs. So some, there are some examples there in, on my slide. Um, there are some specific needs for specific users. So we have the base of the code, and now we are able to, um, to implement some small things, some, some small feature requests uh, at a low cost. So it is very useful if you have a specific needs, whatever it is, very small or big, you can ask and we see how we can embed that in MediaConch. Um, we have uh, some funding for the moment, uh, for next year, it, um, so it is no more only about FFV1 open, open source, uh, not only um, about Matroska, and we work on more uh, modern formats also, well, modern, new format. So ADM, ADM is 3D audio, so uh, we have a policy checker, but we are working on a full implementation checker. It is also for XHE AIC. It is a new uh, uh, audio format, and uh, we have a funding for uh, having a full implementation checker for it also. And some people are also interested in some MXF implementation checker, so not the full implementation checker because MXF is very complicated and it is very costly to implement a full implementation checker, so we start with a uh, user's need. And beyond, after that, actually, I would say it depends on you because we develop things not for us, 
practice we develop for you. So we are interested in knowing what you need, and we see what, what, with the open source tools we had, we have how we can fit your needs. So if you have needs, say it. So we can discuss about that, and we can see how we can resolve that. It is the goal in MediaConch to resolve your problems. I don't have any problem. I don't have any file. <laughs> but we can resolve your, uh, your issues. Thank you. That's all. <laughs> all right. So, uh, what do you all need? Um, uh, well, uh, while I let you think about it, maybe I'll pose a question to you, Jerome. Um, but in, in terms of this question of what are your needs and you asking for this um, feedback, you had talked in your previous presentation about the sort of new bus the business model for open source development that you've been exploring and using sponsorship as a way to sort of push development forward. Is this, are you looking for um, you know, people to sponsor certain um, uh, features that you're looking to add, or is this sort of more open to, to people to give you feedback um, without that kind of sponsorship? We are curious about the priorities of what are the main issues not uh, filled by other tools, and we talk about uh, if there's if you don't have any budget, still say it because we can find maybe a co sponsors. So uh, when uh, someone comes to me and, and, uh, and asks, oh, I need that, and uh, we say, the cost is that, oh, it is too expensive, and we understand that it is not so easy sometimes. But if you don't say, we don't know, and maybe another entity has the same issue, and maybe two, three, four other entities have, have the same issue. And if I know that the four entities have the same issue, I can say, okay, it, it was too costly for you alone, but I have four people, and if we all four agree, we can uh, share the cost. So even if you don't have a, a whole budget for that, I would be interested in knowing what are your, the issues you, you may have. So, does anyone... Well, short question. I'm sorry, I'll give you the microphone. Uh, do you think to extend uh, this checking program, uh, let's say for DCPs, which is also kind of audiovisual containers? DCP is also possible. We, we support uh, DCP for the um, policy checker already. Because uh, MediaConch is based on media info for the policy checker, so everything supported by media info and DCP is supported is supported by MediaConch. Um, beyond that, uh, if there is a need, we could have uh, more uh, implementation checker, especially uh, for TIFF, which is ba uh, the base of uh, DCP. So it is possible. Uh, we could check that if there is uh, in the numbers, for example, of the files. Or oh, there is a gap between, uh, there, there is a file missing, for example, we can check that. Or if the uh, wave, um, the audio content uh, duration is not the same as the video duration and so on, we could do this kind of checks. <laughs> Did you want to add a comment? No, that was just a yes. A, a yes. <laughs> yes. Someone is happy. <laughs> so contact me. <laughs> Um, anybody else have something they're, they're dying to give uh, feedback to Jerome about that they've always wanted to ask him or tell him that they want? It's your chance. So the stream duration comparison, so audio, video, and so on. Okay, I get it. Um, well, I think we're almost at time anyway, so we will move on to our next presentation. Thank, Thank you so much, Jerome. Um, up, up next, we have Reto, uh, who's going to be telling us about the, the photon path um, from sensor values to pixel values. Oh, there you go. Thank you, Yvonne. Good afternoon, good evening, good night, good morning, depending where the listeners around the world are. Today I will delve into a few aspects of color filter mosaic and the so-called raw data, which in my personal opinion 
should be considered not only uh, uh, in production but also in the archival context. Firstly, I would stress out that there is no such a thing as raw data. Data are always cooked in a way or in another. Fine. Um, <clears throat> This is my today's summary. I will speak about buyer type sensors, what we can do with the so-called raw data, and how all this uh, could be implemented, used, and standardized uh, mainly in this order. Let's start with the past, with the sensor and the buyer filter pattern. Since eight years, I have been publicly presenting several times on this topic, not because I am obsessed, but because I think it's an important topic to discuss. A digital image is usually represented as a rectangular matrix of values, a raster image, image and a single element in this raster is a picture element, or short, a pixel. It is important to stress out that in a color system, a pixel includes the information for all color channels, all color components. The first <coughs> point in my list is about the quantity of pixels, and all the other points are about the quality of pixels. And the chroma uh, subsampling in analog television and video is actually an analog lossy compression and strangely enough this same mechanism has also been used in digital video and television and buyer can be seen as a evolution of it. I remember that this is the dilemma that we are facing constantly. We wish the best image quality in the smallest file size at the shortest encoding time. In the real world, this is not possible, and we have to compromise at least on one of the parameters. And there are even more bad news. The vast majority of today's sensors measure only the variation in light intensity and not the hue, but we are working mainly with color images and the vast majority of the scanners that uh, people can afford worldwide use these buyer filter sensors. What is a buyer filter sensor? The 13th of November of this year will be the 10th anniversary of this gentleman's passing. He was a scientist working at Kodak who invented this file uh, filter pattern which later were named after him and this is the patent his most fa famous patent in it has to be delivered in 1976 that's not the day before yesterday that's 46 years ago and uh, here he uses his own terminology but i don't go into that I uh, stress out only that, that the luminance elements Y in the schematic became the green elements and the two chrominance components C1 and C2 in the schematic became the red and blue filters. So you have the sensor and on the top of each cell you have a small filter, a very tiny filter who let uh, go through only a color around the wished color. This gives not the full information, but half of the green, a quarter of red, and a quarter of blue. And this is obviously a loss of information. And the loss of information can be illustrated here. <coughs> Sorry. In one, we have the real image to digitize. In two, we have the vision of the sensor, what the sensor actually measures. And on the red tulip, you see that the red pixels or the red points are switched on very brightly, and the green and blue are more or less switched off. 
the three is the interpretation of what that is, and the four is then the so-called demosaicing or the debiring. And you see, especially in the foreground, a huge, a bigger pixelization. Now let's move into the present, what we can do with this information to have the full image. This could be the, the information of one bit, uh, uh, of one uh, cell with a blue filter, two cells with a green filter, and one cell with a red filter on its top, with a 12-bit format, which, which is uh, usual today in the scanners. Oh, sorry, this one. And uh, the question is how to turn, turn these values in information for all the cells. This is what is measured, and I fill up the vectors with zeros, so we have one third of the needed information, and this is the information that gives uh, us the full RGB. All what is in black in this image has been calculated with the values that have been measured that are the colored ones. Or more schematically, you can represent it uh, with letters. We experimented a lot with another way to use this data by uh, taking four sensor measured values and uh, putting them in just one pixel. In this case, we have the values that are measured and the values that uh, are used. <coughs> you see, we don't have black information. All comes from the sensor, and the two greens can be combined, for instance, calculating the mean of the two values. Or more schematically, we can say something like that. So we have now two ways to use Fire type data, the classic approach, which is a digital blow up, or a baroque approach, which is a digital reduction. We have the choice between a bigger quantity of pixels or a higher quality of pixels. The many things I experimented in this file includes a codec that I programmed in order to experiment with different debiring or demosaicing algorithms and to choose always the one that gives the best result for a specific type of image. And when you have the, once you have the impression you have uh, resolved all the problems, you discover that there are many different types of patterns and actually, we are uh, testing in production, we are using in production Bayer, the CYGM, and the Sony RGB. All three are in production in our company. The ones with uh, unfiltered cells are not good for film digitization because it increases a lot the noise. It's good for other purposes, but not for film digitization. Now let's take a look at the end to the future. In my opinion, it's uh, important to try to ask two questions and to answer two questions. The first one is what exactly does the sensor and how exactly are the so-called raw data processed? And the proposed terminology to do that is uh, pixel for picture element that we know, but to use the word sensor for sensor element. And this has been proposed by um, um, uh, Charles Poynton uh, a month ago at the conference Color in Film in Bern in Switzerland. And I presented it at the YASA conference in Mexico and to my students in Donostia. This is an unpublished work for the moment by the IMAGO Technical Committee. Uh, I will show you the photon path diagram. It has been drawn by Daniele, uh, Daniel Siracusano, and it will be released as open source in the next weeks or months, but not years. So this is the schema 
the full schema step by step, the photon passed from the viewer to, from the scene to the viewer, from the left uh, camera, then post-production and presentation. The camera is an element that we have also in film scanners. We need a camera and the two parts that are interesting for what I am saying are here, what happened in the sensor and what happened in the raw processing. That's exactly what we are doing at my company since we started building our own scanners back in uh, 2014. So we try to focus to these two steps and we can today have control of the, the digital processing, the white balance, the demosaicing, but we have not control on the sensor that we cannot change. The raw processing can be done in the camera or at the beginning of the post-production and we do that uh, both depending on what we are doing. So we have the, we have seen the demosaicing where the sensor values are transformed into pixel values and we have seen as well that we actually can do that with or without demosaicing. Um, in order to have the full uh, color information that is needed to screen an image or to see an image. And all this has a lot to do, in my opinion, with transparency, teaching and trust. What does this mean for us? What does this mean for us? As you know, uh, uh, FFV1 version 0, 1 and 3 have been standardized last year. Thank you, Michael Niederbayer, Dave Reis, Jerome Martinez and many others. And there is also a draft document of version 4. The possible improvements to FFV1 are under discussion in the seller GitHub presence or in the mailing list, the seller mailing list or here at the no, no Time to Wait conferences. I suggested a number of improvements in various presentations over the last five years, and I personally consider that the support of any type of channels would be the most important one, which includes the support for Y prime COCG and multispectral scanning data. FFV1 could actually become the first open source widely spread codec video to support not only many type of pixel values, but also the sensor values, the real raw data which the sensor generates. This step could be really a game changer. I also suggest other highly technical improvements which I skip for the save um, sake of time and uh, I sum up with uh, different ways to store buyer type data. The first one is the classic one, it blows up the data by 300%. That's an incredible waste of storage. In addition, often, often we use algorithms that are unknown. We don't know exactly what is going on in this black box. The second one is the Baroque solution. It reduces the data that are generated by uh, one four, fourth. And the last one could be a more modern way to store just the data that comes out from the sensor and have the possibility after to process them in different ways depending on what we wish to do with this data. And I started with a slogan, raw data are cooked. And I have here a more precise slogan uh, that resumes, I think, better the idea. And this concludes my presentation. I, this address of our, our company is valid only until end of uh, January. In February, we, we move our equipment and we set up a new uh, possibility to work at the Lichtspiel in Bern. 
So that was uh, my presentation. The slides are, as usual, available on our website, and I think one or two minutes are left for Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Reto. I always, I always feel like my mind has been expanded after I hear a Reto presentation. We have time for just one question. If anyone has a pressing question they'd like to ask Reto. Hi, uh, Kieran O'Leary. Um, when you were doing the work with the, I think was it the D-Mosaic tool and you could choose all the different debiring algorithms, um, was there one that stood out as being the one that gave the best RGB values in the end? Uh, so. You have to check at the image. If you have an image that has a lot of details, is different than another one. If you have an image that moves a lot, then some algorithms give a better result than other. In general, if you have ca uh, cameras or scanners that re uh, work real time, they have a bad algorithm. And if, if they don't uh, work real time, they can implement a better one that needs more time. You have a factor of more than one to hundred between this algorithm in the time uh, consuming. And there are some algorithms like uh, Langsos that is very bad for uh, debiring. It's very good for uh, scaling, but not for debiring. Thank you very much, Reto. Let's have one more round of applause. <laughs> so our next two presenters are joining us remotely from Zoom. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I think I got it. All right. Uh, so joining us from Yale uh, University, we have um, Ethan Gates. And Ethan, can you hear us? Oh, I need to unmute, sorry. Hi, Ethan, can you hear us? I can, one second. Great, and we can all hear you great. Um, so Sorry, I'm going on multiple devices. Okay. <laughs> Welcome to No Time to Wait. Uh, we're so glad that you can make, join us um, remotely on Zoom. Um, so I'm just going to um, hand it over to you. And great, when we see your slides. Amazing. Go ahead. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it has been some years since I last spoke at, I believe, No Time to Wait 2. Um, but I'm very pleased and grateful to be back with this community today to talk about um, the very different kind of work I've been doing for the past four years. Um, my name is Ethan Gates. My title is Software Preservation Analyst for Yale University Library, and I'm the user support lead for the EASY, that's E-A-A-S-I, program of work, um, and to talk to you about some of the challenges uh, we have faced building uh, emulation into existing archival and cultural heritage workflows. So first things first, what is EASY? EASY stands for Emulation as a Service Infrastructure and is a Mellon and Sloan Foundation funded program of work started and hosted at Yale in 2018. I say a program of work rather than a particular project because the grant encompasses uh, more than just software development. It is a collection of coordinated people and projects who have the central aim of expanding use of the Emulation as a Service or EAAS framework for born digital preservation and access. The Emulation as a Service Framework is an open source server stack originally designed and built by the BWFLA project at the University of Freiburg in the mid 2010s, uh, now maintained commercially by OpenSLX. Um, it's essentially the same folks over there. It allows remote access to and centralized management of a number of underlying open source emulator applications such as QMU, Sheepshaver, Vice, and more. That said, Though easy, the grant doesn't just involve software development, we will also frequently use the term easy to refer to the easy programs platform, by which in turn, I mean particular tagged supported versions of emulation as a service um, and the network of partner organizations and individuals who are using and able to exchange resources using that platform. 
as I said, we've been going for four years. So that's two rounds of funding, which has covered, among other things, new features for EAAS, for that open source framework, including the ability to exchange data uh, in the form of software and emulated environments, kind of like virtual machines, um, between installations of emulation as a service via the Open Archives Initiative Protocol for Metadata Harvesting. Uh, it also includes a new web client for emulation as a service with improved user experience UI design. We've also been using the easy platform itself to gather information about historical software and feed that metadata into Wikidata via the Wikidata for Digital Preservation Project. Um, the funds have also sponsored extensive efforts in documentation, training, and support, including hands-on workshops, online guides, demo videos, um, etc., all to get folks more comfortable with using easy or just emulation generally. And last but not least, it's included administrative efforts to build a sustainable service model around the easy platform. And this last bit is really the core of the, the current and final round of grant funding from Mellon and Sloan that we are in right now, um, which will last through approximately mid 2024. At which point the goal is to slowly transition to being self-sustaining in one form or another, some combination of overhead or guaranteed funds from a fiscal host, um, paid support plans for maintenance and cloud hosting, whatever uh, other sources we can put together. I will talk a bit more about that in a few minutes. I do want to show you a quick demo video just to give you a taste of what I'm talking about. So in a way you could think of easy like a virtual machine management platform, except the virtual machines are all old machines, combining the power of multiple system emulators to give us access to any historical version of Mac OS, Windows, Linux, et cetera. We can also upload resources like software installation media or content from born digital collections, like this very important sample that I have pulled to show you all today. And using the easy interface, we can match these emulated computing environments and resources and run them together so we can re-experience critical multimedia heritage like multimedia cats. Before European settlers emigrated to North America, no native cats lived there, perhaps brought to a So, uh, inspired by this year's theme of transparency and trust, oh, apologies, rather than talk to you much more about the platform itself, I'd like to take my remaining time to address some of our biggest challenges in the EASY program. Um, because I have to say that we don't truly lack for technical solutions to our problems. I could sit here literally all day and rattle off the many features we would like to build and exactly how they could improve assessment and access workflows for born digital collections. But the truth is that we will not get any closer to our vision of seamlessly incorporating emulation into access workflows across the field without serious coordinated effort and advocacy in a few key areas. The first is in copyright practice. Uh, though easy itself is open source software, it enables organizations to upload copies that they own of legacy proprietary software. And by which I mean by legacy, I'm talking about out of market and out of support proprietary software. So that they can in turn use that proprietary software to address material from their born digital collections that depend on those applications. This is the philosophical heart of what we're doing, which is that archivists and patrons, users of digital archives, should all have the option of accessing historical born digital material in its original computing environment. We are guided by expert legal consensus that using legal so uh, legacy software in this way with guardrails for user permissions and such um, as a tool to address hidden collection dependencies, at least in the United States falls under accepted fair use copyright practice for libraries, archives, museums, and similar efforts for the public good. However, it has proven one thing for us that is the easy team as tool makers and service providers to say that, and another for legal counsel and leadership and administration at various cultural organizations to fully agree and adopt this practice and adjust collection access restrictions or workflows accordingly. 
And even when or if advocacy efforts are successful at overcoming such hesitancy, the limitation of fair use to the jurisdiction of the United States still severely handicaps our options in terms of international reach. And that doesn't just mean partnering with organizations in other countries, which we would like to do, bringing them into the easy network, um, but it also puts strain on our technical abilities. That is, we would love to set up distributed cloud deployments or mirrors of our platform in different regions of the world that would actually improve the emulation performance and experience for, say, a student in the Netherlands who wants and has the permissions um, to view an item from Yale's special collections. Um, but that's still something of an open question as to how, if how we could make such an arrangement. And these kind of gray areas, even perceived gray areas, impact us as well in terms of the underlying open source emulator projects that EASY in turn relies on. Emulators themselves often sit in this misunderstood, I would say, legal zone. The practice of making emulators has frequently been upheld by jurisdictions across the globe, but it's still also under constant threat from wealthy hardware manufacturers, just Apple, Nintendo, and the like. Um, so they frequently remain in the realm of volunteer or even hobbyist projects rather than the well-funded, stable, carefully maintained projects that they deserve to be given how essential they are to digital history. That lack of stable support then has ripple effects with an effort like Easy when you're trying to build a coherent service on top of them. And these are likely common or even redundant concerns at this late point of the conference, um, but I mentioned at the top of this presentation that we are ourselves currently a grant funded project. Um, that particular funding is currently scheduled to run out again approximately mid 2024. We are in the middle of very promising conversations with Yale Library leadership about continuing to serve as fiscal host of the program. But no matter which way you slice it, as we hopefully expand and improve the platform, we will run into an increasing problem of balancing research and development on new and even better features with maintaining something stable for our public user base. Uh, we are supporting the Easy platform as a way to provide access to obsolete legacy software, but at the same time, Easy is itself software. Without upkeep and careful design, it will grow old, it will grow vulnerable, it will itself eventually become obsolete. Um, OpenSLX, our developers are not a big team. Easy is now paying for two full-time developers plus some additional work on contract for the user interface. But the program cannot grow as big as our dreams without additional staffing um, and available funding models like grants, uh, subscriptions or service uh, models, fiscal hosting, et cetera, all come with their own choose your own adventure set of benefits and drawbacks. So why am I telling you all this? Um, what am I specifically asked from the No Time to Wait community? The first is advocacy. Uh, we can better fight all these challenges, the more real life examples and conversations we can have with actual collections and collection staff. So please, if you have software dependent AV material and emulation or easy um, is something that you think might help if that demo of multimedia cats are registered at all, you don't even have to be like 100% for sure. I know I have something I want to emulate. Um, even just talking through what is or isn't required or is or isn't helpful to real staff helps us with the service design pieces. Um, so please get in touch. I wanna hear about your nonlinear editor project files, um, your flash VRML multimedia, your files that can only migrate using a piece of proprietary software that is itself obsolete. Uh, let's talk. We can also talk in the context of a wider community. Easy itself has a community forum. You're welcome to join. It's linked in my slides um, at the end of this, but I also encourage checking out the Software Preservation Network, which is a professional organization also collectively working through many of these challenges. Um, you don't need to be a paying member to sign up for the Software Preservation Network newsletter, to join a working group, attend many events and calls again. So please join in that effort as well. And if you're a developer, I'll, I'll put it out there, we need better emulators, or at least we need emulators that are tailored to the needs of digital archivists, um, not just video gamers and retro computing enthusiasts. I'll call it, it out again, the situation with, with Apple, their, uh, with Motorola um, uh, 68K emulators, PowerPC emulators now, even uh, increasingly Intel Mac emulation in particular um, is not great and I would love to know how we can support making it better. And if all of this is really resonating, um, sounds exciting and like something you would like to work on every day, 
Uh, you may be in luck. This is truly breaking news this week, um, a bit of a no time to wait exclusive, uh, but our program manager of four years, Seth Anderson, has just announced that he is leaving Yale for another opportunity. Wonderful for him, of course, sad for the team. Um, we hope the search for his replacement to begin as soon as possible. I really don't have any more details than that right at this moment about what that process will look like, but um, please keep an eye out. And if you would like to reach out and have particular questions in the meantime, I'm certainly available. Uh, I, again, in the slides have some, some links um, that I will hopefully share out with everyone, but also put out my contact info. But thank you for having me today. Thank you so much, Ethan. That, that was a very cool project. to hand it over to our next online speaker, um, Alexandru. Also extend our thanks to him for being so flexible with the schedule and switching us to a later time. Um, Alexandru, can you hear us? He's, I think he's moving some things around. Yes, I can. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I, I, we can see your slides perfectly, so I'm just going to hand it over to you. Thank you so much. Super. Thank you very much. Um, and very happy to be here virtually. Uh, my name is Ex Alessandro Stan from IN2 Digital Innovations. We work on AI-powered applications that aim to improve the way that people access digital content. So relevant to be here. Um, I worked personally on developing solutions for cultural heritage and audiovisual archives for many years now, uh, I guess about 15. Um, today, I will speak to you a bit about enabling multi-perspective exploration of digital collections and I have to say that sadly, my presentation will not include any cats. I'm very sorry for this. <laughs> um, worth mentioning is that this is um, ongoing work being carried out um, in the Q project, which is supported by the AI for Media Center of Excellence. Um, so let's get started. Um, um, today was, uh, was a special day because it marked the UNESCO World Day of Audiovisual Heritage. Um, and so it was a good day also to reflect on the current state um, that we're in, um, respect to archives, especially the audiovisual ones. Um, so, of course, over the last years, there have been this huge investment and large efforts put into the digitization. Um, and um, um, organizations are committed to continue this work in the, in the coming years as well. And indeed, this effort seemed to have um, paid off. 
um, and there are countless hours um, and records that have been digitized. Um, but does this um, mean that uh, does this increase in digitization translate directly into an increase in the level of access to these resources? And um, as you might guess, it's not always this um, direct connection. So you not only need to produce high quality metadata when you're digitizing this and the process of um, producing this metadata has been in recent years facilitated greatly by um, recent advancements in machine learning with automatic uh, annotation. Um, but what you need to do is of course also you need to be able to clear the rights or figure out the sustainable licensing model for the digital artifacts and for data that you are doing. Um, and most importantly, you also need to um, bring digital contents to your target audience. And this is not trivial at all. Um, and when you have on top of this an exponential increase in the size of the digital collections, um, as well as the um, rich mix of various modalities of um, the records and the content, um, this brings about many challenges. So digitization alone is not an answer. Um, and um, in fact, as more digital content becomes available, it is um, now a bit more difficult to find interesting or relevant material to um, separate what's interesting for uh, what is not. And especially for curators and professionals in the digital heritage domain, this is a bit of a paradox. Um, there are many more resources available at their fingertips, but of course, um, it's a bit more difficult to find the right ones. And um, so um, if we take a simple example um, that we deal with, which is Europeana, uh, some of you might be very familiar with this. Um, uh, this is a, and you know, this is an impressive space of digital cultural heritage, which is aggregating collections from across Europe and providing free access to its data. Um, However, there are some challenges. So with over 53 million records, um, the single search bar that served as the centerpiece um, for the website for many years has become a bit of a bottleneck. So the strategy in recent years has gradually shifted towards more exploration of the available collection based on teams. Um, so now users can explore over 60 curated digital exhibitions, galleries, blog posts. So it's much more about the editorials. Um, but this, however, uh, have their own, let's say, challenges in how they are being created and managed since it's very much in, involves the manual process. Um, so in this context, um, how can cultural professionals and researchers um, explore existing media and digital collections in a more holistic way and um, more easily curate and showcase the insights gained? Um, and AI can help uh, to improve um, metadata and search, and this is the key part for this. And um, we think that automatic recommendations can uh, also play a huge role in surfacing this um, more interesting content. Um, now, we, introducing queues, something that we call story spaces, is a concept. It's a concept about um, uh, linking and creating connections between the records and between collections. Um, given that we have this, um, um, uh, let's say, set of editorials, which um, are in itself a complex container of uh, content items of records, and that um, these editorials are in fact the key aspects of how to um, explore and understand the topic from a 30, uh, from a 360 degree um, uh, perspective, um, what we want to do is provide a way to automatically link editorials based on the metadata which of the contain items to create a story space. Um, I will try to illustrate this in a bit and um, allow users to navigate uh, from one editorial to another thanks to the AI recommendations on the current part of the, period of the editorial which they are consuming on, on the blog post that they are seeing, for instance, and to explore in this way um, the topic into more um, uh, detail and maybe to see it from other perspectives as well. Um, to illustrate this, imagine this is your um, records um, collection and you have an editorial which is um, linking a couple of these records together, but from the same starting point, you could have actually several ones. And all of these are 
um, are connected and there can be many forms of connections. This is only a very simple example to illustrate this, but in itself, the, the connections and the connected editorials, um, they are able to um, build up the story space. Um, so with Q, this is a web-based application that we um, are currently building um, based on an AI recommendations and an explainable user interface. Um, we want to respond to these modern needs of media heritage collections and professionals. Um, the main part is the recommender, uh, which is looking to create the connections between the records to records, records to editorials and editorials to editorials. Um, looking at different dimensions where these connections happen and um, looking to be able to also provide the um, end user to uh, the target audience, uh, which has experienced this information of um, why um, these connections are there. So um, that um, even people with limited ICT skills, they can easily uh, use this, they can easily un understand and explore the collections. Um, Important also to mention is that we're opening up uh, next year for Image Clef 2023, a um, specific task on content recommendation. Um, and we invite uh, the entire research community to uh, contribute here. So this um, has just been launched um, last week um, on the site of Image Clef. Um, we provide a data set based on Europana data and the task is um, about content recommendation, as I described it, looking at uh, different modalities in which um, uh, we can um, explore the editorials and link content uh, and editorials together. Um, the Outlook, we have launched uh, now a beta version of our Q system, and we're currently evaluating this with early adopters. Um, so, if this sounds like something that you're interested in, something that is relevant for your work, please uh, try it out and give us your feedback. Um, feel free to contact me um, either on Twitter or via email. And um, you can check out also um, the application at uh, q.in2.com. So um, thank you very much for your attention. I'm sorry I could not be in person with you today um, there, um, but I'm happy to take your questions virtually now. And I hope I didn't take too long. You're perfect, Alexandra. Thank you. title from the description, um, um, trying to extract and automatically some topics and trying to put this into some, let's say, um, labels there and creating basically um, um, a vector of similarity between the, the items on the different uh, dimensions. Um, we're uh, trying in this way to um, keep track basically of where from which, let's say, um, from which aspect, uh, if you call it this way, um, certain recommendations are given. So is it because these items have been reused in similar um, the collections or is it because uh, they uh, deal with uh, similar topics so that for the user it's much more clear why am I being presented um, uh, these recommendations? Thank you. Um, any other questions for Alexandru? Uh, I see a question over here from Dave. Go ahead. Uh, sh sure, I'm, I'm Dave Rice. Um, I remember working with some AI recommendation systems where it would give a result or recommendation that was a bit insensitive. Uh, 
like like showing all people of color of, as being like a singular person, um, you know, or j just like recommendations that ended up needing to be reviewed or vetted. So I'm curious, like how you sort of over oversee the behavior of the AI in these recommendations. Mm. I, I think I was able to hear the question well, I, and I certainly agree that this this aspect of more let's say ethical AI is very very hot topic and. Um, in a way, we try to um, to tackle this challenge through this um, explainability aspect of the of, of the entire system, so as that you can so that you are able to see where this is coming from, to understand then if there are issues, where the issue is uh, potentially coming from. Um, of course, uh, let's say um, you risk less of going into this um, difficult situations with cultural heritage data, but this can happen as well, certainly. So an opportunity for to, to correct it after the fact then. Um, yeah, and it's, it's for sure something that is um, very much a challenge at the moment, certainly. Thanks, Dave. Any other questions for Alexandru? Okay, well, with that, thank you uh, very much, Alexandra, for joining us remotely. Really glad to have you here with us. Thank you very much for your attention and for having me. Okay, round of applause thank for Alexandra. <laughs> All right, so this is bringing us to the very, very end, very sadly. So um, I'm going to call up Alessandra to um, bring us to our closing. Hi, everyone. Um, before um, also Dave joins me, I uh, just wanted to briefly touch base on how we choose our hosting institutions because we're also going to present to you who will be hosting No Time to Waste 7. Um, basically, there's a, a Google form online that you can happily fill out if you have an interest. Also, I will also come and see you and like plant a seed so that then you can think about it and talk to whomever you need to talk about it. Um, or if you, you know, just want to come talk to us. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Adela to the stage. Because, yeah, you can pull it up. She'll introduce where we'll be hosting No Time to Waste 7. Hello, everyone. It was an intense day, intense two days. So I'm very happy to have your couple of minutes of attention. This is not taking long. So uh, I'm Adela Kurlova from the National Film Archive Prague. Uh, and I'm here to introduce you to what's going to happen next year. So um, these are just a couple of my contacts. You can reach out if you want. And so the No Time to Wait 7 is happening in Narodny Filmový Archiv in Prague. So... <laughs> <clears throat> so this is just a short teaser. Uh, and uh, I will just briefly introduce what we are doing in the National Film Archive Prague. So obviously we care for the film heritage and uh, also several other materials you can read out yourself that's it's fine <laughs> we have a large collection uh, actually one of the largest in the central europe and um yeah uh if you want to basically uh view some films of our collection yourself and what we've been working on in the digitization you can uh, try this link. There is different platforms, VODs, that we are streaming on. And especially in the digital laboratory, which I didn't say I'm the head of digital laboratory uh, with other eight colleagues, so... <coughs> uh, I do care of the born digital acquisitions and Except of that, we all work on digital restoration, 35, 16 millimeters, uh, magnetic sound tapes, digitized cassette media, 
Uh, we also introduced the print trip, which my colleague Jonas was presenting here, I believe, a couple of years ago. And we also produce some of our own content, like those kind of presentations and stuff like that. Uh, we're highly based on uh, our data management um, in open, open source solutions, so I really want to uh, give it up for all the people that are involved in those solutions. And uh, yeah, every time uh, and every institution is highly based on people, so I want to thank everyone for their contributions. It wouldn't be possible to F everything without you. That's it. Thank you and see you in Prague. Uh, so often at the end of No Time to Wait, we kind of open it up to the audience to share some closing comments. Uh, so they don't need to be a question. It can just be part of your perspective or how you feel, <laughs> some suggestions for the future. Um, but your yeah, comments are welcome. Um, I, I was just thinking about uh, when I went to um, Phil Film Preservation School, hearing about this uh, particular expert that had this method for um, I think treating film that was highly brittle and often other people in the community like really wanted to gather their knowledge because they could see this process was very successful, but this person didn't want to share any of the knowledge. And I think there was this kind of perception that like what makes you an important, valuable member of a community is having some sort of like exclusive knowledge that you have like this kind of expertise that nobody else does. So people have to come to you. Um, and I don't know, all, all archives and collections certainly struggle. Like we've seen a number of organizations here that are, are well funded to those that just need a tremendous amount of help and support. Um, so I like that sort of, you know, no matter what kind of resources you're working with, all of us are kind of coming here in a spirit of teaching transparency and trust, um, just kind of in opposition to the, you know the approach of, of gatekeeping and trying to to keep information inside yourself to as a way to make yourself a valuable member of community. So I am so grateful that so many of us work so hard to improve the workflows that we have um, and to just constantly grow and evolve our work to be more effective and to just share our work with each other as we do. Um, I really like how so many of the presentations don't just show us like, sh we're not just showing each other what we made, but we're showing each other how we learned and developed and grew all along the process. So I really appreciate this theme of having this kind of accessible and partly inspiring um, style of presentation at this conference. All right, that's it. I didn't write that down. I just thought of that over there when I was that's like, pretty good. okay, thanks. Um, <laughs> Are you anything to add, Alessandra? Well, I don't know. Any comments? Yeah, if any, any of you guys have any closing uh, closing thoughts, I would be happy oh. to, to hear them. Two thumbs up from Radoslav. Nice, yep. nice. We got some Radoslav awesome. approval. It's <laughs> lovely. Um, yeah, I mean, as you, some of you know, we always also send out, like, another Google form for you to give us feedback so on. So many. So many. Um, yeah, so feel free to always, like, just get in touch with us and email us. Um, it's going to be sometime in November because we need to double check with other conferences. I have a proposal to be on the first uh, days of December as usually because uh, at the bonus uh, Prague is very beautiful uh, and have the Christmas market. That can be a bonus uh, of the, this good conference. That is true. That is, we actually do like our Christmassy vibe for No Time to Wait. Yeah, but the there was a perfect combination of... Uh, I would agree. Of glue wine. <laughs> Blue wine and open source tools. I know, um, we should have had a, like a Halloween party. I don't know if it's a holiday. Or sure, sure. <laughs> we can, I mean, there's still some time. Um, yes, we don't have the exact dates because we always need to check with other conferences, but that's always toward the end of the year. There may be some changes depending on where we're hosting because we're obviously dependent on the host institution and their schedules and their availabilities. Yeah, it does seem a bit like... A you know, as at, at this phase of the pandemic, a bit conferences are kind of announcing their timelines a bit later than they normally are. So when I'm kind of asking around to other board members, they're like, "We're not quite sure yet." Like, but, but hopefully we'll we'll finalize the dates quite soon. 
Alexandra, don't leave me alone. Oh no, I just I, I had a small a small. I mean, I, I love you guys. I love this conference. I'll come to this conference forever and ever. Um, one thought I had was that one thing I kind of missed from the previous years is the panels, the kind of the sum the panels that kind of summarized the main themes and brought together some of the speakers. So it wasn't just presentations. I I think that those were really valuable and like to see those back if possible. Yeah, I think, um, I, I mean, we would agree. Um, and if you were following how the program was being put together, you would have probably seen some like space carved out for panels, but we sort of failed to put those together. But it's also on you, if you have an idea to propose a panel, please do so. Uh, even if you think it's last minute, please always suggest it because we will always try to accommodate a good idea. Um, I might be the only one in the room who is not an archivist himself, so please allow me to, to tell you how great it is to spend two days with you, what an including community you are, and how much I enjoyed uh, being with you. Thank you so much. Thank you for organizing it. Thanks, Carl. Yes, it was my first year attending, and I'm one of the travel grant uh, recipients. But I just wanted to say that um, the conference exceeded my expectations. Um, the community in particular were so welcoming and so encouraging and also inspiring. Um, and I definitely leave feeling very inspired, which I, I have come to understand is part of the no time to wait um, effect. So, thank you. Um, I'll, I'll just say one thing I really appreciate always about no time to wait, but especially this year, is the gender balance in presenters because often you go to a technical conference and it's dominated by men, but um, in this conference it was nice to see um, a nice balance of folks who are presenting and, and, and of skill levels and experience levels and all that so that that's always delightful to see yeah that's great I have to say which I think is probably a good thing it's not that we set out to do that it's just it's so great how it's probably coming together within the you know equal representation so awesome Karen mm -hmm. um, yeah I think um, I just want to encourage people who maybe um, are watching online or who are here who have never spoken uh, at the conference to encourage them to talk about their work even you know and I think that things like lightning talks um, and maybe the reintroduction of panels are a great way to kind of get into speaking and I think like it really like people start talking to you that much more afterwards at the breaks and everything and it's um, and it can be quite a terrifying thing to do but to just, um, it's, it's ultimately a very rewarding experience. So I guess that's my message to people who haven't ever spoken. Um, yeah, yeah I, was, I was kind of thinking earlier that it might be nice to have a volunteer role that is uh, kind of like a, a, a supporter for the development of presentations or a viewer so that like we could volunteer. And if somebody who's planning to present here wants like a peer review before they come, that you know somebody would be able to review their presentation, give them feedback and just encourage them. and. You know, especially for like new presenters who are coming who, I don't know, sometimes like I write a presentation and I don't feel good about it. <laughs> I just, like show somebody else and it helps tremendously to just get peer review. Any other comments? Just a, just a second. People that know me know that uh, there is practically no conference which I uh, not visit. And from that, my experience, uh, I want to say that uh, no time to wait, uh, slow but stable become the key events in the audiovisual uh, uh, community, not only archival but general, due to the, this uh, particular uh, combination of feature that uh, uh, make it uh, from a one point very professional and from another point a very relaxed, uh, community friendly, etc. So I think, that, and even the main competitor, Ari Archival Workshop, already for unknown reason is not hot. So you just have the chance to remain the key event, and you should be on the level of being key event, not just sim some simple small uh, events. You already the key event in the community, so you need to be on the uh, how to say on the in line with uh, uh, your uh, 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 role. So I hope next year to be 
uh, more people and uh, more uh, more uh, different uh, uh, topics despite this year topics are really spreadly uh, very spread on the problems but uh, always there is a room for uh, to be better only the sky is the limit thank you yes thanks for your comment Rosla. yeah thank you um i don't know i don't know if somebody is have, are people online still tuned in or is there anything coming from them? Hi, thank you for. Oh, lots of emoji hearts. I hope. Yeah, everyone's super inspired. Yeah, a few comments. Uh, I, I saw Connor was following the entire day. Uh, so, uh, yeah, hats off to him for for following this along. A lot of just appreciation for the amazing conference and fe people feeling inspired. And uh, thanks so much to everyone for. Um, yeah. Uh, keeping up with us, even though we had some technical issues, as always, but... Yeah, if um, any comments, any other question, otherwise we'll just go on to the long list of thank yous that are <laughs> heart heartfelt. Um, so yeah, we really want to thank you all for your sharing, your experiences and knowledge. Um, as, uh, you know, as Dave said, it's not always easy, and but it's very much welcome and contributing two more ways than one, I think, and that comes to Rado's last point of it's not only the quality of the presentations or just being, you know, but you're also present during the breaks and during lunch and during the dinners to uh, make this a really comfortable and inclusive uh, conference. Um, so yeah, I really appreciate your engagement uh, on so many levels. Um, so I'd like to thank our hosts again. Laura had to leave, so thank you, Laura. Thank you, Ross and Johan for having us and for bearing with us. Uh, all the volunteers, the list is in the, their list, their names are in the lit in the program, so thank you to all of them, um, to all of those who jumped in and just helped us for the past two and a half days. Uh, yeah, shout out to you guys online uh, who's been following us, to the few people that got lost in Gathertown. We see <laughs> you, we like your pets. Um, and again, thank you to all your sponsors. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, I think that's, the, I mean. Yeah. We always do a lot of work to just keep the conference to be like a free registration event as opposed to like a $300 <laughs> registration event. Um, <laughs> no, and we, uh, no, last night we were joking about having a uh, $2.99 registration, <laughs> like <laughs> um, with in-app purchases. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, ob obviously like we need, we need sponsors and we need volunteers and we need a lot of contributions from speakers in order to do this. Uh, so there, I know there was kind of a theme in many of the presentations about organizations kind of um, collectively trying to support the development of open source tools rather than, you know, just purchasing more and more of the, the same proprietary ones. Um, so that's that, re that same spirit really keeps this conference running and we're really grateful to the sponsors who have helped us this year and all the last ones. And, and then next year, too, whoever those sponsors are. <laughs> yes. Whomever you are. Um, all right. I don't know. See uh, you in Prague? Yeah. We do the group photo. Oh, like group here. photo. <laughs> Did yes. Did you accept the sponsorship from, uh, let's say, European Commission? <laughs> uh, we can talk after. Well, yeah, I we can try. <laughs> and it'll be interesting if they open up their pockets for us. So at the end of the conference, normally everybody, this is the time when we're, we're all supposed to be on the stage and we'll do a group photo and then I think we have refreshments outside, right? Yeah. 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 Did you have anything else you wanted to add while we have? Rasa, come here. Yeah. You want to mic? <laughs> Thanks so much all for being here. I was just gonna say, uh, I was telling Dave yesterday, it's kind of felt like a three year long Groundhog Day for kind of trying to organize this conference and then it never comes, it never comes, it never comes. So I'm really glad that you all came here together. It's been a pleasure to have you, but I'm also very happy to pass on these duties to another organization <laughs> and just attend next time as a presenter. Uh, and yes. Just, yes. And just in general, um, um, Super grateful to Alessandra, to Valeria, Dave, and Jerome for being such great collaborators. Uh, they really put so much work into this and they made our life easy as well. Uh, they were not too, <laughs> too demanding. Uh, they were very chill, so it's a, also a real pleasure, pleasure to work with you. So also, if you would like to host No Time to Wait after Prague, I would highly recommend doing that. Mm -hmm. uh,
Thank you. Yeah, you can start a support group for the host <laughs> <laughs> institutions. Uh, okay, so um, we need a volunteer to take the photo, right? Yeah, we do have to figure out one. Um, but if everyone would stand up, well, you are invited to see if we can all stand on the stage at the same time and be safe. <laughs> Hi, live stream. Good night. Thank you so much and see you soon. <laughs>